Well, good, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our 11.45 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the October 22nd, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, council members will move to the courtyard conference room for our closed session. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Mayor, council members Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Meyer? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the council on our closed session, session agenda? Okay, please come forward and I'd like to invite up Ed Firestone first for uh, a four minutes um, as a presentation on behalf of his client. Good morning, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about a claim that's being made uh, by my client against the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm, these are some, I'll be as quickly, quick as I can. We're not gonna follow through on the presentation because it's a little longer than four minutes. Um, my name is Ed Firestone. I'm an attorney representing a Kelly family there um, on a small shopping plaza at 12, in the 1200 block of Mission Street. There was a dry cleaner there since about 1968. There's still one there. Um, and it used a chemical called perchloroethylene until about 2001. Everybody in the country used that chemical. California, every other state. It's common, and it's the one that you note and you smell when you get your clothes dry cleaned or your, uh, and you hang them in the garage because you don't want the smell in your home. Um, dry cleaners commonly used this solvent and they were, it was released in the process of dry cleaning clothes. It was released both on site and then as part of the process, Dry cleaning does use a little bit of water. Most people don't know that to take out water soluble stains and they have to remove the water and the dirt from the PCE, which they reuse per chloroethylene is called PCE. And as a result, that was standard poured down the drain into the sanitary sewers. And that's the practice, that was the practice. They don't do it that way now, but that was the practice 50 years ago, 40 years ago, and it's leaked. Um, the property owner didn't cause the problem. He's never run the dry cleaner. That The family's never run the dry cleaner. They've owned the shopping center itself. And while they had didn't, they didn't run the dry cleaner, they've taken responsibility for working on the cleanup. They're working on mitigating and remediating the site itself right now. Um, the all work is being done under the oversight of the California Regional Water Quality Control Board, the Central Coast. Uh, we're working with them and it's, it's a voluntary process. Uh, they've signed up to do that work. Um, as part of the process, they began to look off site um, and what happened was they found, when they began to look out, uh, off site, they found that the sanitary sewer in the middle of Mission Street has leaked. Uh, and there are levels and concentrations in what's called soil vapor that are present in the area. Um, it was released from the sewer at a sag at a low point. Let's see if I can find that picture. Um, I think it's, uh, this is how it happens. This is page seven of your handout. Uh, the state water board, <clears throat> excuse me, did a study in 1992 that said, geez, our sewer lines throughout the state where they sag and where they have bends are leaking dry cleaning compounds into the environment. And this is part of that study called the ISO study. Um, we know it's the sewer, and I'll show you that. This is a map of the area. This is uh, figure one. Uh, figure two <coughs> will show you the, where the perchloroethylene is above what are called environmental screening levels in the environment in the neighborhood. And it's highlighted in yellow screening levels. These screening levels, uh, don't necessarily indicate any adverse effects on health or the environment, but they do mean, and the state looks at it, that further investigation is necessary. We know the sewer leaked because PCE, this compound, degrades in sewers. It doesn't degrade when it's in the normal environment, and you'll see the PCE on the property itself to the, to the uh, left-hand side of your page. But I'm gonna go to the next slide, which shows one of its breakdown products. And you'll notice this is called TCE, it's one fewer chlorine. There's no oxygen in sewers and so the products break down there 
and you'll see that it's moving off site from the sewer, but it's not on, not on the site. Thank you. Are there any other members of the community who would like to address the council? Okay, please come forward and you'll have two minutes. Good morning. Uh, my husband and I filed a claim on September 3rd with the city of Santa Cruz, a garbage truck damaged our house. He took down a power line and caused damage to wood paneling above our garage, uh, the weather guard, and also the power lines. We had to pay for an electrician to come out and do repairs before PG&E could do their repairs. Uh, we also had to buy wood to replace for the wood paneling on our garage. And uh, I just wanted to know what the status was of that claim. Uh, the damage was done on September, um, excuse me, June 30th, and I filed the claim on September 3rd. And I received a letter on October 16th uh, stating that I could show up today and inquire about what the status of the claim was. Um, on a second note, um, I wanted to share uh, brochures with you. I'm a youth employment specialist. I do this as a volunteer in the community. Uh, if any council members are interested in talking with me, please contact me. Uh, I love working with not only youth, I recently started an inmate employment program with the Sheriff's Department. So this is something I'm very passionate about. So if, if you're interested, please call me. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the community who wants to address the council at this time on our closed session agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn um, to closed session. Council Member Matthews. I'm just assuming, uh, Patty, that you'll uh, mention the process for the consideration of claims, or you have, yes. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and adjourn um, to our closed session, and thank you. <coughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 12.30 p.m. session of the October 22nd, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Present. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cumming. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. And if our clerk could please lead us to the Pledge of the League. The United States of America. Okay. So now is the time for us to have an introduction of our new city employees. And I'd like to invite up uh, Susan Nimitz from Libraries to introduce her new employees. I have a whole bunch today. I see them. I'm so excited. <laughs> Yay. I'm Susan Nimitz. I'm the library director. Today we have Lauren Wisham. Um, and Lauren's joining us. She's uh, at Brand. Oh, no, she's in programming. Um, she was an aide, so a temporary worker who's um, worked her way into a permanent job. We're excited to have her. She was an archaeology major. Um, and she's contemplating grad school. One of the things I learned with this bunch is Lauren's, Lauren's um, married to a, someone in Parks and Rec, and so is Essie, so I guess there's something <laughs> going on. <laughs> if you've seen the TV show. Um, then we have Essie Barrasso Ramirez. Um, Essie's joining us, to, and she's in graduate school at San Jose State um, to get her librarian degree. Um, she's a Santa Cruz gal, born and raised, and um, she's going to be the branch manager at Boulder Creek. And she's also married to Alex in Parks and Rec. Um, <laughs> we have Cameron Cochan. Cameron. Um, Cameron's also uh, an aide that has worked to a um, permanent position. Um, Cameron's working at Brands 40 right now and um, is also helping with our Teen Code Combat programming. So he's a great asset to the library. And last but not least, we have Angie Lyons. Um, Angie's going to become the branch manager for the Felton Library. Um, she has her librarian degree out of UCLA and likes horses. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for a random fact? But we're really exciting. We're getting lots of great new staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome. Okay, we have another um, new employee. So I'd like to please invite up our customer service manager, Kyle Peterson, to introduce uh, his new employee. Hello, Mayor Watkins and members of the council. My name is Kyle Peterson. I'm the customer service manager for Santa Cruz Municipal Utilities. I'd like to introduce you to the newest member of our customer service team, Eileen Dunn. Um, as you may know, Santa Cruz Municipal Utilities is the clearinghouse for utility services in the city. We provide water, <coughs> sewer, and garbage utilities for inside city res residents and businesses, and water-only utilities for outside city customers. We manage about 25,000 accounts serving 100,000 people. And we bill and collect about $70 million a year and an additional $7 million in tax revenue for the general fund. Uh, we do this all with a frontline staff of six people. So our customer service reps really need to know their stuff. And fortunately for us, Eileen here really knows her stuff. Uh, she previously worked at Olivehurst Public Utility District. They serve water and sewer services to about 6,000 customers. Fortunately, Olivehurst <coughs> is located north of Sacramento, so it's really hot, which means that Eileen has decided to move to Santa Cruz. <laughs> um, she's not new to the area, however. She grew up in San Jose uh, with six, six siblings, and so now she has a number of nieces and nephews who are in the area, and, and she's happy to be close to now. Um, so between the new job, the better weather, and the family, she's happy to be here and we're happy to have her. Please welcome Eileen. Welcome Eileen. <laughs> Wonderful, welcome. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and move on to our presentations. And we have Imagine a Day Without Water, which is hard to imagine, as our first presentation. And we'll go ahead and invite up Heidi to speak to the item. Is that correct? No? Yeah, she's coming. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have a proclamation when you're ready. <laughs> Great, I, I am ready. I just want to thank you for um, being supportive of the work that we do. Um, as you know, it would be really challenging to imagine any day without water, and we're fortunate that at least so far we don't have to do that. Oops, sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. So I am very pleased to accept the proclamation. Wonderful. Well, I'll just read a few of the whereas is. Um, so whereas water is essential to sustain all life, and whereas Santa Cruz's two favorite beverages, locally brewed coffee and beer, would not exist without water, and whereas much of Santa Cruz water infrastructure dates back to before the Safe Water Drinking Act was passed and has outlived its expected lifespan, and whereas all Americans are challenged to imagine a day without water on Wednesday, October 23rd, 2019, so um, now, therefore, I, Martine Watkins, the mayor of City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim Wednesday, October 23rd, 2019, as Imagine a Day Without Water Day in the City of Santa Cruz, and I encourage all citizens to join me in recogni recognizing the privilege of having clean, safe, and reliable water, thanks to your work. So thank you very much. Thank you. And if you don't know what it would be without water, look at the windows of the water department, <laughs> which have some great signage on them. Great. Okay. So we had another presentation that was originally scheduled to take place today, and um, that was the Dignity Health Dominican Hospital report, but it was postponed because there was um, a staffing conflict for the presenter, so we'll have that rescheduled at a future meeting. 
Um, so we'll go ahead and move on to announcements. And I have just a few announcements um, and then we'll move on to our regular agenda. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left and it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask you to reflect, respect your fellow citizens when you're inside and outside of our council chambers. I'd like to ask if any council members have any statements of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none. Are there any uh, additions or deletions? See clerk. No. Okay. So a brief um, oral communications announcement. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to the council on items that are not on today's agenda. And oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. this evening. I'll go ahead and look to our city attorney at this time to report on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. <clears throat> This morning, the uh, council convened in the courtyard conference room to consider the following closed session items. First was conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims, including the claims of Noah Jackal, David W. Turner, State Farm Insurance Company, Jeremy Saunders, and James J. Kelly. Those items are also listed on your consent calendar this afternoon for council action. There was one item of real property negotiations involving the real property at 125 Coral Street. <clears throat> Owners James P. Gillespie and Jean Gillespie, trustees, and Harley F. and Sandra I. Gillespie, co-trustees. Council received a report from uh, its negotiator and gave direction on that item. There was no reportable <coughs> action. Uh, th third item was uh, labor, excuse me, labor negotiations involving the fire department IAFF locals 1716. Uh, council met with its negotiator, uh, but there was no action taken. Finally, there was one item of significant exposure to litigation uh, and no action was taken on that item. Thank you very much. So now is an opportunity for us to um, hear from each other on um, the report out of actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authorities meetings that have occurred in between our meetings. Um, so I will go ahead and see if um, our vice mayor can start us off with an update um, mm -hmm. on the library. Thank you very much. All right, so as many folks know, we've had, um, the subcommittee has been arranged to have a, um, more community involvement and engagement around um, the next steps with regards to the downtown library. All the work that we've been doing can be found on the city's website. Um, if you go under city council subcommittees, the downtown library, there's a link uh, where you can find the work plan and a number of the different documents that have been provided to give more clarity around this process and uh, the direction the city's taking. So far, we've had three community meetings. Uh, we met on June 19th, where we had a discussion about library needs and a presentation from the DLAC. Um, and we had a number of other stakeholder groups, around seven community groups that also engaged in that discussion. On August 20th, we had a discussion of the downtown parking district, where uh, this committee received a presentation from staff um, around some of the downtown parking needs. We followed that meeting with a meeting on September 17th where there was a vision for downtown discussion. We had presentations from the National Development Council, Progressive Urban Management Association and staff. And we also had a number of community stakeholder groups that were involved in that conversation as well. Uh, to date, we have had office hour meetings, oops, sorry. To date, we've had office hour meetings with about 20 community stakeholder groups where we've had uh, 15 minute sessions where we can hear the needs of the different groups, their stance on um, what they support in terms of a new library, um, where it should go, and, and different um, concerns um, from the community about the next steps with the library. Um, and with regards to the downtown library renovation cost assessment, 
um, the subcommittee agreed to issue an RFP to assess what could be done um, in a renovation of the downtown library with the existing $27 million budget. This RFP was issued back on June 26th of 2019 and Jason Architect was selected and approved to complete an assessment in early December. So far, the site evaluation has been completed. Um, there's been a preliminary meeting uh, with with staff and with the advisor, with the subcommittee. Um, they've developed a preliminary cost model and de developed a preliminary floor plan. And as far as next steps, on October 24th, we'll be having an update from Jason Architects mm -hmm. where they will give a presentation about the cost assessment and floor plans. Uh, this is gonna occur at 5 p.m. at the Loudon Nelson Community Center and the public will be invited to observe. Um, and then kind of kind of wrapping this up, they're gonna finish the downtown library renovation cost assessment scope. They're gonna, we're gonna receive a finalized cost assessment and complete a full report with recommendations from the subcommittee to come back to the council on November 26th. That concludes my report back on our subcommittee. And I'd just like to mention that um, we felt it was important to bring this report at this time, given that we initially anticipated to have recommendations to come back in October, but given um, the timeline for Jason Architect to make their assessment, it needed to come back. We wanted to give a report out to the council now and give a timeline for when we should be bringing our recommendations back to the city council. Thank you for the update and for the work. And we'll look forward to having a discussion about this on our 26th agenda. We'll uh, go ahead and kick it right back over to you, uh, Vice Mayor, if you have additional updates from other subcommittees. I don't have additional updates at this okay. time. Why don't we go ahead and make our way down and then we'll circle back around this way. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. Okay, on just a few items. Um, the Measure U Implementation Working Group, which is the city county jointly funded group to carry through on the um, uh, voter direction on UCSC growth um, has appointed an advisory committee um, that has met. Um, there's been some um, outreach for hiring uh, an organizer. Uh, there is an RFQ that's uh, open at this point, I believe. Lee is in the audience. Um, uh, if anyone has interested um, uh, possibilities for that position, um, get in touch with Sandy or me. That, so uh, that's proceeding. Um, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, uh, which is the um, advisory group of a number of um, water providers, um, districts, and private well owners in the um, Mid-County Groundwater uh, uh, Aquifer, uh, has held its final public hearing regarding a, a sustainable uh, management plan as required by the state, so that now um, the final hearing was held uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that plan will now be um, finalized and brought forward and will meet the state-mandated adoption um, for next year. Um, and uh, Downtown Management Corporation was involved with um, the Puma um, interviews regarding the um, downtown vision and management, and we have a couple of new board members, so uh, that was the focus of our most recent meeting. Um, and then I'll just say, um, I went to the uh, open house for the uh, Water Street housing on Saturday. Donna attended that as well. Um, there were quite a few staff members and Andy Schifrin was there from Planning Commission. And it was a very heartwarming and impressive um, realization of some much needed affordable housing. It was a really great event, yeah. I believe the Vice Mayor had a couple additional comments. I just wanted to um, make sure the public is aware because we've been receiving some emails that the library subcommittee has not come to an agreement or any conclusion on how we're going to be voting on this item. And so I just want the public to be aware that we are still <coughs> working through this process and using the data to come to an informed uh, recommendation for the council. So if members of the public um, have been concerned about which direction this is going and we have not come to a conclusion on where we're going to where we stand on this at this point in time. Thank you for the clarification. Mayor, follow, uh, which the item was he referring to? I'm sorry. Uh, the library. The library subcommittee. subcommittee. I, I had a bunch of folks ask me about the, the, the difference between a observation meeting and a, a meeting where the public can participate. The one next one at Loudon Nelson. Is there any reason why there won't be a public comment at that meeting? When we initially established this meeting with Jason Architect, um, we had established it as being uh, a report out to the members of the subcommittee where we would be able to have an opportunity to report. 
um, given the amount, because we didn't incorporate time for uh, public comment, we don't, we didn't calculate that into how much we're gonna be paying Jason Architect for their time on that day. So had we um, had that initially, we could have factored that into our agreement with them, but we didn't, so. And it seems like if members of the public are interested in tracking the work, they can go online to the website to also follow through. Okay, great, thank you. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, um, so I uh, am on the Revenue Enhancement Subcommittee <laughs> with <laughs> Councilmember Matthews, yeah. and um, we are continuing to work on developing a uh, potential ballot initiative proposal um, to recommend to the council, and we've had some productive meetings with uh, members of the community, interested members of the community on this, and we uh, will bring a recommendation that will be forthcoming sometime in the near future. But we ha have at least a couple more meetings that we want to um, proceed with before we finalize. Thank you for your work mm -hmm. on that. And uh, my other one, I don't have... Um, reports on all of the committees and commissions I'm on, but um, I would add that the Regional Transportation Commission uh, met in early October, and at that meeting we uh, voted to uh, move towards a contract for an alternatives analysis for the rail line, so an alternative uh, pu high capacity public transit option to um, weigh, our, weigh the possibilities for how to use that the rail line in the future for public transit. And um, we also talked about the efforts that are going on to kind of consolidate and clarify the um, land ownership issues on the North Coast to get that segment of the rail line going. And it's kind of one of the most complicated pieces, but um, one that we really wanna move forward as quickly as possible. Um, I'll go ahead, maybe, and see, since I'm, I'm kind of going in the flow, if um, City Manager Martin Bernal wanted to report out on any of his work in the community as well at this time. Yeah, no, there's no, oh, no, I don't have any report out on any of the uh, yeah, Joint Powers Authorities that I'm serving on. Okay. Okay, Councilmember Crow. Mm -hmm. um, the Public Safety Committee met on October 14th. And we had a vigorous discussion on the bail schedule, which I believe will be coming back to the council. The bail schedule meaning what people pay for uh, fines throughout the city. It is a fascinating, I, I just think it's a fascinating document in history. And I don't know the whole history um, and how different fines are charged, different, why we charge $1,000 for this and $500 for that. Um, so, It'll be coming back to the council. We also had a pretty vigorous discussion on four pieces of, I guess, I don't know if I call them gun legislation or gun proposals uh, or uh, anti-gun uh, mm -hmm. proposals. And um, it, it, we would love to bring something to the council, but it just wasn't ready. Uh, all of them were really interesting and two of them especially. I think the whole committee would have liked to move forward, but through our discussion, it just seemed like we, we could, wasn't ready for prime time yet uh, to, to bring forward. Um, the uh, integrated solid waste, I just wanted to mention that it was a bummer that the governor vetoed the plastics, um, the 50% uh, content recycled plastic and, and really didn't deal with uh, single use plastic bottles either. And I just don't understand it, but um, I hope that we will continue our lobbying efforts. Um, the other one was the long range development plan. We haven't had a meeting since the last one. And uh, the next one is December 19th. This is um, dealing with uh, how the university will develop. Tw you know, 2021 is supposed to be when, when the long range development plan will go to the regions through a couple different committees at the university. That's th the plan for now. Councilmember Glover. Thank you, yes. Uh, so the only committee I'm on that met was the Public Safety Committee. Um, but I will add some additional things to Councilmember Crone's report. So we did discuss the bail schedule. Uh, one of the themes that uh, I brought up as well as um, Councilmember Crone was the potential impact of the fee structure on low income individuals and the uh, potential detrimental impact that can have on their credit when they're um, 
items go to collections because we were noted that there had been a shift in 2008, I believe, that moved things from criminal uh, crimes to civil crimes, which went to collections. Also, there's the problem of citations resulting in uh, community service, which then could be perceived as free labor uh, by uh, the poorest in our community. Uh, also pointing, uh, one thing I brought up was from an article in August, 2005, uh, August 2014 about the issues in Ferguson with regards to the issue of the disproportionate impact of bail schedules on the poor. There were also community members that came to, spoke, or sp to speak about their perspectives and their shared concern about that as well as the strange structure on some of the different bail schedules. So I look forward to that coming back to the council. Um, also, I would urge us when we're talking about the proposals that were made around guns to look at it as a uh, not anti-gun, but a uh, gun safety conversation of figuring out ways that we can make sure that people are uh, protected because there's an average in Santa Cruz alone, an average of 20 guns stolen every year. So that's something that should be uh, on our radar. Uh, some of the proposals had to do with uh, figuring out where guns could be stored, uh, figuring out how guns could be tracked, and figuring out uh, ways that people could be held liable for their weapons being used to cause harm or detrimental injury to another person. So uh, really important conversations. Uh, I wish we could have moved forward on some of the gun legis uh, legislation or proposed gun legislation, but uh, it does need to do uh, have some more research done on the back end so that we can make sure it's implemented holistically and responsibly. Uh, I believe the next meeting is scheduled for December 4th, but we will uh, give an update ideally when that time comes. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Myers. Uh, let's see, I share a number of these committees with other council members, so I think I'm just gonna report on two. Um, Santa Cruz Metro, I'm not sure if council member Matthews followed that. We met, um, I would say the two highlights um, is that the Metro is starting uh, to ready for electric buses. There's a number of that, them that are being purchased as well as um, doing the planning work on um, putting in the charging stations. So um, very excited to see electric buses eventually coming into being um, for our community. So that's one thing of note. The other is um, the Pacific Station project continues to um, move along and be developed uh, between the city staff from the Economic Development Department and also um, the Metro staff. Uh, there has been a significant grant that's been identified to pursue and um, we'll, we'll be working together. I believe um, we might even see an MOU, if I recall, um, coming to the council at some point in the near future. And uh, so that project continues to move forward as well. And then I will, uh, I also uh, was there for the Public Safety Committee and agree with um, the report outs of my colleagues. And um, uh, the last one I'll just report out is the Cal Working Group. Uh, we recently have um, been meeting regarding the um, conditions on the beach as they were reported this year by Heal the Bay. Um, we did do a site visit uh, last week with Public Works to look at some of the infrastructure and we'll be continuing to work out the next set of steps to um, address some of the uh, bacterial uh, uh, results that we've been seeing. Uh, I'll also let the council know that the Cal Working Group um, work will be um, premiered in a video that uh, I believe is going to be taking place at Patagonia on November 7th. It's a, a part of the Save the Waves um, national uh, film tour that's going on. Actually, it's an international film tour, so the city will be prominently uh, or displayed uh, our work on the beach there uh, in, that, uh, in that film festival. I believe it's traveling to... Germany and Ireland and uh, a couple other places in Europe and then uh, several places in the United States. So if you want to see the premiere of that, uh, there's an event at Patagonia at 7 o'clock on November 7th. Okay, so Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Uh, if, if Councilmember Glover's uh, additional is related to, I'll just wait because I just have a quick announcement. Okay, Councilmember Glover. Thank you. I just want to make a quick correction to my report back on the Public Safety Committee. It's, uh, on December the 2nd at 5.30 p.m., I believe, is the next meeting for the Public Safety Committee. 
Thank you for the clarification. Okay, Councilman Moreau. And I just wanted to put in a quick plug for the Regional Transportation Commission's Elderly and Disabled Advisory Committee. We are still seeking um, uh, participants, members for that, uh, that committee, and it's really important to us that we get that feedback. Um, we rely on our advisory <coughs> committees to help guide us in the decisions we make around um, public transit, in particular for elderly and disabled uh, folks. So th it would be really great if anyone out there listening uh, is interested, if you contact the Regional Transportation Commission office and or myself, and we could help you uh, with the, get the application in. Thank you. And then I just have a few brief um, updates. One is the Health and All Policy Subcommittee will have our final meeting tomorrow morning, bright and early, and that um, will anticipate having a, a set of recommendations before the full council at our first meeting in November on November 12th. And um, the only other addition I really had was that the Criminal Justice Council put on a girls and gangs conference um, earlier this month. And there was a lot of um, research presented on the history of girls and gangs, as well as a panel of uh, local and other um, uh, women who came forward to share their stories with those who were present, um, speaking about some of the efforts that worked in terms of the prevention efforts that are happening now in Santa Clara County and ways that we're really trying to com combat um, the engagement of girls and gangs. Um, uh, through prevention and pro-social activities and mentorship. So it was a great opportunity to um, have a community event focused on prevention. And um, I think that's it since the last time we've met and reported back. Councilmember Matthews. A quick question. Um, on the uh, video about the CALS working group, is it specifically about the work of the CALS? It work? is, yeah, yes. Can we get a copy of that to link on our city website? I mean, it'd be great that yeah. we can spread that around. Yeah, the um, so the video will be premiered at that event on the oh. on the seventh, and then the um, the gentleman who's made the video he is doing a cut for us that we can then uh, use or you know have on the city website. And I'd love to share it with Noah as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you all for the work you do outside of uh, city council. So we'll go ahead and at this point move over to our consent agenda. And those are items five through 10 on our agenda. And all items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. So are there any council members wishing to pull any of the consent agenda items, items five through 10? Okay, seeing then, are there any comments or questions from council members on the consent agenda items? I'm seeing none. Is there any member of the community who would like to address the council on our consent agenda? That's items five through 10 in our agenda packet. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back to council for action. I'll, take, I'll move the items. Okay. Second it. Okay, so we, oh, do we have a, okay, please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Just on number 10, that's the pipeline that would have uh, 1220 close while they're doing that building thing. Um, just support from the city council for uh, us to be able to find somewhere else for them. So just knowing that that's a priority for us. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll return back for action. We had council member, I'm sorry, we had Vice Mayor Cummings move the item seconded by council member Myers. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Excuse me, Mayor. Please. You, um, skipped item four, the, ca the calendar. Oh, okay. forgive me. Are there any changes to the council calendar? Uh, okay. Just the addition of the special meeting on the 29th. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Oh, I did, thank you. Any questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and, and then thank you for reminding me. I skipped over that one. So at this time, we'll go ahead and move on to our general business portion of the agenda. And first um, item is the City Cannabis Children's Fund budget adjustment. And we have uh, Parks Director uh, Tony Elliott here to present the item. 
All right, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Tony Elliott with the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, before the City Council's request to appropriate the City's Cannabis Tax Children's Fund uh, toward two programs to serve early childhood development uh, and serve underserved youth uh, in Santa Cruz. Uh, the children's fund portion of the city's cannabis tax is 12.5% uh, uh, of that overall bucket. Uh, currently in uh, our accounts after um, last year's uh, audited financial statements, we have $60,634 available uh, to be um, appropriated toward two different uses. Um, in May of 2018, this item uh, came before the city council, the previous city council, um, and we received direction at that time for 50% of those funds, approximately $30,000, uh, to go to Thrive by Three, um, which is a program through um, uh, First Five uh, of Santa Cruz County, and David Brody, the executive director of uh, First Five, is here to speak uh, to any details on that, but 50% to Thrive by Three, um, which uh, serves children, um, ages zero to three. So in Parks and Recreation, we typically don't serve those young of kids. So this is a, an effort to, to serve that need. The other 50% would be to vulnerable and underserved youth uh, as recommended by the city schools committee. So again, to summarize that, the May 2018 council direction, 50% to thrive by three, 50% uh, as directed by the city schools committee. So this past April of 2019, we met with the city schools committee, um, including a, a few council members, and the city schools committee recommended that 50% of those funds, uh, the other 50%, go to Friends of Parks and Recreation uh, for scholarships to underserved uh, and low-income youth. Um, the city school superintendent, Chris Monroe, uh, was not able to be here today, but uh, I believe may have reached out to the city council to offer her support uh, on the recommended direction uh, of these funds. Uh, also, Friends of Parks and Recreation, our current board treasurer, Holly Locatelli, is here to speak uh, on behalf of FOPAR if the council has any questions um, about the funds that would go to FOPAR and then be dispersed to uh, families with uh, youth with different needs uh, for, for programs. Um, and then I mentioned already the 50% uh, to Thrive by Three, um, again, in that bracket that we don't, uh, we don't serve very well through Parks and Recreation. So, um, a part of the original policy direction, this is Council Policy 12.16, 12.16, uh, is that the, these programs uh, to which uh, funds through the Cannabis Tax and Children's Fund are given, that they be evidence-based programs. So that's a big piece of what we reviewed in this, is that these are evidence-based programs. <coughs> And so the plan moving forward, if approved by City Council today, staff would report back to City Council um, as part of the fiscal year 21 budget process to uh, let you know how the process has been uh, based on these appropriations um, and with a recommendation moving into fiscal year 21 um, as well. So again, so there's a lot of pieces here. I'm happy to answer any questions, but to summarize, the request today for City Council is to appropriate the City's Cannabis uh, Tax Children's Fund of $60,634 to the Parks and Recreation Department to be allocated as follows. 50% to Thrive by Three uh, to serve Santa Cruz youth ages zero to three and 50% to Friends of Parks and Recreation uh, for youth scholarships for programs, camps, and activities through the Parks and Recreation Department. So with that, uh, happy to answer any questions um, or defer to David or Holly uh, with any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Questions from council? Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Brown. Oh, okay, thank you. So uh, I love the, the concept, it's great. Um, I was looking for documentation about it on Friday and it didn't come in until later in the afternoon and even then there wasn't much description as to what the programs are, the selection process, all that. So you said that the money for the, uh, that was recommended by the city school committee and to go to FOPAR would focus on, quote, youth with different needs. Can you elaborate as to what that means? Yeah, it's a good question. It's primarily underserved youth and primarily low-income youth. So uh, FOPAR, and I may lean on Holly Locatelli to speak to this as well, but we receive a number of applications from community members, from families, uh, who want their kids to experience the different programs and classes that we offer through Parks and Recreation. Um, and so a lot of times those are too expensive, unattainable, um, and so FOPAR raises money independently uh, for scholarships to give out to different youth in the community. 
So the FOPAR board, uh, twice per year, they review those applications based on merit, based on um, uh, household income and uh, different thresholds there and different, different family needs um, through that process. So FOPAR then makes a recommendation based on how much money through the scholarship program is granted to support uh, the various needs based on the, those applications. So it's an independent process from uh, the city or from Parks and Recreation, but we uh, take those recommendations from uh, FOPAR and then apply um, scholarship dollars as appropriate. So the money here, this 50%, approximately $30,000, <clears> that would, um, help grow the program. So FOPAR already, I think uh, annually, it, it probably varies, but probably between 20 and $30,000 a year is what FOPAR gives out in scholarships. So this would almost double that program. Um, and last year there was more demand in that program than what uh, FOPAR could, could pay out. So um, uh, there, there's certainly a, a demand for these uh, scholarship dollars. That's what, oh. if, I could, can I, if I could just briefly add, in our April meeting also with the city schools subcommittee, we learned from uh, Chris Monroe and others that had they known there was this potential for extra resources to support some of the vulnerable youth in their community, I mean in their school district, um, they would have worked with some of the homeless families to help them enroll. And so part of this also is saying, not only do we have a gap of people who we know have access to being able to um, apply for FOPAR, but now we know that we can kind of reach out to these folks that are particularly vulnerable um, to help them along the way so that they now even know that they could potentially even access it and potentially have that scholarship to allow their child to do it. So that that built relationship will enhance it through the Children's Fund essentially also, if that feels reflective of our meeting. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so it's an independent process from the city and Parks and Rec. So how is the decision made on where the money goes? Also, is there a history or data set of families or demographics that have been supported by the existing program that can justify the impact that it's been having? Yeah, I don't believe we have that today, but we can aggregate that data. Um, uh, yeah, who received funds, when, um, and so forth. So I'll, I'll lean on Holly Locatelli to to comment. So, so every year we have uh, scholarships that go out and the big time we do that is the summer uh, program. So we get the applications and we don't keep uh, records so much on, because when we're looking at it, we don't even look at the program that they're um, applying for. So we don't <coughs> give any bias to like, oh, we want everybody to go into junior guards or everybody to this. It's strictly on um, income. And uh, sometimes, you know, people only want like one class that costs a hundred dollars. Sometimes, that's the childcare for the family for the whole summer, and they need both sessions of junior guards. So you're looking at over five hundred dollars. So, in order to serve everyone, we usually have to do a limit. Um, to make the money go as far as we can. So we'll set like $300. So sometimes somebody doesn't need that whole $300 and they can get the program they want, or they will get the first session that'll cover the first session, maybe $50 of the second session of junior guards or another, you know, the older the kids, usually the, the more expensive the program gets or the longer it lasts. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes they won't do the second session because they can't get the, the whole other $200 together. So that's really heartbreaking. The other um, program we do every summer that since I've been there since 2014 is the city works with um, Mercy Housing, which is uh, Sycamore Commons, Nary Lagoon. And we have 25 kids that get to go to free swim at Harvey West uh, twice a week for two weeks. And that's something we've been funding too. And that is, a great program. Some of those kids, when they write the thing, we've gotten thank you notes from them. First time they've ever been in a pool. It, it, it's just amazing. And I would like to see this program grow to where instead of just free swim and introducing them to a pool, we do swim lessons at Harvey West with them. And then they know how to swim and maybe they want to do junior guards. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, and it sounds like it has uh, definitely been beneficial for certain families, which is wonderful. Um, my concern is in a community that is uh, majority white, uh, to make sure that, especially in low-income communities, uh, especially because of the cost of rent and housing, which is unchecked locally, to be able to make sure that we can uh, ensure that those dollars are going to make sure that people that uh, are 
from traditionally underserved communities, not just low income, are able yeah. to have access to the funds. So I just want to, uh, I don't know if there's a plan for a report back eventually with regards to where the money's going um, or a more, more robust, you, do you know what you track with regards to where that money goes? The money goes, goes to uh, programs of the parks and recreation for kids. Oh, no, no, um, but, uh, you have to meet a, a criteria for, for how much wages the parent is using and depending on how many kids in the family. It's very similar to the free lunch program. Absolutely. So um, we don't ask for information like people of color. We don't do that. It's is there a reason why? That we don't do that. Um, it, we're a nonprofit. We're not a government <laughs> agency. I don't know why. Um, we could probably, I mean, I don't know my, my why question, we would do that. My question is because you, since you're you receiving a, um, an amount of city funds that could potentially double your budget to be able to do that kind of outreach, um, ensuring that we're looking at ma uh, maximizing the equity distribution of that money and yeah. not tracking the demographics of the people that the money is going to, well, I can understand. So if we're a majority, uh, excuse, excuse uh, me, uh, excuse me. Oh, okay. um, while I can understand while that um, may be an extra step to take, but to make sure that within the distribution of the funds, it's not going to say 90% white households and 10% non-white households. So those are the kind of things that I want to make sure that we're uh, on top of with this kind of money distribution. And maybe if I could interject, I think one of the things that we learned and um, and found from our partners meeting with the city schools committee was that there is a huge need of um, access to our parks and rec programs for youth and for families that are struggling to live here. And having that relationship between the city schools committee, the parks department and the schools, we'll be able to really target and identify some of those folks to apply for FOPAR using the funds. So we'll help kind of make that bridge in a way that hasn't previously existed. So I think it is sort of, um, you know, it's, um, um, we're building it as we go, um, and there will be report backs on it, but what it will do is meet a need and, and enhance a relationship to help get those folks who wouldn't even have had applied or even thought that would even be possible for them to get there. And with that, how much respond really quick? Sure. Um, so I totally understand that, and it's fantastic about the potential of what will happen. My goal is that at least in the motion or in the action that we take today, that there is the incorporation of some kind of uh, tracking system with those report backs that intentionally looks at the demographics that are being served by the mine. That's where okay. I'm trying to go with this. I, I don't think that would be a problem. Okay. Yeah, we can work with uh, Friends of Parks and Recreation to figure out uh, an appropriate way to do that. And I think with the schools as well, I mean, this is a very collaborative effort with the schools. And as Mayor Watkins mentioned, uh, we've learned a lot just with this opportunity and going through this process, uh, namely, um, the, the potential lack of access um, uh, for Spanish speakers to even know what's available. We have not printed our activity guide in Spanish historically, which we are working on right now to do for the first time. So there's some, there's some steps that we can take um, to make sure that people know what's going on and going directly to families and kids in the schools and not necessarily just wait for them uh, to find our website or find our activity guide. So I think there's some proactive things that we can do, but I think collaboratively with the schools, um, we can work to, to, to get those metrics. Again, this has got to be evidence-based, and I understand what you're saying about collecting that, that evidence. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilmember Brown. Uh, I have a, a quick question about the Thrive by Three portion of, since you're here, um, the Thrive by Three portion of the, the funding. I'd just like to hear a little bit, I, I know the program, but I don't know very much about the specific um, services that might be provided through this particular pot of money, if you could elaborate sure, sure. a little bit on what you do. Thank you, Council Member Brown. And just for the record, I'm David Brody. I'm the Executive Director of First Five mm -hmm. Santa Cruz County. Uh, and just for um, a little bit of education, I think you, most of you, or if not all of you, are aware, we are an independent county commission solely dedicated to supporting the health and well-being of young children prenatal through age five in the entire county. Um, as you know, Thrive by Three was a fund started at the um, County of Santa Cruz, but we are the backbone of that structure of that of that initiative. Um, we uh, essentially staff an advisory committee that oversees the implementation of Thrive by Three. We oversee the entire evaluation of Thrive by Three, and then we also directly manage some of the program elements that are components of Thrive by Three. 
Um, one of those elements is something that we call the Early Learning Scholarship Program. That's actually something we modeled off of um, a, a system in San Francisco that provides a range of different types of early learning scholarships to support essentially the provision of high quality early care and education to city residents in San Francisco. Um, we took that concept, localized it, and made it specific to infants and toddler care, which is the most critical area of need for care, both in the city and the county at large. Um, and have run program uh, for two years now, distributing funds to our early care, our early learning community in support of services over the last two years to somewhere in the nature of 275 um, youth and their families. Um, and so I think there's still some uh, details to be worked out how we would implement this specifically, but the idea is that we would leverage that early learning scholarship program and the various um, sort of ways it can be implemented, again, modeling after what they've learned in San Francisco, um, specific to city of Santa Cruz, infants and toddlers, uh, families who are residents of the city. Thank you for being here. Question, Councilmember Crum. How would you characterize um, First Five and Thrive by Three? Is that a um, the county program or how is the city involved with it? So First Five, uh, just to start there, is again an independent entity uh, in the county of Santa Cruz and our mandate is the entire county. Thrive by Three has begun as a children's fund at the county level with funds going towards a range of services and system supports over the entire county. Our vision and goal is that anyone and everyone contribute to the Thrive by Three effort uh, and that work is then organized essentially by First Five because we obviously have this um, service area in our, in our mandate um, to make best use of public and private resources in support of the healthy development of our, our very youngest kids and their families. Thank you. I have a question for uh, Tony. Tony, is there, are there other programs, because I'm understanding this is all gonna go into Parks and Rec and then Parks and Rec is going to distribute it. Are there other programs that you could point to where we um, contribute to county uh, programs? That's a good question. I can't think of any offhand. Um, a couple things I want to mention on this. So the going back to the May 2018 council direction, there was a friendly amendment added to that motion um, such that funds um, uh, going to Thrive by Three stay uh, with kids and families in the city of Santa Cruz. So that was a friendly amendment added in 2018 and, and for the council's consideration today um, uh, to focus those towards city uh, families and residents. Um, and the reason we, uh, uh, I think, bring this opportunity before city council is simply because we don't provide this, um, these type of programs and services through parks and recreation. So this is probably our closest sort of governmental or quasi-governmental um, entity uh, to potentially partner with to serve this need and, and an expert uh, certainly in, in our community. And if I could, I'll just add, if, if, if that's okay. Um, so I've been attending some of the Thrive by Three collaborative meetings. So there's a oversight committee, um, and David can speak to those that are um, sitting on those committees. And somebody from the city would continue to represent the city's interests and sort of to weigh in at that, at that type of meeting. Um, but one of the exciting things about what I feel this offers for our community is we have as you've read, I'm sure, a huge need for childcare. We have a huge demographic of people who struggle to live here who have young children. It's often more expensive to pay for childcare than it is to pay for your rent here. Um, and so for us to be able to leverage this existing kind of infrastructure, but to reorient that in a way that's gonna give back to our city residents trying to raise their families here and have their kids um, in quality care is a really great opportunity and it's that leveraging similar to the um, older youth population that we're looking at trying to enhance here with these partnerships. So, um, you know, thankfully we have this um, administrative structure emerging or evolving that we can look to be able to um, fit to meet the needs of our, of our city residents as well. Follow-up question, uh, when I ask Tony. Um, so if we had, um, I mean, it also sounds like uh, Ms. Locatelli just said that uh, some of the money that is apportioned uh, to low-income folks, that provides childcare as well. Um, it seems to me, I mean, it could, could you use, if you had 100%, if you had all this, would, would there be the need there in the uh, Parks and Rec programming? 
I think to build on what Mayor Watkins said, we I would say that we in Parks and Recreation don't necessarily have that infrastructure in place to, to serve those needs necessarily. Um, we don't have expertise in or facilities necessarily in working with kids zero to three. No, my, um, I'm sorry, my yeah. question was, if you had the, the whole 60,000, could you, is the need there within Parks and Rec programs? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, as of now, the data that we would share, uh, it would show that it's not there. But uh, again, we have not done the outreach to the community. As we mentioned, we have not completely reached out through the schools. Uh, we've not put Spanish language um, flyers and information out. So we think the demand is there. Um, but if you look at the numbers over the past, say, three to five years, based on what has been requested and what we've given out, um, we would uh, that would not show that that full 60,000 um, is demanded. But we believe that need is there. Um, we just couldn't couldn't demonstrate it at this point. Thanks. I mean, I'll just say there's a lot there's a lot of need here in this community, especially for the needs of children and um, for the needs of young children, particularly. So. That, that's, I'm worried about yeah. setting a precedent where we're going outside the city to fund a county program. So that, that's that's my so concern. Just I'll just sort of clarify the 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 county infrastructure is the existing infrastructure with the players that know early childhood that are going to help advise and use their infrastructure to redistribute those dollars to specifically city kids and city families. So we're essentially leveraging their infrastructure mm -hmm. to best serve the needs of the early childhood kids in our community since absent having an early childhood emphasis in our own departments. Yeah. So we won't be funding a county program. We're using the county's infrastructure to help fund our families and kids for early childhood. Exactly. It's essentially, it's really the infrastructure of First Five, which we are primarily funded by a statewide tobacco tax. And so we're leveraging sort of what we've learned in the administrative process that we put in place with respect to, to Thrive by Three, but more importantly, the foundation of our administrative capacity that's been built for 20 years now. And to be really clear, I want to be direct about this. Our intent is to not take any administrative or operational overhead on these dollars. So every penny that comes from the city will go back out to supporting city kids and city families. Um, and that's what we're able to do because of our Proposition 10 funding and our state mandate. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, any other questions? The only thing I would add before maybe we open it up to public comment is, um, that building in the report back, having the city schools involved, being connected to Thrive by Three, there will be ongoing conversations with the city in these different initiatives, and the council will be made um, um, kind of the, aware of some of the outcomes and data and, and families, the numbers of families and kids served as a, as a result. So I think it's, I personally think it's very, very exciting. So thank you very much. Is there any member of the community who would like to address the council on this item? Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Hi, and thank you, uh, Pat Malo. Um, I have founded a local cannabis business trade association. I'm also on the board of WAM, the oldest medical collective. Um, and I also had the pleasure of working with um, you guys um, to create this program, not just here, but also at the county. Um, I wanna say that I'm really happy about, you know, the monies from cannabis business tax going to uh, Thrive by Three program. I'm also really happy about it going to our local Parks and Rec. I mean, they've had a, I've been employed by them, been a child in their programs, and I've, you know, volunteered for Friends of Parks and Rec and written checks for sweatshirts to them for years. So I think it's great and fitting that it's coming back to them. Um, I also want to just acknowledge that when we had this conversation at the county, it, the, there was a lot of folks who came forward saying that they would like a slice of this stuff as well, just in relation to the Thrive by Three stuff. So there's a never ending need for this early childhood development stuff. I think that the childcare piece of it, especially was, uh, you know, we want extra revenue for that. Um, and that was a piece that in the county discussion we had about it where 
the they didn't get as large of a piece of the pie as they would like. Um, and I think that there's, you know, so many legitimate claims to this money that we need to do whatever we can to, uh, you know, keep having these discussions. And I think if this is, we're talking about 12.5% of, you know, the initial pool of money off of a new industry and idea called legal cannabis. And so I think we need to both have the discussion about what to do with the other 87.5% of this money. I know it's going to the general fund, but as a cannabis person, I want new things in the community that the community can see concretely because of the change in law. And then I also want as much of it going to good programs that we can brag about. But then let's also not forget that this money, the tax rates are literally putting businesses out of business. So let's have that discussion as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead. And if there's, is there any other members of the community who would like to address the council on this item? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back for action and deliberation. Council yeah, um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, move the recommendation uh, for funding as described with the additional request for a report that includes um, information on the demographics and impact of the allocations. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, um, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Did you catch the additional um, recommendation to encompass some of the demographic data? Councilmember Brown? Oh, I just want to make another comment as well. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased with this. This is the first year out of the shoot for this. So um, uh, obviously these are decisions we'll make on an annual basis. Um, I think uh, allocating some to Thrive by Three uh, is is a good call that will come back to uh, Santa Cruz County or city families. Um, I can't say enough about the value of the FOPAR scholarships to the, the families that have benefited from them, um, particularly working families um, who really depend on those summer programs at a very affordable uh, cost the the scholarships make it possible whether it's day camps for little kids or junior guards for the older kids and the special interest activities for low-income kids whether it's theater martial arts whatever the, the those special opportunities to develop their skills are so important the scholarships have been maxed out in past years um, this will basically double the size of the opportunities. Um, certainly a lot's been learned in terms of working with the schools for referrals, but working with the community-based organizations. The announcement goes in every Parks and Rec catalog. We can do much more to promote it and having the capacity to to make scholarships is really valuable. I think this is, this is the year we scale up. I completely understand Chris's point that there's obviously more opportunity, so we'll see where that goes. But I think this is a really good resolution for this year, for our first year out. Okay. Councilor Brown, and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, I just make a couple of quick comments. Um, you know, I'm pleased to be able to support this um, proposal and this motion, and want to thank uh, the folks who came to answer our questions. Um, and. Um, one of the things that I was initially concerned about when I saw this come up was having been in the conversation with uh, the city schools, uh, si the city schools committee, city dash schools. Um, you know, my I had rec I had re remembered that we were talking about um, potentially more of that funding, a higher dollar amount, and that was just my recollection. But and then I was a little concerned about the where the money was going to go in within the thrive by three universe, but I'm really, really thrilled to hear that um, you're talking about using that money for direct program to serve um, young, young ch infants and young, young children. Those of us who have been following this for many years have seen the evisceration of childcare funding uh, for, um, for very young uh, infant and toddler care is the most expensive. It's sometimes more expensive. It's, it costs more than one can earn <laughs> at a low wage job. Um, so um, that, you know, that's happened at the federal and state level. And this is a very small contribution that we can make to try to um, boost whatever programs we can, we've been able to hold on to and, and expand upon. Um, so happy to support it. And I guess I can just, um, 
I'll just agree with the statements that were made by my colleagues because I was going to pretty much make the same ones. But having benefited from um, some of these programs as a young kid and being able to go to summer camps, which ultimately led me to go into a career that focuses on environmental protection, I think that providing kids, especially low-income kids, with an opportunity to get outside and, and their families to have an option for childcare in the summer is great. Um, the one thing that I would just like to ask or recommend is that if there's any way we can get a report back on the, on um, the impact of these funds in these programs, I think it would be great for us to be able to see how the funds were used and how the families benefited from them. But I'm really happy with this being brought forward and having been on the committee. I'm glad we can bring this to our community. Councilmember Cronin, then Councilmember Myers. Um, Just want to remind folks, you know, I'm, I'm a supporter because there's so many good, so few dollars chasing so many good programs. Um, but I just want to remind newer council members of the politics of this. And if you look at the dates here, you know, Sandy Brown and I were at it. We were working for the foster grandparent program, the toddler center, and the neighborhood child care center, trying to get them more funding. And uh, now we're expanding it and giving a whole bunch more money to a new program rather than shoring up the programs we already are supporting. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to support this, but I'm just saying that th th there's politics uh, uh, going into this too. And a previous council decided on these decisions and not the present council. Okay, Councilmember Myers and then Vice Mayor Pinnock. I, I just want to thank both FOPAR and um, the uh, uh, First Five um, and just the partnership and um, the work of the city schools to um, what it sounds like uh, initiate a really strong program for the youth of the community So and the little guys. Um, so I just wanted to express my thanks and I'll be supporting the motion. Okay, the one I will. I, I'm 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 thrilled, and I too want to thank those that were involved as well as my <coughs> colleagues. And the one thing I will say is that um, this action today doesn't preclude any continual funding that's already been prioritized through core or other means. This is a sustained set aside investments of the city and the city council for early childhood and prevention. And I think it's a small step, but it's a step that hopefully will actualize in a, in a time where we can have no child not being able to access our parks and rec programs for a lack of funding or, um, or, or families who are just struggling so direly to be able to live here and raise their kids here if they have young children. So it's a small, it's a small step to do that. And it's um, it's not politics. It's it's people and kids for for me. So um, I'm thrilled, and I am thrilled to see where this will go over the years, and to hear a report back on the number of children we're able to positively influence. So, with that, we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. And thank you for being here. No, I went to a concert. Okay. I haven't found the scissors. So we'll go ahead and transition up here. No, I went to another one. Into the restroom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was doing. All right. I didn't get to go to any, but. So. Ready? <laughs> okay. Everywhere. We'll go ahead and have um, the next item, which is item number 12. And we have uh, our planning director, Lee Butler, here. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And <clears throat> the item before you right now is our direction to reconcile the general plan and zoning code provisions, um, particularly as they relate to our corridors, uh, Mission, Water, Ocean, and SoCal. So our general plan was adopted circa 2012 after significant public outreach and roughly a seven year process. And one of the provisions, um, one of the, the key tenants of the general plan was development along the corridors. And the um, council in the community at the time um, looked at the environmental benefits and the public health benefits associated with development along the corridors and selected to concentrate much of the city's growth in those areas. Fast forward a few years, circa 2015, the city initiated an effort to rezone 
the corridors so that they are consistent with the general plan. And that effort, after about two years, was put on hold. And then in August of this year, we received formal direction, official direction from the council to stop that prior process. In the interim, time between uh, 2017 and now, there have been a lot of state law changes that have um, affected what we can and cannot do. The Housing Accountability Act has been updated um, both with AB 3194 and with SB 330, which is the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. And both of those have significant implications on the work that we do in planning and the policy um, options that the council has. We certainly understand uh, many of the concerns that the community has expressed about um, new development and the implications of new development, whether that's traffic or parking or building heights. And we understand also that development is complex and dynamic, particularly with the new state laws that are coming into effect. And so we want to serve as staff as a resource for both the council and the community in navigating this regulatory framework. And um, we, no matter what the direction the council provides today, want to make sure that we're having a broad community engagement process that um, really seeks to um, hear from as many people as we can out in the community. And so with that, I will turn it over to our uh, principal planner, Sarah Fleming, and our senior planner, Sarah Noisy, uh, to talk about the options that we have and some of the details surrounding the reconciliation effort. Good afternoon. So um, Lee just discussed a fair amount of the background, but I'm just going to, so I'll move pretty quickly through these first couple of slides. So um, we received direction on August 27th to um, stop work on any um, efforts implementing the general plan and con convene meetings with groups that had been heavily involved with that prior effort. Um, we were also given some specific direction about how the new, what the new project would include. Um, it would include goals to preserve and protect residential neighborhood areas and existing city businesses, encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use development, specifically including enhanced affordable housing opportunities at appropriate locations along the city's main transportation corridors, and among a few other details, allow the council to adopt zoning code and general plan amendments no later than no later than um, November 2020, which um, is the direction, that's the direction we've gotten. So um, a little bit of background about why there is a mismatch between our zoning and our general plan. Um, as Lee mentioned, the general plan that we are, under which the city is currently operating, the 2030 general plan was adopted in 2012, based on work that happened from 2007, at least maybe beginning some of the background work before that, um, up to 2012 which created and established a vision for focusing growth along the primary transportation connector, connections through our city, which are known collectively as the corridors, both in the document and um, sort of colloquially in the community. Um, and there are policies throughout the general plan and all of the elements that really support this vision of creating neighborhoods that are walkable, that are equitable and produce a variety of types of housing that place jobs and housing in close proximity to each other so that we're um, addressing the needs of our community both for economic growth and for um, housing options. It also specifically, in order to sort of implement those policies, created some new land use designations that had not previously existed in the city before that were specifically called out for mixed use development. So housing, when, when we use that term as plan artists, we mean housing and commercial development on the same property. Um, and then it, the, the maps that are in the general plan applied those designations to uh, several parcels in the city along those primary transportation routes that are currently zoned for commercial uses. So they carry either um, a community commercial and, or neighborhood commercial um, designation. So the prior effort that was dubbed the corridors plan was based upon this land use pattern that was established by the 2030 general plan and sought to create new zoning districts to implement these mixed use land use designations in the general plan. And as Lee mentioned, that work was paused in 2017. So um, I wanted us all, just so we all have the same frame of reference, here's our existing zoning map. Um, what this is showing is um, sort of that pale pink color 
Here, this is our community commercial designation, and you can see that this is kind of concentrated along ocean, Soquel, water, and then it appears along Mission, it's a little bit harder to see along Mission because it's underneath the um, highway um, indicator. And then we also have this darker pink color, that's neighborhood commercial, and we see more of that um, up here along the top part of Mission. Um, and then kind of scattered throughout in some other, some other places. So this is the zoning map that currently governs development standards in the city. Here's the general plan map that uh, was adopted as part of the general plan. So this is looking at all the land use designations. Um, you know, the yellows, oranges, and browns are residential development, and you'll see that a lot of our um, the area of the city is dedicated to um, residential land uses. And then again, the, the pink that this darkest, not the darkest, but one of the darker pink colors is community commercial. And again, you'll see that this is, com this is concentrated along our, um, these primary east, west, north, south connections. So Water Street, Soquel, Mission Street, um, and then to a lesser degree here along Ocean. And then what's new with this general plan are these um, parcels that are shown in stripes. So these are the mixed use designations and this is where they were applied um, as part of the general plan process. This black line is a pull in, that's the next map I'm gonna show you, it's just sort of focusing in on those. Um, so these are the parcels that we're talking about when we're talking about the mismatch between the general plan and the zoning ordinance. These, this is the, um, the universe of properties that we're talking about have a, currently a mismatch between the general plan designation and the zoning, just so that we're all sort of having the same understanding of what we're talking about here. So um, currently the mixed use land use designations do not have any zoning code that fully implements those land use designations. So unlike um, you know, a general plan land use designation for low density residential, we have R15, R17, R110 zoning that implements that general plan designation. So um, when development wants to happen in those areas, if a homeowner wants to add something to their parcel, they can go to the zoning code, they can look and see what standards apply to their property. That same level of certainty and understanding is not available on these parcels shown on this map. So, um, First step that we've taken in this process, this as directed by um, your council, we held a focus group, it was attended by about a dozen representatives of various civic, civic groups that were involved with the prior effort. Um, and we spent the first few minutes of that meeting sort of reviewing the old effort and sort of gathering any useful feedback that things they felt that it was important for staff to know as we move into a, the next effort um, and, and sort of hitting the high notes of what was, what really had not gone well and what, you know, maybe could have been useful out of that process. And that was just really good background for our staff, our team to have because um, none of us were involved with either the writing of the general plan or the prior effort to implement it. So we are all still really getting up to speed about the, um, the various uh, pieces of this effort. And then we spent the bulk of the meeting discussing um, how are we going to achieve these goals that are established in your council's direction. So there were several phrases that we pulled out to really discuss with this group and gather their points of view. Um, preserve and protect existing neighborhoods. For some folks, that really came down to um, the physical structure of the neighborhoods, like how, how wide the roadways are, how wide the sidewalks are, how tall the buildings are, the views that you can have as you move through an area, um, how intersections are currently configured, like really sort of keeping our physical structure intact as much as possible. And for other folks, it really was about the character of the demographics in a neighborhood. When they think about their home and their neighborhood, they think about the type of neighborhood it is. They think about it as being a neighborhood of, um, you know, UCSC, you know, faculty or a, or a working class neighborhood, and they want to see that character remain for into the future. So they, so other people were talking about they wanted to have options to to have the physical structure change so it could accommodate um, the equity that currently exists in their neighborhood. So that it was about reducing displacement for existing 
folks and for existing, you know, for those demographic categories that they could continue to live in those neighborhoods. So a variety of opinions. Families was one thing that came up. Someone talked about how um, she doesn't have any families with kids in her neighborhood anymore, and that was the case all the way through the 70s and 80s, and she would give them chalk to play in the um, driveway, and she doesn't have hardly any of that now in her neighborhood. So um, We also discussed appropriate mixed-use development. Um, for some folks, this was really about protecting parking, managing cut-through car trips, and that could, that could change the traffic pattern on an existing roadway and um, really have an effect on a residential neighborhood as it accepts um, adjacent commercial development. Um, for, for a couple people, it really was just about height and really specifically three stories limiting height to three stories as it b backs up to um, a residential neighborhood. Um, and then for other people, they talked more about, you know, it's, it's more about the building design and how it relates to the public sphere and how wide are the sidewalks. And with a wider sidewalk, a bigger building doesn't feel um, inappropriate in, in the same way or it doesn't feel out of context or out of scale with the way the public realm is happening. Talked about 360 design so that um, the view from the back of a building is also a view that's worth having. So again, a variety of opinions. Um, and then the last phrase that we really dug into was about enhanced affordable housing opportunities. Um, this one really brought up a conversation about addressing commute pressures, both um, inside the county and between counties. So we have um, low wage workers that are commuting into Santa Cruz who are unable to find housing here that works for them and the needs of their families. And we have higher wage workers that are unable or uninterested in living close to their jobs over the hill in Silicon Valley. And so we have these commute pressures that um, are, that we are accommodating currently on our roadways and in our city. Um, we also then talked about a mix of housing types and, and creating the type of housing that um, is really needed to maintain those demographic characteristics. So if we have, if families is a, is a demographic that we want to target? Are we creating housing um, that's really going to meet the needs of families? And are, are we creating opportunities for families to be able to find housing in the city? <clears throat> um, and then for some folks, um, thinking about enhanced affordable housing opportunities was really about just the total number of restricted units. Like, are we creating the right number of deed restricted units that are available to folks at 50% or less of AMI. Um, so there are a number of different ways to look at that and sort of um, collecting all of these points of view and figuring out a way to um, address the needs that are expressed and come to some compromise. That's the ch gonna be the challenge of this process as we move through it. Staff is gonna have a lot of conversations with the public. Because um, again, this is just one group of like a dozen people. We're a city of 70,000. So, um, there are that many opinions about what's appropriate and how, what do we need and what's missing. So this is gonna be, the, the heart of this work is gonna be having these conversations and um, all of us collectively, you know, listening to each other and coming up with um, agreements about where we wanna go and what these, how we're gonna interpret these um, various terms. So. A lot of that work went into creating the maps that we have, went into creating the general plan. The general plan creates a vision. We espouse our values as a community. We envision what we want for the future. We write it down. We use that to guide policy language. We write policies and those policies give us maps. So all of that process was kind of done at, you know, the um, just before the economic downturn, you know, starting in you know 2005, 2000, between 2005 and 2007, and continuing up to 2012, and so then moving forward with these maps um, to develop zoning code that would um, you know implement the vision as established in the adopted general plan. Um, that was the goal of that of. Um, that was the goal of the previous effort. That was the goal that the community was engaged in. And that's, um, we're gonna have to re-engage with that at this point, um, given the direction that we have. So just did one more little piece of context and then we'll get into our options. So as, um, as Lee mentioned, the Housing Crisis Act of 2019, uh, was numbered SB 330, limits um, city review of housing projects, and it defines that term to, it's essentially, a, it's a mixed use project. It's anything that in includes housing, at certain ratios, 
um, to the application of objective standards. So an objective standard is something that it can be measured by anybody. So a building height is 30 feet. Anyone, we can all agree, will establish how we measure height from what point to what point on the roof. That's 30 feet, and we can all understand what an ob objective standard is. It could also be something as complex as this. I lifted this from the city of Spokane, Washington. So it creates step backs and an angle at which those step backs can happen so that there's a transition from a single family neighborhood to a, you know, this is a, obviously a very tall building and this is a really big zone that they're working in a different context than we are. But objective standards can be used to create a lot of articulation in buildings and um, can really form design within um, a set of standards that we can all write down and look at and applicants know what they are, neighbors know what they are, planning department and um, decision makers know what the standards are. So as of January 1st, we are only gonna be allowed to apply the objective standards that exist in the zoning code and in the general plan. Um, we can, as we move forward through this process, um, if we create objective standards, um, those standards apply to any project uh, as soon as they submit a preliminary application. So basically like the sooner we can have um, objective standards in place, the more projects they will then apply to. It also though, then requires that within the city's general plan that there's no net loss of development capacity going back to January 1, 2018. So the capacity that was accommodated as of January 1, 2018, which is the capacity that is accounted for in the general plan, the development capacity, um, must be maintained throughout the city. So if the capacity is reduced on one parcel, for example, by reducing the height, um, a similar amount of capacity would have to be added to a similar amount of acreage elsewhere in the city. So simultaneously, those actions would have to happen at the same time. So those are the requirements of state law that we're now working in. So um, given that context, um, the first option for your council to consider is that um, the project from this point simply become the development of these objective standards. Um, we would use the existing general plan land use maps that are adopted as part of the general plan um, and we would create zoning codes with objective design standards and development standards that we could then apply to those parcels that carry those mixed use land use designations. Um, we're guessing at this point that the timing would be somewhere but a little bit over a year, less than a year and a half, um, and costs in the range of three hundred to four hundred fifty thousand dollars. And um, as is made clear by the next item on your agenda, this is an ideal candidate for an SB two grant. It is. Um, one of the categories that's guaranteed to be approved. So we know we could get some outside funding to help us do this, because, I mean, the cost isn't gonna change whether or not we get the grant, like that's what this project would cost. And so um, it, it is an opportunity right now, we have an opportunity to um, get some outside funding to support this work, which is um, a really good option. So option two is to amend the general plan. So um, to, redistribute the growth potential to other areas of the county and sort of move away from the vision that was included in this general plan to really focus growth into a few limited locations and look for other areas in the city that could um, receive that growth potential. So um, this would involve an extensive public outreach process. The outreach process and the, and the public participation involved in developing this 2030 general plan was extensive. It was broad, it was deep, it was long. And so a major amendment deserves that, a substantial amendment of any kind really deserves that same level of engagement with the community. They have a right and an obligation, responsibility to participate in um, efforts like this. And so really as a result of the, um, the community outreach that would be our obligation, the timing on this would be really um, different. It would be at least two years, if not much longer. I mean, this effort to, to get to this point of the general plan was a seven year process. That included the economic downturn, so there was like some slowdown. Um, but a, a significant amendment of this document would be a very big undertaking. And it would have um, an appropriate, appropriate, appropriately um, large timing 
impact and cost impact. So given that, <laughs> um, the recommendation on our staff report was that your council accept the monthly report on the general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort and consider options for bringing the two documents into alignment. And we are now adding to that recommendation that by motion, your council direct staff to pursue option one as discussed. And we are here if you have any questions. Thank you for your presentation. And I believe Councilmember Myers has a few questions. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. Um, it looked like on the map, um, the blowout blow map, Sarah, that you showed us of the mixed use designations. So it looks like there's three categories of those. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that just, yes. That's density primarily? That's about density and use. So the that yellow color says mixed use medium density, 10 to 30 dwelling units per acre. And it also includes an, a floor area ratio of 0.75 to 1.75. And then the orange is the mixed use visitor commercial, which is um, anywhere from zero to 55 dwelling units per acre. So in that zoning, zone district, it is mixed use and um, residential uses would be allowed, but as envisioned in the general plan, it wouldn't include general any residential units by right. Um, that would be part of um, providing some uh, some benefits to the community. So that, and that's it's the, what the general plan currently says is details are in the zoning ordinance. Um, it's optimistically written at the time. So, and, and then that final brown category is the mixed use high density, um, which is 10 units to 55 dwelling units per acre. So it has that same upper limit as the visitor commercial, except that this one anticipates that residential uses will always be included. And is it only these um, new land use designations that need to be um, wedded with the zoning? There's, there is another, uh, any other designations that we made in the general plan update that don't, aren't correlating right now? Is it primarily this, this focus? So in terms of what's on the maps and the land use designations that literally aren't implemented by our zoning, this, this is the, the extent of it. One. There are other policies in here mm -hmm. that um, require us to make certain changes to our zoning code that also haven't been implemented, um, but they're not, they're not things that you would map in the same way. It's not a land use designation that doesn't have a zoning code. And I guess the, um, just one other clarification, I think um, for a bit of history in terms of the timing, I just happened to kind of go back and kind of look through a little bit of the history around our general plan. And it's always good to look at what the state policy was looking at when you make these major revisions, I think. Um, so there's two significant laws that were passed right, um, right during the, right before we started our planning or general planning process. One is the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006 otherwise known as AB 32. That was a pioneering law by the state of California that basically set this entire state of California off on the path of mixed use development, walkable communities, reducing our time in our cars. And that was really a fundamental um, piece of legislation that then sort of found its way into our local planning. The other is the Sustainable Communities and Climate Protection Act of 2008 otherwise known as SP 375. And that's where we really started to look you know, at the transportation and the regional transportation aspect, housing, and then development. And I don't think that we can think about where we're, we may head without really understanding where we came from. And those two pieces of legislation, <coughs> uh, nationally, even worldwide, are looked at um, around the globe as significant pieces where California made the step to really determine that we would become a more walkable uh, community. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I think that that's some good context to put in. And um, uh, I thank you for all your work and reaching back out to folks. Um, and I'll just end there for now. Vice Mayor Cummings. Could you all speak to, I mean, just looking at this map and just thinking about, you know, how we have been discussing equity so much all the high density development is on the east side, mm -hmm. and all of the mixed use is on the east side. The mixed use visitor commercial is on the east side as well, and it looks like that runs down Ocean Street, mm -hmm. the Ocean Street corridor. Yes. But can you speak at all to the fact that there's no, that there's just such a strong disparity between the high use dense housing versus medium, and how it's split 
you know, between the east side and the west side, because that seems like if we're discussing equity, that's not very equally distributed. Sure. So, um, so what, what you're not seeing on this map is existing housing and existing development. And so um, the development, so it, we're not showing the density that's already included downtown, right, which is west of the river, um, which is not an insignificant amount of density. Um, so that just as a piece of context, I, I haven't done the analysis to look at like how is our housing density currently distributed east to west. I, I honestly can't answer that question today. Um, what I will say is that you know as a planner looking at these maps as you know coming in late to the process, um, when I look at the parcel sizes that are available um, along Soquel, and I look at the parcel sizes that are available along Mission Street. I would have a hard time arguing that given those existing parcels that you could have a site where it would be appropriate to allow the amount of density that's envisioned in that mixed use high density on a small site that's gonna create some kind of really narrow, really tall building or it's gonna require a lot of site consolidation. Um, secondly, the other, the other piece that I'll add is that the mixed use visitor accommodation is envisioned as part of the Ocean Street plan, which was, a, which is an area plan, the Ocean Street area plan, OSAP is the acronym we use for that, um, which was a pretty extensive effort with that neighborhood along Ocean Street to plan for um, commercial uses along there and specifically for visitor accommodations because that's our main route in off the highway, you know, and connecting to the boardwalk. So there is, um, there are a lot of sites that are already hotels and are and are sized appropriately to be hotels and to be visitor accommodations already in that corridor. And given how wide the street width, because the other thing to consider here is the street widths. So yes, Mission Street is a state highway. It's the narrowest of the three corridors if you measure curb to curb. So building heights have a different effect on a narrow street versus a wider street. So that's the orange that you see along Ocean Street is really called for in that Ocean Street area plan, which um, was an effort with that area, with that neighborhood that is on both sides of Ocean Street. So I mean, so those are, those are my observations as a planner. I wasn't involved in the decision making that came to this. What I can tell you is that it, was a, it involved a lot of community outreach and a lot of effort. And, um, and this is the maps that were written and created as a result of that, of all of the policy language that's included, so. Let's go to the director about there may be wanting to respond to this as well. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, in addition to the parcel sizes and the street widths, those were certainly considerations and very important ones um, that dictate where building sizes can actually fit and the implications for the, the feeling of the street. Um, we have done some analysis because we, we heard that um, loud and clear about you know east side versus west side. And so I can forward the council um, this information because I'm gonna uh, give you a fair amount of information right now. But um, in our general plan, the development capacity on the west side of the San Lorenzo is uh, 17, over 1,700 dwelling units. Um, on the east side, it's about 1,480 dwelling units. Now, if you take the downtown out of those calculations, the number of west side residential units drops to approximately 1,100 units. And um, in early um, 2018, there was a project that was approved on Delaware Avenue for um, 248 residential units that weren't anticipated by the general plan. So that gets it up to around 1,400 um, dwelling units outside of the downtown on the west side, which um, is comparable to the 1,480 on the east side of the river. That's just one piece of the puzzle. When you look at um, commercial square footage on the west side of San Lorenzo, roughly 100,000 square feet more office, um, the east side actually is planned for roughly 100,000 square feet more. And then back on the west side again, um, the industrial square footage on the west side is planned for 357,000, whereas the east side is only uh, 25,000. And we've actually entitled um, 400,000 square feet on that same Delaware project that I mentioned earlier on the west side. So 
it's it's not as simple as looking at the map right here and saying that, um, oh, there are more colors on the right side and higher densities on the, the right side, which would be the east side in this uh, photo. Um, and so uh, there there is a lot of complexities to it, and I just wanted to, to raise that, but um, the comments by Sarah are absolutely correct. Just the configuration of the lots oftentimes dictates the, the development capacity that can be accommodated on them. Other questions? Thank you for that explanation. The one other question I have, so do these colors then represent properties that have where the property owners are interested in developing these types of units or is it just that these are potential sites for development in the future just trying to better understand yeah you know, because it's, it seems like there's specific properties that have been identified right this, so okay so um Looking, at, so it might be actually be more useful to look at this general plan map, and it's like messy, so it's a little bit hard to really drill down here. So this map represents as we're planning for the future. So as we were doing this analysis, you know, in like 2010 with the community, where are we going to focus development potential between 2010 and 2030? And th this is how we are going to focus our various land uses. Um, this has, I don't wanna say it has no bearing on what the landowners wanna do, but that is not a primary driver of developing the policies that guide these maps. So the parcels that are identified and redesignated are not redesignated based on any expressed interest from the property owners. I don't even, we don't even know the property ownership status of a lot of them. Um, you know, some of the things that you see here that are missing, you know, this big empty space here along Ocean, this is the county building. So that's why it's not shown as visitor commercial because that's not going to get redesignated. So that's why it's left out of the map. Um, there are there are a couple of big existing. You know, this is where you know Rite Aid and um, Whole Foods are. So they're already really heavily commercial and weren't envisioned to change at least during this you know sort of 2010-ish time period through 2030. So um, the places that are redesignated um, here are. These are, it's based on um, a variety of things, as I've said, community values, and then looking at places where development is likely to happen based on how old the existing buildings are and how they're currently utilized. So there's some analysis done about the value that's already, are there properties that are sort of underutilized relative to like the current market? And typically, um, as general plans are designated, you would try to focus your redesignations on those areas that are likely to develop so that as new development happens, you're getting the vision that you've articulated, that your community has really um, rallied around. So that's sort of a little more background on that. Did I fully answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Ibram, question? Yeah, thank you for the presentation and the laying out of options. It's helpful to be refreshed on the history. Um, I did wanna ask, this is a question that kind of just is based upon some of the feedback that you summarized in the agenda report that we received um, related to the focus group. Um, and so in particular with respect to, um, you know, what staff, what should current staff know about the previous process and elements of the previous effort that worked? versus non-starters. The first sentence says, in response, participants mentioned that in many ways the previous effort felt predetermined, as if staff and consultants had made many decisions in advance of discussing the topic with the public. So that sense of non-inclusion, I think needs to be, that's the reason that I um, brought this back to the agenda, to ensure that there was more of an opportunity for the public to be involved, and in particular, neighbors. So I get neighbors on the east side, those who would be most affected. So not the developers who are looking at it and are smart mm -hmm. about you know how how to make this work, and um, but the people who will be most impacted. So um, 
I guess I'm making a comment here, but really I just wanted to ask a question based upon your, since you were not involved in that um, previous process, you know, if you've thought at all about how you intend to proceed to try to avoid that in whatever outreach is done based upon whatever option we, which way we choose to go. Is there any kind of reaction to that? Sure, yeah, no, that's definitely something we've been talking about in terms of, um, you know, really starting with why we're doing this effort. Um, because I, and, and not to cast any aspersions on my predecessors, um, you know, I, from everything I've seen, they did a really fantastic staff work. And I think that there's always room for improvement around helping the community understand our processes and understand that, you know, we did this general plan for seven years and we had a hundred community wide meetings and we had really broad participation and we and we, we are trying to address climate change. We are trying to address our community green belt. We're trying to address commute pressures. We're trying to address a growing student population. We're trying to address affordable housing and mobility and economic growth. We're trying to address all of those things. And this is one little piece of, of that broader vision. Um, and these are the maps that have that were adopted. And so we are gonna start, typically we would anticipate, this is you know, general plan 2030, here we are, it's practically 2020. Typically you would start about five years before um, your general plan is scheduled to like expire, um, quote unquote, to you know, restart that process and create a new vision and we will have that opportunity in five years and in the meantime, what, without a zoning code, we, all we have is uncertainty. Um, so we are obligated to allow the level of development capacity that's envisioned by this general plan. The only parameters that are set in the general plan are a floor area ratio and a residential density. So it doesn't make any comment on like the ratio between residential development and commercial development. These are commercial areas. We wanna make sure we have commercial development that's still viable in these places. Um, we wanna talk about design standards, right? So that as these as buildings are built, some handful of these buildings will might get developed in the next five years, 10 years. Um, we wanna have some certainty around how those are gonna fit into the existing context. There's gonna be a fair amount of conversation, discussion, education, both in both directions um, with the community around this. It's that's definitely something that we're talking about. We wanna make sure we understand the whole scope of concerns and we wanna make sure we understand the whole scope of you know, the reality of the restraints that we're working within um, so that we can have a really informed and productive process with the community because I, yeah, that is definitely on our radar. Yeah, and I'd like to add, you know, we've talked a little bit about internally what happened with the last process, you know, with us not being here, we, we didn't know. And um, I think at least what I've settled on is that from a planning perspective, the zoning ordinance update was simply an implementation of the general plan, which had gone through an extensive public outreach process. So I can completely understand where the community, where these changes were happening might feel that they weren't heard. And I can completely understand where the planners at the time thought that they were simply implementing what was already in the document. And there was a disconnect there in terms of um, where we were at in the process. And so I think the education piece is critically important, making sure that we're all on the same page, which was part of why we wanted to do this um, preliminary kind of overview at the beginning. Here's the guiding document, here's the vision, here's the principles, we're working to implement that. Um, and making sure now that the state has said, you have to do these, uh, you know, if you want any control basically over your built form of housing, you have to implement objective standards, making sure that as we're developing those, we are working very closely with the community to make sure that we're talking about the colors, the setbacks, the materials, all of the things that they're gonna wanna see for their neighborhood. And so if the council does choose option one to move forward with, we would um, open up an extensive process with the community and whoever, whatever consultant we were to hire to help us with that to make sure that um, we are implementing what the community vision is, but helping them understand where it's coming from. And, and well, just one quick follow-up question mm -hmm. related to the 
uh, development of objective standards, I mean, isn't that something that, it, and I'm gonna support it when it comes before us at the next agenda item, um, that we'll want to do for the city writ large, and so it's not really specifically about this, the corridors or the, the, that area of town, but. Right, uh, so. Objective standards uh, review and establishment will happen kind of independently of this process anyway. Yes, so um, the grant funding for the SB2 grant, which is the next item that you'll hear, hear about shortly, that's specific for creating um, objective standards for housing related projects. And so what we would be proposing is um, anything that is a higher <coughs> density than a single family home um, would be what we would be looking at in terms of creating objective standards for. So you're talking about lots of sections of Seabright where you're seeing areas that are zoned as R RL, I believe, um, any of this kind of orangish color with a primary Primary focus, obviously, most immediately on the corridor, on you know the corridors areas, to use lack of a better term, uh, and then also uh, focusing secondarily on uh, the higher density residential, because those are the areas that we're going to um, very likely see the most development on in the near future. I have one last question. So. Uh, is there a meeting sketch? I know Save Santa Cruz was not, um, did not participate in mm -hmm. the meet, the last meeting that you had, the focus group. Right. Um, and I know that their concern was related to wanting to um, wait until the, see, to see the outcome of SB 330. So is that, is something happening now or is yes. there a meeting scheduled? We have a, we have a second focus group scheduled for Monday the 28th. So we'll be meeting with save, representatives of Save Santa Cruz as well as several other community reps. Question? Um, is, uh, would they be the same community reps that are on this page, uh, 12.9? Uh, I, I believe what you have there are the reps that attended the previous right. focus group. So we're, in, we're inviting new people. Oh, could you tell us who they are or what groups they're from? Um, sure, so we're, we're again inviting two representatives from the um, uh, Corridors Advisory Commission. We're inviting um, a represent another representative of a different um, transportation organization. We're inviting another affordable housing developer. We've invited a business owner to this meeting. And in addition to Save Santa Cruz, we've invited another group of neighbors from the east side. Who's the transportation? Where, what? Um, eco ecology Action, who invited a representative from them. And um, are you asking us today uh, in pursuing option one, you're, you're saying this council is going to um, uh, approve 300 to $450,000, is that what you're asking? So the funding would be approved with the next item. Um, we're, this is a, this is an estimate, so we haven't done the whole scoping of exactly the contents of the item. So we, we would have a, a firmer budget when we come back to with a RFP to release to you know solicit a consultant. We would have a really specific budget, but it is tied together. Um, you know the the budget would be in that range, and um, the next item on your agenda with the SB two grant would address at least a significant portion of that. Fund. Right, so with the next item, um, we'd be suggesting, or staff is recommending, that um, you, via motion, uh, direct us to apply for an SB2 grant for the objective standards in the amount of $310,000. That's the max we can get for our community uh, based on our size. And then um, any delta between that and what the final cost would be um, would come from the long range planning, advanced planning team budget. And if we found that we needed more than what we have in our budget, we would come back at that time with a mid-year budget request uh, adjustment. And um, I, I'm still not understanding why not pursue the other uh, option two over option one. What, what's the? Uh, so at your council's discretion, we could launch into an amendment of the general plan. Um, you know, part, part of what we're responding to is the direction that really wanted this done by November of 2020. So, um, you know, the timing and cost of that effort to update the general plan would be really significantly different. So that's, that's the um, balance that your council is going to need to strike. Did you run this by the group that you met with that this is what you were gonna, you were planning on doing? Uh, no, we didn't, we didn't discuss um, our, our recommendations with the focus group. 
we wouldn't have had them yet because part of the recommendation came from the conversation that we had with the group. And right. then we take that information back, we synthesize it, we compare notes, and then uh, move forward with coming forward with a recommendation for your council. Does it say in the rec in what was the council passed uh, something about the general plan amendment? Um, what the motions, the motion does not explicitly say that changes must be made to either document, but it suggests that changes could be made to either or both documents, the general plan or the zoning ordinance. Could you point that out, which one it is? I, I'm not finding it. There was, there was five things. I, I think it's, is, is, it, is the motion in the background, number three? Direct planning director is first to carry out direct discretion uh, to meet promptly with representatives and other communities terminated uh, agreement on possible changes to the general plan and zoning ordinance. Yes. Um, but you're choosing not to do that. What we are recommending is that we make changes to the zoning ordinance um, to implement the vision in our general plan. Given the context of SB 330, um, that seems like the responsible way to spend our time, effort, and money. That said, um, and, and we wanted to be responsive to the, uh, one of the other pieces of direction, I don't have it in front of me, but which, which was to come back to this meeting with policy uh, recommendations. Mm -hmm. And so since we didn't have an opportunity to meet with Save Santa Cruz um, to share um, any additional thoughts before this meeting, we're coming back with a recommendation as requested. Um, and if this council would uh, like us to go back and consult with the two groups again uh, it, before your decision, that is entirely your prerogative. Um, but we were working to um, address competing pieces of the direction as requested by this meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah, just last thing I'll say is, um, do you, or actually it's a question, um, do you have to have this motion passed before applying for the SB2 uh, grant? I don't think so, no. Because that's what I would, you know, okay. Because I would prefer to get more input from those two groups, but. Any other questions before we open it up to public comment? Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment for any member of the community wanting to address us on this item and you'll have up to two minutes. Good afternoon, my name is Aldo Giacchino. I'm one of the members of the executive committee of um, Save Santa Cruz. And um, we first of all want to thank you for your action on August 27th um, to terminate the corridors plan and do no further work on this project, to quote from your action. Um, and also um, the fact we want to thank you for setting out the objectives of what the further work should be, which are to preserve and protect residential neighborhood areas and existing city businesses. That's priority number one. And priority number two is to encourage appropriate enhanced affordable housing. So we are very pleased with that. And we were a little shocked to, to read in the otherwise acceptable staff report, the recommendation to set into concrete a particular option. That's what brought us to the barricades in the first time. We don't want to go and fight people who have made up their minds already. The purpose of this community involvement effort is to discuss things first and come to conclusions later, not to conclude first. And so we strongly recommend you that you do not adopt the proposed um, option suggested by the staff or any options at this time. It's way too early. We are uh, committed to working very hard on this. Well, we have appointed um, six members from the executive, executive committee of Save Santa Cruz. They are people with a wealth of experience, talent, and ingenuity. And, um, and we are committed to do this in an expeditious manner. We have a meeting scheduled with the staff for um, October, for next uh, Monday, October 28th. The oh, your time is up. Are there any other members of the community who would like to address the council on this item? Seeing them, we'll go ahead and return it back to council. I actually have one question. Um, with, the, with the two options, option two is a 
re is recommended to be two to four years. And then you suggested that within five years, we'll begin the planning efforts around the next general plan amendment. So in the interim time, there would not be any changes to the, uh, clearly not any changes to the zoning or, or, or any changes whatsoever because of the, the state legislation, but there wouldn't be any changes to the objective design standards either. Is that correct? Unless council would like us to undertake two projects. Um, the option two, we would still need, if, the city, if our council wants to have, retain any control over what the built form will look like on residential properties moving forward, we're going to, you're going to want to direct us to create objective standards. Um, it will, it, the time is of the essence with that essentially, because as of the beginning of next calendar year, w unless we have something in place, any project that comes through, they only have to meet what we already have in place. Right, which which is pretty limited. So the, very the, limited. The objective standards that we have in in place um, for these mixed use designated parcels are: we have a floor area ratio and we have a residential density. We don't have a height limit. We don't have setback standards. We don't have any design criteria. No colors. No articulations. No materials. Those are all the types of things that. If we, we will have no more discretion as a, as a jurisdiction unless we have them in writing in our code. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Cronin and then Councilmember Myers and then Brown and then Matthew. That was, that was, that Cynthia was before me. Yeah, that, that was my sense too of uh, what uh, Mr. Giacchino said. I thought we're, you know, it was, it was a good staff report, but I think we're moving in a direction that is away from getting public input. So I would make the motion of accepting the monthly report of the general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort and to reconvene both zoning reconciliation focus groups and share this uh, uh, materials with them and get you know, input from the group and return uh, next month to the council. Mm. Okay, we have a motion by council member Crone. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Okay, Councilmember Matthews, Myers, then Brown. I'm gonna speak forcefully against that. We've heard that time is of the essence on this. Um, the, uh, and the staff explained to us the uh, history of uh, how, uh, of our general plan development, which had a great deal of community input. I pro I'm probably the only one around it remembers that and you know one of the difficulties of long complicated processes is um, people move on and forget the the chain but um, when you look at that general plan development and the degree of uh, the diversity of participants on the general plan committee the incredible number of community outreach um, uh, uh, processes that were in place that led up to that consensus, unanimous adoption by the council at the time. Certainly the economic uh, um, recession uh, hit us big time, but then there were also, as council member Myers mentioned, uh, uh, state legislation uh, with increasing awareness of um, climate change, uh, climate impact, and the, the real trend to uh, housing uh, the need to provide housing, and here we have the state legislation just going into effect. Underlying all of this is, I think, the, uh, the concern about what our community looks like and feels like. To my mind, there, there is such a need and uh, imperative to deal with housing. Mixed use projects are the wave of the future. But the one thing that we won't have if we don't act on option one is, is really any meaningful impact of uh, direction on design, community design, and that is what's so important to the community. So I would much prefer that we give staff direction to pursue option one, apply for the amount of funding that could reasonably cover the costs of doing the um, objective standards. Without those, we are just gonna have to take what comes at us and we're not necessarily <coughs> gonna like it. So I'd much prefer to have the, the effort go in the, in the short term to the objective standards that give us the uh, meaningful community input, corridors throughout the city. What do we want our development projects to look like? There's nothing 
that forces any owner of a small parcel to do anything with it. If they're happy with their their structure, their their use on that parcel, they can continue that as long as they want. But we do need a map that reflects community standards on what it looks like. And I think that will get us the kind of protection we want for um, our our neighborhoods and also give us the kind of vitality along the, the commercial corridors that we've talked about. So I, I really think it's a mistake. And, and particularly the idea that this would only go back to a very small number of people when so much of what, what led to this point and so much of what the community imperative is, is to really act on housing and act on community design. Councilmember Myers, then Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I'm struggling with the motion as well. Um, I just have a question about the objective standards process. So I'm assuming um, that would be an extensive process uh, with the community, correct? Yes. So we would be hosting workshops, um, making sure that people were understanding both um, uh, from a from a perspective of what, you know, what could be done on their property currently, but also, you know, the aesthetics, all the things that come along with that. So it, it's a little bit of a dry term, but um, it sounds like basically one of the things that I know was in the corridors um, work was a, a design review process, which I think has been something um, or along those lines, but, you know, being able to participate as a community in, in, understanding what things are going to look like once they've been designed. And so this objective standard sort of gets us to that to some extent. It's not going to get us um, to the detail level, but it will give us a lot more uh, availability for people to become involved in, in any proposal that might be in their neighborhood. Whereas right now we really only have two standards and that's the floor error ratio and um, the density, is that correct? So Right, so what this essentially would be, would be, so we would first off um, recommend that the, we utilize the funding to bring on a expert in developing these type of objective standards. Um, we would work with them, uh, Sarah would manage them uh, from the AP team. Um, we would then do a series of, you know, once they've developed some some concepts and some ideas for us to kind of flesh out with the community, um, or. or I, you know, let me not speak to how the consultant will do their work, but we will work very closely with the community to develop those. And essentially that will be the, that design review because once those are in place, that's essentially the design review. So it wouldn't be an ongoing design review board, but it would be the chance for the opportunity over the next 13 or so, or the community over the next 13 or so months to codify what that design expectation is for the community, which could be amended in the future. But that essentially every project that came in then would be beholden to those colors, materials, setbacks, fenestrations, articulations, glazing, whatever it is that the community wants to codify in terms of those standards for every building that comes in in those particular zones. So I would just um, request my colleagues that made the motion to um, to reconsider, to, to really look at the importance of my understanding in, in some of the, um, some of the uh, problems with the corridor was that people had felt they had lost their voice and really understanding what something would look like once it was in their neighborhood. And so my understanding of what you're describing, and I assume architects and other folks who do this kind of design, urban designers, people like that would be part of this, this group that you would hire. So, um, I mean, I think this is an important step towards what I understood from many community members um, uh, that that I think we can we can do right now, um, and uh, I just I would request that we I, I can't support the motion because um, at this point I feel like this is a very important step. We have um, a grant deadline, I believe, um, and we have funding that could offset that cost um, at savings to the city, and I just I uh, I, I hope my colleagues would reconsider and, and try to work on this together. Actually, we have Vice Mayor Cummings, then I'll go to you. I thought I was next. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Council Member Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Then Cummings. Yeah, I have a follow-up clarifying question. Um, I'm hearing conflicting time frames here because I'm hearing that these objective standards would need to be in place by January 1st of next year, but I'm also hearing a 13-month 
time period um, pending a grant application. And so I'm a little bit confused about how if we don't do this today, we're gonna miss a deadline that we're gonna miss anyway because we're going down this road for a longer process. Yeah, very good question. Um, I had the same question when I read the SB2 grant um, staff report. So. Um, so what the, what, us, what the Housing Crisis Act of 2019 says is that starting on January 1st, 2020, if we don't have, whatever objective design criteria we have are the only criteria we can apply to housing projects. So, you know, some places that's height and setbacks and parking ratio um, for these mixed use areas, it's, you know, a development density and then a floor area ratio. And that's sort of all that it is. Um, for any given project, when they apply, the objective standards that apply to that project are whatever standards are in place in the code at the time that they submit their preliminary application. So you are correct, during the duration of time that it takes us to complete this process, we won't have any objective design criteria. As soon as it's done, we will have objective design criteria in place, and then anything that comes in after that will be subject to those criteria. So it's not, there's no way to have those in place by January 1. Um, it will take some time. It deserves to be some kind of a community process um, with a lot of involvement. And there will be, you know, we will work as expeditiously, as expeditiously as possible with the consultant team. And we wanna make sure we have really good community engagement and that we engage with the people who, you know, live here, use these places, work here, um, all that everyone kind of gets to participate in that. So. Yeah, and I think the reality is anytime the state changes the laws, um, there is a um, growing period, <laughs> growing pains, right? Because um, the, often it's a very quick turnaround, right? And um, I mean, even just to do something like the ADU ordinance, it's, um, which is pretty clear in terms of what the changes are, is something that we are gonna be getting in by the skin of our teeth just because of the process that it takes, first reading, second planning commission, first reading, second reading, right? So the reality is it's unavoidable that there may be some projects that um, get in before we're done. And we should not let that deter us from acting with all due haste because the sooner we get started on this, the sooner we'll have them in place, which will then be the sooner that the community will be able to regain control over the built form. Um, I had a follow-up question and I just lost it. Um, oh, uh, so, and the, with respect to uh, what I heard something about of a concern about this potentially impacting our ability to get funding, but I also, I think I heard you say that that's not the case, that this, that if we do not make this decision today, if we wait for two weeks or until after, or in whenever, at soon after uh, community groups have weighed in, um, will we be in danger of losing the potential for funding? So the grant funding is due next month, or the application is due next month. Um, there is, if we, if the expectation is that um, we meet with the groups, and we report back at the next council meeting, um, and then submit the grant, that leaves very little time for the grant writing. I don't know if this council is aware, but this is my last month with the city. Um, I am leaving, I've accepted a position as the planning director with the town of Hills, Hillsboro, California. So, um, thank you. <laughs> so, um, in terms of resources, just when we're talking just practically, um, there may not be a body to write that. My goal was to get the grant done and submitted before I left. Um, now, you do not necessarily have to apply for the grant, and that is entirely up to the council if that is not something that you want to apply for. Um, but the reality is is that to meet with the, the group, to be able to get a staff report together, to come back, to have this council make a decision and get a grant application in is a almost impossible feat. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Yes. Because my, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get to understand is if you are precluded from developing a grant proposal for objective design standards for the city without the decision, making the decision about specifically the corridors and how to proceed with the corridors today. I don't think so, no. The way the grant application is worded that it would apply to all um, you know, housing projects. So thank you. Yeah, you could do that, you could do that without that. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Cummings. 
for clarification, what is the timeline around around the um, creating the objective standards? So, like around a year, little probably a little bit over a year. Honestly, we, if we were if we were in contract right away, yeah, our aim is to meet the November twenty twenty. Um, expected timeline that was in the motion. That would be the goal. Um, now we that would be a little bit of a reach. Oh yeah, definitely is going to be a reach and we wouldn't be able to commit to that until we, you know, to an actual date until we have con confirmation that we've received the grant number one and number two that we have um, somebody under contract because they're going to really tell us given what we want them to do, what a reasonable timeline is, but we would really push to have it done in 12 to 13 months. And would these objective standards come back to council for a final approval? Yes, yes, they would be an amendment to our zoning ordinance, which is a legislative action. So they would receive a recommendation from the planning commission and then come to your council for final adoption. So if I understand correctly, there's an opportunity to meet with, for example, Save Santa Cruz, some of these other groups who haven't had a chance to weigh in. They can then weigh in during that process. And then the final recommendations are gonna come back to us next year sometime. Assuming that council has directed us to go ahead and pursue the SB2 grant for the objective design standards. Yeah. And, and just to answer your other question about process, I mean, this, the community would be involved. We wouldn't be limiting ourselves okay. to groups who yeah. were involved with the prior effort, which currently for our focus groups, we've been limiting our scope to just people who were involved that we've been able to find correspondence mm -hmm. in the record, right? So. Um, I think there are a lot of people that are really interested. I get you know, an email every other week or so from someone who wants to be involved, but mm -hmm. they weren't involved previously, and so I have not included them as of yet. I think there are a lot of groups that weren't maybe represented in the prior effort that would wanna be involved, deserve to be involved, and so yes, there would be a broad community outreach. Safe Santa Cruz, would, I would assume, have, be heavily involved. We would certainly reach out to them among other um, constituents to be participants in this process and and really guide it. You know, what are the important features that we want to address in here and what are the objective standards that are the most important to codify? And to be clear, um, should the council direct staff to pursue option one, that doesn't preclude the city council from moving forward on other options related to the corridors, not corridors, our, our re reconciliation, right? However, what this does is it sets in motion the ability to start to provide certainty for the community in terms of the built form as quickly as possible. And then if I heard correctly earlier, you all are meeting with Save Santa Cruz and some other folks on the 28th? Yes, on Monday. We have a, a second focus group pulled together, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna withdraw my second, so. Okay. Um, Council Member Cohn? Um, it, so, it sounds to me that she can do the grant. She can start the grant. She doesn't have to wait till after that meeting. Like I, I don't believe. Right? Is that is that true? That you is can, correct. If start. I get the direct, if we get the direction from council. And all we're look. I mean, I would like these groups to input into this process they're talking about, and I don't feel like they're given that have had that chance to do that. And that's that's why I'm thinking that this is the motion to go forward with, and then come back to um, the council at our next meeting. I'll okay. second it to so we can continue this conversation I'll because I'm quite interested then. in. You want to call the question? Okay, so we have a mm -hmm. second by Councilmember Brown, withdrawal by Vice Mayor Cummings. A call the question motion by Councilmember Matthews. Is there a second to the call the question? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Myers. A vote to call the question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. No. That passes with Councilmember uh, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Myers, and myself. All those in favor of the motion on the floor. The motion on the floor is uh, the original motion by Councilmember Crone, now seconded by Councilmember Brown. Can I get a restatement of that? Do you want to restate your motion? Or do you want to state the motion that you have in the record? But I captured, if not the. Okay. Would that be more? Um, my motion is to accept the monthly report on the general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort. Uh, and to reconvene both zoning reconciliation focus groups and uh, share the information that the materials that we have before us with those groups and return to council with the report back uh, next month. And I might add also just uh, that it doesn't mean that we can't pursue the grant that is our next item um, in the meantime. Okay, so all those in favor I, of the motion? No, we can't discuss the motion is my understanding. Is that correct? 
That's correct. There's been a motion uh, call adopted the to call the question. Okay, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. That fails with Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Councilmember Myers voting um, against, and Councilmember Crone, Glover, and Brown voting for. Okay, well, that moves us on then to the next no, item. I have no, another motion. motion. No, no motion. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We have the next motion. Sorry. Still waiting for direction. <laughs> okay, forgive me. Okay, forgive me. Okay, Councilmember um, Matthews, and then. I'm, I'm not. Yes. Um, um, I'd like to move that we accept the monthly report on the general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort. And given the uh, imperatives of uh, time and um, cost that we direct staff to uh, move forward with the uh, option one, which is establishing mixed use zoning districts concurrently with development of objective design standards for housing projects. We have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilmember Myers. And Council I Council will Council. add to that that they uh, fully in, engage the um, focus groups currently established and in, embark on a very broad public outreach process. Accept those. Question. May I ask one clarifying question? So as we had met with these, as we'd had these meetings, we had not envisioned that we were creating a group. Right. Like at right. this point, we were just intending them to be focus groups to sort of like right. initiate this process. And I'm hearing some kind of conflicting direction about what the role of those folks we've already invited is meant to be. No? Mm -mm. Uh, I, my, uh, well, do you want to say? I, I'd like to speak to that. There's a meeting already set up apparently. Honor that meeting. But um, I think this defines the direction of the council, and we understand that the entire uh, design standard process, objective design standard process, would be a very broad process into the future. Okay. So does Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Brown? My, my understanding from that is that that somewhat will, will cover what I feel that Councilmember Crone was trying to get across, mm -hmm. which is taking what's been recommended in this report, going mm -hmm. to, the, to the groups, having discussions with them because ultimately my sense is that some folks felt like during the first process, their, what they were hoping would come out of these design standards within that corridor plan was absent. And this is an opportunity for those groups to be able to weigh in at this meeting, to continue to weigh in, and then for other groups within the community to weigh in so that we can get these objective standards as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Okay, Councilmember Brown. So I just want to remind my colleagues that the original motion was not to conduct focus groups. I've kind of accepted that that is the direction that staff went. The, the motion was to meet with these representatives to discuss um, how to proceed with um, reconciling the general plan with the zoning. And that is not what's happening. Um, and so I'm, I'm concerned, I'm disappointed that we are now in a situation where we will vote to move ahead with something that we're already gonna vote to move ahead on at the next agenda item um, without um, hearing from the folks who we, in the original motion, suggested we'd like to hear more from and they wanted to be involved in. So it, I'm just gonna say I'm disappointed with that. My understanding is that that is what's gonna happen, is yeah. that there will be okay. meetings with these groups. And many. And many more. Uh, Councilman Burkham? But uh, in the motions, are we always, are we you're saying option one is what you're gonna pursue? Yes. But, but, but why, why do that? What, maybe option two is better. And that's, the, I don't think that our focus groups or our, our people who are on these committees had gotten this information. I would love to hear from them before we go out and spend money, which is the better uh, way to go. And maybe they have an option three. Okay. And, and we heard from Save Santa Cruz was here and said, you know, don't do this. This is what I heard um, the, man, the person from the executive committee say. Okay. This yeah, is. if I may address that. Um, to Council Member Brown's point, um, we did everything we could to encourage Save Santa Cruz to attend the first meeting. They opted not to attend. That was their choice. That was their prerogative. Also, since the making of the motion, state law has changed significantly. There are new elements, new, in, there's new information that we have to be responsive to. Again, option one does not preclude us from meeting with the Save Santa Cruz group, 
it does not preclude us from continuing to meet with other groups. Uh, if new information comes to light, that does not preclude council from reassessing their approach and taking a different tact. That said, at this point, the most expeditious point moving forward is to apply for the grant funds and move forward with the development of these objective standards. If we do not act with haste, the city will end up in a situation where we have no control over the built form and frankly, from my previous experience in other jurisdictions, buildings will be value engineered to the ground. You will, you will not enjoy the built form. I would strongly encourage as your advisor to please move forward with directing staff to develop the objective standards. We will meet with the community. We will continue to have conversations with them and the council can then, we, can, we will, we, we're reporting back on a monthly basis on the conversations and on the progress. At any time, council can modify that direction. But today, time is of the essence. It is imperative that we move forward on the objective standards. Well, I follow your logic, so, okay. All the, um, I'm just trying to understand how are we moving forward on the, on the objective standards. You, you apply for a grant, you meet with a couple con, uh, groups again, you share the information, see if they have anything to input on to, into this process. And then it comes back to the council on November 12th. Yeah, well, not November 12th. We will not be able to be back November 12th. We're planning on coming back on the 26th uh, for our next report, for our next monthly report. Sure. So yes, we will be meeting with those groups. However, we need to go ahead and apply for this grant. That's and fine. That, that is fine, applying for the grant. It, I, I support, totally support that. Okay, so so let me, if I could, I'm sorry, I, I, my, I apologize my, for my density here. I want to make sure that we're being responsive to direction and I feel like um, feelings in the room are indicating to me that we haven't followed direction. So I want to be absolutely crystal clear on this. So when you say in the motion that you want us to meet with groups, local groups, I took that to be like a one-off meeting. Were you intending for that to be more of a committee? That we would establish a committee group of some kind that we would meet with repeatedly? I just... No, the intention was to meet with, say, Santa Cruz and other neighborhood groups. Right. To, uh, my understanding is many of the folks who came to the last meeting were not East Side neighbors, but I'm gonna let that go to meet with Save Santa Cruz and other neighborhood groups to discuss these changes. If that took more than one meeting, then it mm -hmm. could take more than one meeting. The intention okay. was not to set up a committee, an ongoing committee of any sort. I see. And I believe Vice Mayor Cummings wanted to speak to I that. think so. it is that there's already a meeting set up to meet with them. The, for, like, and one just, meeting. If it turns out there's a need for more, which I would expect that throughout designing this entire process, there's gonna be, as I've heard you all mention, meetings with a lot of other community groups to understand you know, what do they want within the community. Right. And the other thing that I heard from this is that there's two options. One's a general plan, one's um, creating these objective standards to make adjustments to the general plan that's gonna take a lot longer right. in terms of being able to get these objective standards. And if it's two to four years, for example, then any, um, any developments that come in during that time, they'll only have to meet our minimum objective standards which have been adopted by the city. Right. So currently, what we're trying to do is get some objective standards input from the community groups so that as developments come on board, that we have some control over what those standards are gonna be. And then if from these meetings that you all have with the community, it turns out there's another direction we want to take, we can change course at that time. Absolutely. But currently we need to get some objective standards because the Absolutely. ones we have currently are minimum. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, think that, Glover. I, I just want to say to my colleagues that, you know, one of the things that I heard when meeting with community groups during the campaign was the fact that there were certain developments that were coming in that did not meet any standards of what some of these community groups wanted. And as a result, there was a lot of pushback against what those developments were going to look like now with the passing of SB 30, which wasn't in place back then, when January 1st hits, some of these developments that may not have any look, feel, design that is compatible with those neighborhoods will be able to go forward until we get some objective standards put in place. And so if that is gonna, if we're gonna have to wait for a general plan amendment that might take multiple years, that means that's the, that time period when we won't have any control over the standards. So I really, you know, encourage the staff to engage with the neighbors so that we understand what their needs are and we can continue to meet those needs. But I think that the longer we wait on this, it's a concern because um, we just, that's more time that we don't have control. 
Okay, Councilor McLevern, and then Councilor Myers, and then Councilor McCrone. Thank you. I just have to make an observation right now about the tone of this conversation. It's really making me uncomfortable, um, especially in the back and forth between the staff and the council members. Uh, I believe that we're in the situation right now because of a failure initially, whether it be of the previous council or of staff or a combination of both, to do the robust outreach necessary to make sure that people in the community felt like their voices were taken into consideration. So while I can understand the frustration potentially felt by uh, certain members of the people up here, uh, you know, and it's weird, because I don't know, can I say members of staff? Because of the way that that energy is coming back here in response to the questions that are being asked. Also, Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Crone are obviously making it very clear that they have a interest and concern about the lack of community input and the steps take to get there. So I think that we should be able to have an open and honest, robust conversation of challenging each other, but not having this aggressive tone and hitting hands on the table, which we saw from some of the other colleagues up here the other day in a completely inappropriate outburst. So I really, I understand the importance of the uh, the community engagement, even in the, the list there. I mean, how many people of color are on that list in the community uh, outreach group that you participated in? I know a lot of the names on that list, and to my, my personal knowledge, I don't see very many, if any, people of color on that list with regards to the impact of having it on communities. So there is a severe lack of community engagement. There has been a severe lack of development of affordable housing, and uh, in my opinion, a lack of proactive movement towards uh, community engagement effectively. So. Um, I, you know, whichever direction the council goes, I just want to put it on the record that this exchange and interaction, I feel, was incredibly inappropriate. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and take the vote. Uh, we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by um, Councilmember Myers. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. No. So that passes with Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Myers voting in support. Crone, Glover, and Brown voting against. Okay, so that moves us right along then to our next item, which is SB2 State Planning Grant Application Item Number 13 in our General Business Agenda. And I believe you will present the item. Okay, based on the conversation we just had, I'm hopeful that this will be relatively quick. Uh, all right. Um, so uh, a little bit of background, in 2017, the Building Homes and Jobs Act, which is known as SB2, mandated a $75 recording fee on real estate documents, and that is to be a permanent source of funding to increase affordable housing stock in the state. So the planning plan, plan excuse me, planning grant program uh, indicates that 50% of the, that revenue that's collected in the first year is to be used for planning grants, and those are grants uh, intended to help jurisdictions update their policy documents to expedite, facilitate and expedite housing. Um, they are available on a non-competitive basis to eligible jurisdictions, and those are jurisdictions essentially that have been regularly reporting to HCD and have a housing element that uh, is current and um, basically they're meeting their HCD uh, objectives. Uh, we are one of those, so um, we uh, are encouraging council to direct us to apply. The funding amount is based on population, and uh, for the city of Santa Cruz, we're eligible for up to $310,000 in reimbursable grant funding. So the important thing to note is that it is reimbursable, um, so we would outlay the funds initially and then uh, recoup, I think, on a quarterly basis is generally for these type of grants when you report. Uh, and applications are due next month. So we have two options here for you. Um, the first is a expanded updates to the downtown plan. Um, the pros of this is that it's called for in the 2030 general plan to um, either or expand the downtown plan boundaries to up to um, River Street, up to Highway 1, uh, and or to incorporate Beach South of Laurel area into the downtown plan. Um, this could facilitate housing development, so it could be a potential win for this grant. Uh, the cons are that it's not one of the five priority policy areas in the grant. And so what those are in the grant are five types of applications that you could put in that are automatically going to be approved. Um, this does not fall into one of those. What that means is that it makes the grant uh, harder to write because we have to do justification of why we believe this meets the priority policy areas. Um, whereas something like the objective standards, which we'll discuss shortly, um, already qualify. That is listed as one of the five types of projects you can do that get automatically 
automatic approval. Um, Additionally, um, at, since it's not a PPA, um, the award would not be guaranteed. While they're non-competitive, they do have to meet those certain requirements of demonstrating that you're um, promoting and expediting housing development. Um, the other con is that unlike the objective standards, this project is not time sensitive. Option two that we're presenting to you, this is staff's recommended option. Um, oh. <laughs> that should not say that at the top. You can tell I cut and pasted a slide. Option two is a development of objective design standards. So please uh, forgive that error. Um, the pros are that um, development of these standards, as we discussed with the last item, allows city to retain some control in light of the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. Uh, it will provide certainty to the community on final design. And um, this particular application type is identified as a PPA, which means it will get automatic approval. The staff doesn't have to do any additional justification as to why we think it meets the standards. The state has already said, if you do objective design standards, you automatically get the grant. So I see no cons, staff sees no cons to this particular one. So the fiscal implications, um, the option one, my estimates based on previous experience with similar types of projects would be in the range of $250,000 to $500,000. Option two would be somewhere between three to 350 to $400,000. Um, so again, we would be required to provide the funding up front, be reimbursed, and if the, if the cost went above the 310, we would be responsible for um, providing the delta, but there is no match required for this grant, so that's another thing. The grant is amazing. It's, it's what they call over the counter, and as long as you have a current housing element, you've been reporting to HDD every year, and you're gonna be expediting housing, you, you have the money, so it's a really great opportunity. So the recommendation by staff is by motion to uh, direct us to submit an application to HCD for SB2 planning grant in support of option one, development of objective design standards. And you can tell I was doing this quickly because we have two ones. <laughs> Number two would be to adopt the authorizing resolution indicating council support for the SB2 planning grant application. And that is one of the things that is required by the grant is that council adopts an authorizing resolution um, supporting us uh, applying for the grant. So with that, I will uh, answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Questions? Could you go back to that last slide? Yes. Because option one was the expanded updates to the downtown plan, so I just want to be clear on what the Jiminy Christmas. Is. Yes, you can tell I literally put this together like half an hour before this meeting. Just, yes. Yeah, I was just double checking on that. Yeah. I am so sorry, guys. Option two, development of objective design standards. Yes. Any other questions? Any member of the community wanting to address the council on this item? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back for action and deliberation. Um, before we do, I just want to say, Sarah, you know, congratulations and thank you for your professionalism, your integrity, and your hard work on behalf of the city of Santa Cruz. I hope that um, Hillsboro um, knows how lucky they are, and I hope you're received by that community with respect and um, are able to do the good work that you've done here, there. Thank you. And your jacket is just awesome. <laughs> it's so awesome. Right? Thank so you. That had to be said. Oh. And I appreciate that. And I realized that I did get passionate on the last item. Um, it is something that is of great importance to me. And um, I felt that the time is now to be very candid and very direct. Uh, I can be very animated. And yes, I did pound on the table, but that is... The, that's the passion behind it. I care very deeply for this community, and I, I am very hopeful that the community is able to find a way to come together and to um, continue to move forward and be the continue to be the great community that it is. Because this was not a decision that was made easily, and I'm uh, sad to go. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay, Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember. Yeah, um, I I want to add that especially about the jacket, but no, <laughs> you know, I, I really appreciate your work and I in no way by, you know, wanting to and advocating for neighborhood involvement in these conversations, am I suggesting that you don't have those in, or any of our staff don't have those interests at heart. Um, so I want to just clarify that and thank you for your, um, your work for us. And then I'll just move that we um, adopt a resolution directing staff 
to submit an application to the state of California's SB2 planning grant program. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Brown, second. Mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor, or? And it includes all that necessary. Yeah, it includes yeah. the recommendation. Yeah. Yes, including. Please, okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Let's take a five minute break uh, before me. the next meeting. Oh, did you have a, a, a relationship to this item? Uh, in conversation, what was going on in, in, in this, I, I would, uh, I would like to just encourage us to have uh, uniform expectations. And I can appreciate uh, passion in what's going on and caring about the community, absolutely. At the same time, uh, I know that I have received incredible criticism for being just as, if not less passionate about specific issues. So I want to just put it on the record so that we can be conscious about how we perceive <coughs> and interact with people on this dais and criticize their behavior. Thank you. Okay. So we'll take a five minute break. Standards are We'll go ahead and reconvene our meeting. And next on our agenda under general business is item number 14 on our agenda. And that's the introduction of ordinance amending building regulations contained in Title 18 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code and adopting the California Code of Regulations, Title 24, 2019, Building Standards Code to establish minimum requirements to safeguard public health, life safety, and general welfare. Whew, that's a mouthful. And we'll go ahead and invite up our presenters, or we have them here seated, and uh, I'll hand it over to our uh, planning director, Lee Butler. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And with me today is John McLucas. He is our Interim Deputy <coughs> Building Official. And our Building and Safety Team um, does a lot of things that make this community safe. Our, our Building Official sometimes says, if nothing happens, we've done our job. So when earthquakes happen, this team is making sure that the buildings stand up. If there's a fire or other emergency, they're making sure that they're constructed in a manner such that people can escape out of the building or that our talented and dedicated rescue workers can get into that building and rescue people. Um, they also do things like um, accessibility and making sure that people of different abilities have uh, the opportunity to um, get into and to move around in and uh, to access all of our structures. And so um, they look at plumbing, electrical, mechanical, structural, and green building. And every three years, um, the state updates those codes. And um, I'm going to turn it over to John um, to talk about the updates that have occurred over this year that would take effect on January 1st of 2020. And then I'll jump back in to address some reach codes um, when John has concluded. Thank you, uh, Mayor Watkins, council members. Thanks for having us. Uh, so we're introducing an ordinance to amend uh, the municipal code, Title 18, which is our local building code. And it, it is to adopt the state mandated, mandated 2019 California Building Standards Codes, uh, Title 24 it's also known as. And those codes become effective uh, January 1st, 2020. As Lee said, we do this every three years, so we're a little rusty. Uh, the triennial, these, these codes are based on um, national model codes, which again have a, a three-year cycle. The California codes uh, always follow like a year later because it takes them that, that long to have their own public hearings and go through their own code process to come up with the California codes. Um, the code is published in July uh, prior to the, uh, the uh, application, the data becomes uh, valid. And so it really allows us a short time for review, um, both reviewing the, uh, the code that we've got now and seeing what the new codes, uh, how they impact that and how we have to kind of meld everything together. Um, so we've gone through and reviewed the municipal code, Title 18, uh, to reflect the new state codes and also to maintain consistency with regional modifications that have been made to those 
codes uh, based on um, seismic design requirements in our region. Um, so <clears throat> most of this most of this work is just updating the, the code edition from one year to the you know to the the year that you're you know you're in, uh, adopting. Uh, there's a lot of cleanup, uh, dotting I's and crossing T's, and then we also uh, adopt some modifications based on uh, regional consensus uh, between the uh, local building officials in the Bay Area region. Um, some of these things that we we uh, modify from the from the California codes have to do with uh, requiring foundations be reinforced for seismic, and um, previously we had. Uh, we had disallowed certain types of bracing systems for, for buildings based on kind of their failure rate in, in past earthquakes. Uh, we are actually introducing a new bracing system that we disallowed in the past, which was the uh, uh, Portland cement or stucco system in one-story buildings. Um, any modifications we make has to be justified to the Building Safety uh, Building Standards Commission based on our uh, local climatic, geologic, or topographic factors, and can only be more restrictive than the, than the state codes they're based on. <clears throat> We've also, uh, in, this, in this ordinance, adopted four new appendices. Now, appendices are parts of the code that are not mandatory, but can be adopted by local ordinance to be as, as part of the code. And the ones that we have adopted uh, at this time is uh, the residential code Appendix K, which is regarding sound transmission between multifamily dwellings. This is a standard that's been in the code for all multifamily dwellings except for two family dwellings um, ever since the uh, ever since the residential code was split off from the from the building code itself. And uh, we're basically just restoring that uh, requirement to apply to duplexes. Um, the second one is, uh, again, in the residential code, Appendix Q, which applies to tiny houses. This is a new, a new appendix, and it, what, it deals with uh, dwellings that are 400 square feet or less, and it provides for uh, reduced ceiling height requirements, as well as uh, some direction on sleeping lofts, which are which is a little more advantageous than what, what's in the code right now. <clears throat> the third appendix is, again, in the residential code, the Swimming Pool Safety Act. Uh, this is basically just a recitation of what, are, what is, is actually just state, state code right now. And uh, the only reason we adopted it is because we needed to align our local modifications regarding <clears throat> swimming swimming pool barriers um, with that act. The last appendix is from the, the California Building Code, and that appendix O is also a new, new, a new appendix, and this applies to emergency housing, um, which are basically what we read to be kind of bridge housing developments. They give you some standards, so kind of a blueprint for what these might be. They say, you know, how and what, they don't tell you where to put them. Um, so the purpose of this ordinance adoption is to comply with the state mandate, assuring that the most recent standards are part of our local building codes. We encourage you to approve the ordinance to preserve health, life, and safety standards for our built environment and protect our community. And I'll take any questions. And if I could add uh, just one thing, um, back in August, uh, when we were talking about the Advanced Planning Division's work plan, uh, the council had an inquiry about reach codes related to building electrification. And we said we would do some research and um, ha be prepared to answer some questions um, for the council um, today. Um, we did not get any formal direction from the council in respect to pursuing a building electrification reach code. And so um, the update that we have today is that the Monterey Bay Community Power is developing standards that could be used for the entire region. And 
the, the benefit of waiting on that is we can coordinate with them. They will do some of the legwork and um, we can um, have our say, but also um, if other jurisdictions in the surrounding area adopt those same standards, if someone's building in the county and there's some, or they're building here or Capitol or Scotts Valley, they would have those same standards applicable. So there is some benefit to having that regional standard. And should the council want us to pursue that, we would request that you provide that direction today. And we would also um, just give you an update on the timeline of that. We expect roughly um, six months until they um, have those standards developed. And that would put us sometime mid-year uh, of next year in, in coming back to the council, which also gives our team some time to digest and train and learn about the new codes. Um, and we do have um, some of our, our technical experts, Dr. Tiffany Wise West, as well as uh, Kurt Hurley here in the audience, um, should council have any technical questions related to the building electrification reach codes. Thank you for finding that opportunity for potential alignment. I'm interested in that. So when the time comes, we'll look at some language for the motion. Great. Is there any questions from uh, the council for staff at this time? Is there any member of the community who wants to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back to council for action. Um, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I will put the motion on the floor as recommended um, to, to introduce for publication the ordinances as described um, and uh, direct that the staff return, um, I guess the, mo the language would be when the timing is appropriate regarding the uh, reach code modification, is that? Following the Monterey Bay Community oh, yeah, Powers that's what I mean um, development of the reach code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll put that motion on the floor. Okay, I'll second. Okay, I'll second the motion. Vice Mayor Cummings. I was going to make a motion too. Okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, um, yeah, I, I'm uh, pleased to be able to support this motion as well. I, um, I do want to raise, and I, I think it's probably happening, but I uh, maybe it's a more of a question um, related to the potential with the reach codes to leverage funding through Monterey Bay Community Power. I know that they're um, working to um, create opportunities and as a the city representative to MVCP board, I'm, you know, kind of following along with what the work that they're doing. So um, just want to if t Tiffany, since you're here, I'd love to hear just a little bit from you about that and anything else you want to say before we move ahead. Sure. Good afternoon, Council Members. Mayor Tiffany Wise West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. So Monterey Bay Community Power has come out with their electrification strategic plan, which does call for some incentives, um, particularly around new affordable housing. Um, incentives for electrification. And so that's something that I'm in constant communication with them about and how that exactly will look um, when it comes out. As um, Director Butler said, uh, that we're expecting that probably no earlier than six months, four to six months approximately. Um, and I do think that that will uh, assist developers in transitioning over to this style of development, uh, which for our region is truly the next transformational emissions reduction mechanism uh, to in order to allow us to reach our share of the state's 2045 carbon neutrality goal. And of course, as we go forward with our climate action planning, we could adopt an earlier goal to that, but that will certainly be a primary mechanism. Monterey Bay Community Power itself was the first transformational um, mechanism to allow us to achieve our 2020 greenhouse gas emissions goals, and this will be the next. I just want to thank you for your work to follow along with that process and um, all of your work. I know this has been something that we've talked about before, and it's been, it's a long time. Not a it seems like a long time coming, but I know you've been doing work along the way. So thank you for thank you helping us move forward. Thank you, Tiffany. It's great. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is item number 15. 
which is the adopt, adoption of findings for modification of the 2019 edition of the California Fire Code and Fire Code standards, including annual supplements and state amendments in Arata. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor Watkins, Council. Uh, my name is Rob Odie. I'm Division Chief of the Fire Department, Fire Prevention. This is Tim Shields, Deputy Fire Marshal. Um, it's very similar to uh, the building department. They stole my thunder, so I won't bore you with all the details, but the process is very similar in terms of how um, California Fire Code is developed. It too comes from International Code Council, National Fire Code, and then the uh, state goes through, um, and very similar to building, it's all based on um, you know, research and development that uh, occurs throughout code cycles where um, safety concerns are uh, <clears throat> highlighted and uh, addressed. Obviously, all um, these codes are there for the safety and protection of the public, as well as the responders as well. Um, so, of course, the reason that they're there is something did happen, and so it needed to be addressed. Um, as a result, um, we we're proposing uh, to adopt the uh, 2019 California Fire Code edition with their amendments. Again, it's a three-year cycle over the last nine to 12 months. Um, myself and Deputy Fire Marshal Shields have worked with the Santa Cruz County Fire Prevention Officers to collectively prepare the ordinance. Um, and this is also in conjunction with the Santa Cruz County Fire Chiefs uh, cooperation. Um, and the effort was made, or it's, we recognized that uh, regula regulatory consistency between the various fire agencies in the county uh, minimizes confusion and lessens the impact on the public. Um, so again, over the last nine to 12 months, this group has worked together to bring you what we have today um, and their proposals. And I'd just like to highlight a few of the major changes um, that we've made, uh, or at least um, suggested. Um, first, in Chapter 3 of the Fire Code, under uh, 19 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code, um, there's an update for the violation of deliberate or negligent burning in open spaces. Currently, um, it's an infraction and um, difficult for us to uh, achieve, um, you know, any type of... Uh, uh, just basically it was difficult with the infraction. It carried little weight in dissuading and preventing these types of burning activities. The other option that we had was to enter into the penal code and have this be a felony. And we found that that was maybe too draconian, too drastic, and where the infraction obviously wasn't getting us uh, what we needed in terms of providing safety for the community. So we worked with the city attorney's office in bringing um, the possibility of having it be a misdemeanor. And um, basically, <clears throat> this allows the potential for fire code officials to have the ability to evaluate and determine the cause, the intent, and the severity of the situation and enforce the ordinance with sound judgment, which hopefully will prevent catastrophic wildfire event that threatens the city's open spaces and the residents who live adjacent to these sensitive areas. And of course, despite the issuing from the fire code official themselves, the decision um, was obviously deferred to the city attorney, which will have final authority on deciding the final outcome. Um, should it go that route. Um, the next major change is Chapter 39 of the Fire Code, <clears throat> and due to the uh, rapid increase uh, in the cannabis industry and the recent events over the last couple of years with uh, honey oil labs in the city, um, with these businesses um, coming into the city, uh, we, the California Fire Code addresses the plant processing and extraction facilities. So we've added a section that requires the extraction gas detection equipment in these labs um, to activate the building's fire alarm system if the gas levels exceed 25% uh, of the lower explosive limit. And again, that's just uh, for safety of uh, people that work in these facilities, the responders, and the people that live in the areas that work in the areas around these facilities. The next major change <clears throat> in light of the devastating wildfires throughout the state, in both in the past and currently, um, we've one of the state has adopted Chapter 49, which provides for minimum standards to increase the ability of a structure to resist flame intrusion or burning embers during a wildfire for areas identified as wild urban interface or the WUI, which have been determined by fire code officials. <clears throat> Within uh, these areas, um, the construction requirements that are identified in the California Building Code, Chapter 7A, California Residential Code, Section R337, 
and California Reference Standards Code, Chapter 12 through 7A, apply to all new construction in these areas and all new materials that are used for additions and remodels in, uh, for the homes in these areas. So those are kind of the three major changes that we've proposed. And so in summary, the fire department is recommending that the city council adopt the 2019 California Fire Code as submitted per the attached ordinance. And with that, if you guys have any questions, be happy to answer them for you. Okay, thank you for the summary. Any questions from the council at this time? Any, oh, do you have a question? Just a quick one. Uh, you mentioned it's on our page 15.2, um, bolstering vegetation management. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yes, that falls under the chapter 49 as well. So in conjunction with public education, um, community organization through like the FireWise program that we have um, with various neighborhoods in the city, um, and as well as um, enforcing codes, vegetation management is a huge part of that. And what the code um, actually, um, sites is it gives us within those areas recommendations that residents um, can sort of again mitigate hazards around their home. Those areas are defined as zero to five feet, five to 30 feet and 100 feet and it gives them recommendations on um, how to trim um, grass, shrubs and trees around their homes. So those are advisory, is that correct? It will be enforceable. Um, yeah. And that will be on um, uh, on privately owned and correct yes by any so currently kind of the, the city has a weed abatement program for vacant lots yeah. but this expands that a little bit into the wooey areas where we can actually enforce these um, mitigation efforts within those regions specifically into the wildland interface correct. Mm -hmm. yeah and That's does correct. it impose additional expectations on the city itself um, it, that's just a question it, it may increase our inspection so the inspectors may need to go out and, and do periodic checks to make sure that they're complying, but in terms I was just of cost. Thinking of what we've done along the upper part of the De La Viega. That's all part I mean, of the effort. It's similar. Yeah. Yes. Right. But that was like on us to do the. This will be on the residents themselves or the or property both, owners. Maybe. Or both, yes. Yes. And we are getting a lot of grants too. Yeah, we're working with, you know, very, uh, Fire Safe Council, um, Cal Fire for different grant funding for these projects. And what these do is allow us to develop those community groups like FireWise where we're in, along with them doing the work in their neighborhoods to fortify their homes and prevent the spread of fire, we're doing the same work. So it definitely works in concert with each other. Very important work. A question comes from Rick over. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the, the presentation, y'all. Um, fire safety is incredibly important, especially with climate change and all that stuff that we've been dealing with. Uh, just wanted to get some clarification under the area that talks about negligent burning um, from an infraction to a misdemeanor, uh, specifically citing the number of fires, 150 open space fires within the last 18 months all being human caused. Um, in your opinion, I just for the record, that the, were, were those human caused ones predominantly from people that were living outdoors? That all the data that was collected was by way of our reporting system. And there's a new app that we use where when we go out and respond, regardless of who the person was, they may or may not be on the scene still. We're just documenting the cause and the origin and that typically is out in those open spaces. Okay, yeah, just because my concern with that shift from an infraction to a misdemeanor, since we do have inadequate shelter service and especially as we enter into the winter months where there may hopefully be rain, right? But just in case that there's not, and people are trying to keep themselves warm, potentially in open spaces, the impact of their criminal record if they uh, negligently or unintentionally uh, start a fire because they're trying to either cook or stay warm because of a lack of access to services, uh, and then the impact that could have on them, not only financially, but also in potentially becoming incarcerated if it gets charged to the certain level of severity, I'm not. I'm yeah, not I understand your concern, which is why currently you, you have either infraction or at times we've gone down the, the, the felony route, which have obviously has much more of an impact on those individuals. Right. Um, so with that, we tried to find some middle ground and we feel as though, again, um, it's just another step in that ladder. Um, but also the big point, big part of it is, is that we're really looking at the cause and the intent. Just with like any felony uh, arson, we're looking for intent. And so this would be, if it's accidental, if it has to be something where, it, again, 
uh, th the circumstances were such that it was accidental, not intentional, or not repeated behavior that is a threat. Um, again, the fire code official um, would definitely take all that into consideration prior to issuing that. In in including the time of year, so you know it's not going to be as impactful in the winter, the winter. when there is rain versus you know in the next couple of days where we have low humidity, high wind event, and heat. So. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we at least said it out loud so that yep. we could provide some Definitely. sense of. Um, uh, con comfort for people. That yeah, and we, we were sensitive to that and just trying to find some middle ground that would sort of be beneficial to both sides of that. And then ideally figuring out ways so that people don't have to use open flames to stay warm in public spaces, which is the right. ultimate fire safety goal, right? right? Yeah, absolutely. Unless there's no further questions, is there any member of the community wanting to speak to us on this item? Okay. And then we'll go ahead and return back for council action. Mm -hmm. Mayor Cummings. I'll move the staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And next on our agenda is item number 16, and that's the resolution calling an election to be held on March 3rd, um, 2020. And... Um, We'll go ahead and, oh, is this Mr. Condotti introducing it? Yes, um, I will introduce this item. Um, the item before you is a proposed amendment to the city charter relating to public works construction. And this item originated um, several months ago in discussions um, that my office was having with the water department, which as you know, has several really huge infrastructure projects coming down the pike that are anticipated to be um, awarded uh, and constructed within the next several years. So there's a, a very long-term uh, view here towards getting ready to do uh, a lot of major infrastructure projects. Um, the proposal is an amendment to the charter. I'm gonna do this slide presentation in reverse. Um, that's too far. Um, currently under the city charter, and there's a red line draft in your uh, agenda packet, it states that uh, any public works uh, or improvements costing more than such amount as may be prescribed by ordinance shall be executed by contract um, and that all such contracts shall be awarded to the lowest responsible bidder after public notice and, comp, uh, and competition. And the lowest responsible bidder is a term of art in the construction industry, and it implies that the contract will be awarded under the traditional design bid build method that you're accustomed to seeing when the staff comes to you with either a request to approve plans and specs and authorize that a project go out to bid, or to award a contract that has been uh, put out to bid. And the way that process works is that um, a team consisting of engineers and architects and designers will design the project and prepare project plans and specifications for it. And then when the project uh, design is approved, then it will be advertised for bids and construction companies will come in and bid on the project. And under the, the current law, um, so long as a construction contractor is qualified to submit a bid and the bid conforms to all of the plans and specifications, then the city is obligated to award the contract to the lowest bidder. Um, in, in recent years, a lot of different jurisdictions, state entities, uh, cities, other public agencies have been looking to uh, what are called alternative project delivery methods. And the most common example of those is the design build method. Um, and the design build method essentially entails um, putting out a request for proposals from qualified design build entities. Um, and those typically will get together and include architects, engineers, designers, and construction firms. And once a and a, and a preliminary design is done, and once that um, request for qualifications is sent out, then the, uh, then the, the city, in this case, would um, send out a request for proposals to the 
entities that it determines um, meet the qualifications to do the project. So it's, um, and, and then uh, the request for proposals will more explicitly set out what the, basically the primary objective of the project is and some very preliminary design and engineering work. Um, and then we'll accept proposals from the different design build entities. Then the city will take those, rank the proposals on the basis of the most qualified, um, the cost certainly, the timeline proposed for construction, and in a design build contract, the maximum guaranteed price for the contract. And what has been uh, observed in these types of projects is that oftentimes they result in a lower cost, in a better product, and in a faster delivery because it's done in one uh, phase as opposed to the design, the bid, and the build phase. Um, so the recommendation here uh, is that we amend the charter to authorize the city to award construction contracts um, based on these alternative design, um, alternative project delivery methods. Uh, if it's approved by the voters, then that will provide us with additional flexibility in approaching uh, some of the more complex and larger uh, public works pro projects that will be coming before you. It will ensure that all of our existing contracting standards like prevailing wage and reaching out to uh, minority-owned <coughs> businesses and women-owned businesses and all of our uh, other policies are adhered to, but just in a different um, delivery package. Um, I see Heidi and Mark are here, and I'm sure we'll be happy to weigh in if you have any questions or comments. Um, but the recommendation is to adopt the resolution placing this on the March 3rd primary ballot. Any questions from the council at this time? Okay. Councilman Prong and Councilman Murphy. Yeah, I was just, I, maybe I was mis mixed up. We're not like just setting the date for the election 2020, but we're just putting, we're putting this issue on that election. That's right. We, we would be asking the county elections official to consolidate this measure on the March 3rd primary ballot with the other uh, election matters. And when we say fiscal impact, does it, does it cost the city something to put this on the ballot? It does, but this isn't the only ballot measure that the city is uh, putting on the March 3rd ballot. You, you just recently approved the, the charter amendment for the school district. And it does not cost anything additional to put more than one ballot measure on the, on the ballot. Um, so it won't result in any additional cost that you wouldn't already occur by virtue of that other item. Councilor Matthews? Um, and there are uh, multiple benefits from this approach, including savings of time and money and so forth. So, um, and this has come to us at the request of the water department. So I'm gonna go ahead and move the recommendation before, oh, sorry. Before you do it, let me just see, is there any member of the committee? I thought you asked for that, sorry. No, 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 we'll have okay. that and then okay. we'll go ahead and move Okay. That. You'll have up to two minutes. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, I don't have any problem with changing this process and how you select a uh, firm to build something. Uh, my question about this particular measure is because it's a charter amendment, how does it interface with the amendment that was changed um, when the D cell people got, got their um, charter amendment on there and made, made a requirement that any project over a certain dollar amount had to go to the public to be voted upon. Is this gonna change that or is this gonna interface with it? How, how is that gonna happen? That's what I wanna know, thank you. Any other members of the community? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back. Do you wanna go ahead and try to? Yes, the, the um, initiative that was adopted with respect to the desal project will not be affected by this at all. Okay. Councilmember Matthews? Yeah, so I'd like to go ahead and put this, um, uh, move the recommendation before us to put this on the ballot. I'll, I'll second it. Okay, motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. I, I do have a follow up to this too. Uh, typically, when uh, something goes on the ballot at our initiative, 
um, we designate a process for a uh, responsible party to write the ballot arguments in favor and to have to designate signers. So um, I'd like to also, um, I can make that a motion that we um, designate to the mayor the uh, designation of a um, responsible parties to work on the ballot argument and signers sure. committee. Okay. Right. If that's agreeable that's, to people. That's, that, that's fine for me. I've done that before. Okay. I'll, se I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. Good. Thanks for thinking of that ahead of time. Thank you. Okay. So this... Um, Nice planning, Vice Mayor. We're going to go ahead and adjourn our meeting um, until the evening session, which will begin with oral communications at 7 p.m. Um, for those who may be watching at home and planning on joining us this evening, um, we um, do have the Tony Hill room available for overflow if needed. So we'll see you back here at 7. All right. I told them that. If I could get your attention, please. Thank you very much. All right. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. If I could ask you to quiet your voices and or to take your conversations outside if you prefer to keep talking. I'm going to go ahead and call to order our evening item, and I'll ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Happy to be here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cumming? Yep. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. Before we get started, I'd like to invite up our fire uh, marshal to make an announcement in, um, in regards to safety. I just have one request. If I could, if could go ahead and uh, have your respect. Um, Mayor, is please. that acceptable for you, ma'am? No, I invited you up, please, and please, for the safety of our community, you. make so your announcement. The, the fire chief has asked that we don't line up against this wall for egress Thanks exiting. And so yeah, if you're right. lined up. Go ahead and ask that you have respect for our fire marshal as he makes his announcement to please. ensure the safety of I'm our respectful community. for you. Please be respectful back. That's all I ask, right? So if that wall can remain clear, if you're lining up to speak, I'll allow you to stand to be in line to speak. We're at capacity now, and I ask that that doorway stay clear. That's all I ask. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Okay. So as I um, said before, this is our um, evening session of our Oct 20, October 22nd, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And um, I, before we get started, I'd like to let the community know that we did reserve the Tony Hill room over in the Civic Auditorium for overflow for this evening's item. We do have an evening item that will begin at 7.30 p.m. Before we start the evening item, we will have time for oral communications. So I'll go ahead and open up oral communications. And oral communications is an opportunity for members of our community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If I could get a sense of how many people are here for oral communications. Okay. So we will have um, 90. We'll have 90 seconds for oral communications in hopes to be able to hear from everybody. We have a limited time because we have a uh, evening item, and so we'll conclude oral communications at 7:35 and hopefully be able to hear from all folks who are wanting to speak to us on items not on today's agenda. I just want to remind those in the council chambers and out, and outside of the council chambers that um, we have rules of decorum, and it's the responsibility of t the. Uh, chair of the meeting, myself as mayor, to ensure that no matter who you are or the expressions you have, that you can do so without intimidation or harassment. I ask that while you are here in council chambers, that you respect your fellow citizens and you respect the process. We hope to have a process that we can hear from you as well as some time for us to deliberate. And no one should feel intimidated or threatened for expressing their views before us. Um, so if I do 
see you um, not abiding by our rules of decorum, I will give you a verbal warning. If I see you continually disrupting our council proceedings, I will ask that you leave the chambers. Um, I think that we all want to have this process unfold as respectfully as possible, and so I ask you to um, respect the process while you're here participating in council. So with that said, we'll go ahead and open up oral communications. Um, you'll have 90 seconds. Please step forward. Ninety seconds. It says two. Damn it, minutes. Okay. It's it's not. Go ahead, Elise. It's not set. I'll wait till it's set. Okay. I, I have ninety seconds. I will start it at ninety seconds. Regardless. Okay. So go ahead. It's it says a minute. I haven't started it yet. So go ahead, and I will start it Can at ninety. I have someone else to Okay, well, I need a little heads up. Okay, well, have anybody who wants to go first for the 90 seconds, please come forward. You have up to 90 seconds. Okay, that says one minute. Uh, it's okay. My name's James Ewing Whitman. I found that my fountain of youth is actually doing research. Had I actually found the research that I thought I had read, I would have submitted some stuff to the DA. And I hope to find that information because I think there's a couple issues. So I want to say that I wish that I was addressing eight year olds because I find eight it's very engaging and kind of really easy to discuss and dialogue because I think our society on a whole is facing some really strong problems. And if it were up to me and if I ran the zoo, I would recommend that everybody be familiar with four books. So briefly, one is Climate Crash, where they go all over the world and they do ice core samples. They go back only 600,000 years. What they discover is dramatic climate change it doesn't take centuries, it takes five to 20 years. It's a good book. Another book is called A Short History of Progress by Ronald Wright. It describes what, how societies lived as long as they did and, and were successful. Basically, they reused their shit. Their book is called <clears throat> Native, and Myths, Native American Myths and Folklore. It's gotta be one of the funniest books I've ever read. Two books, two stories of note are Goosap Kills the Water Monster and The Dogs Hold an Election. Really enjoyed reading that with my book. I have 30 seconds. Fourth book is A Short History of Progress, written by Howard Zinn. There's only about one paragraph out of the 10,000 that describes the society that was found in the Caribbean islands, where that society had no marriage, no jealousy, no greed, and was run by women. And when those women wanted to create a child, they invited whatever man they wanted into their tent. And guess what, in that village situation, the men raised the children, everybody got along pretty well, which is not how I see our society. Thank you. Good evening. I listened with interest last time um, to the presentation on renaming the pedestrian bridge and the art project, and I was very moved by Greg Pepping's uh, presentation. I think it's lovely in all ways to do that. I would like you please to make it a pedestrian bridge, to make it safe and comfortable for people to walk on. It isn't because there are many bicyclists and to a lesser extent skateboarders who will not get off their wheels and walk through the park and across the river on the bridge as the very small signs tell them to do. And it's become even worse because of jump bikes. Um, there are many elders who use that bridge to walk from Dakota Avenue to Trader Joe's and Bookshop Santa Cruz, other places downtown. So um, can you please call it Chinatown Footbridge? The lettering could very easily be Chinatown Footbridge. Also put consequential signs with uniforms and fines attached. Thank you very much. Should I just start? Yeah, hi, my name is Josh Rohinsky. Um, I'm a homeowner and a landlord. 
and I want to tell you about something I'm really concerned about. Um, our community is falling apart rapidly as people are being pushed out of this community because of rents, and there's something that's making it, speeding it up right now, and I think it's a bit of an urgent situation. With the rent control that's coming in January 1st, there are landlords all over the region, all over the county that are evicting people right now. So those of us who are doing renter advocacy work are getting information, people are calling us continually saying we're about to get a notice, we just got a notice, and it's especially for Section 8 tenants right now, and you'll hear from a bunch of them coming soon. But this is something that is urgent, and you can actually do what other cities have done in um, California, where they've implemented the, um, uh, the just cause portion of the statewide bill early, and that will be like a rent freeze, will protect us from that sort of chaos where landlords freak out and they're really terrified, um, and they evict people. And so we have dozens already. I mean, that's, I expect it'll be a lot more soon, but there's already dozens of people that are about to lose their homes in the next month, and you all can act on that and really make it a much better place to live. So thanks for thinking about it. Before we have our next speaker, I just want to make an announcement that this was brought to my attention earlier today, and it will likely be agendized for our upcoming meeting, um, for our special meeting next Tuesday. Okay? Okay, please. My name is Lee Brokaw, and I think it's appropriate to make a comparison to this particular council's administration to the Loma Prieta earthquake. I think that 30 years from now, this will be remembered as the Watkins fissure. I had chance to go to the Commission for Prevention of Violence Against Women, and I was much surprised on the 9th of October to see a motion to implore Mayor Watkins to re-agendize the censure for Councilmember Crone and Glover. I read from the vision for the Commission for Prevention of Violence Against Women to end sexual assault, sexual harassment, domestic violence in the city of Santa Cruz through prevention programs and public policy. Mission, to collaborate with local stakeholder partners and law enforcement to ensure best practices to respond to and uh, prosecute violent crimes against women. Purpose, to make ending violence against women the highest priority of the city of Santa Cruz to ensure collaboration with other public-private agencies to support existing programs, support the development of new programs as needed, to facilitate meaningful citizen participation in the work of the commission, to continue to work with law enforcement to develop strategies for the successful prosecution and conviction of crimes of violence against women. Nowhere in there is there censor of council members as part of the agenda. Time is up. Next speaker. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Elise Casby. I'm here to speak about the, um, today is the last day on the first phase of the recall. The recall um, has been one of the ugliest and dirtiest campaigns that I have seen in my life. I'm over 60. I've been in politics for the last 25 years. I am going to call on council members Myers, Watkins, and Matthews to come out publicly and denounce the recall. The recall drumbeat started after the November 2018 election, and it was directly because we had finally gotten a progressive majority on council. And Justin Cummings has been mostly progressive, and we've we're counting on him, especially in the area of renter protections, and thanks, Justin, for what you've done there. I just wanna say that at the March 13th meeting of the Santa Cruz Together, the complete strategy was mapped out by the pro-recall people, including picking on Drew because they perceived him as vulnerable, using Justin because they saw him as inexperienced. They mapped out their their costs, and they've gone over cost. There is a rumor that the recall has been 16 to $50 per signature in the last few days. The amount of deceptions and lies that have been promoted from the media, such as the Sentinel, is, has been abysmal. I'm asking the council members in good faith to denounce the recall. Hi, 
Hi, I'm uh, Carolyn Ronzano, and I'm here tonight to speak to you about the Circle Church. But there's a couple of things I want you to know about me first. Um, my daughter and her fiance are currently living with me because of the housing affordability issue in the city. So I'm aware of that problem. I'm aware of the need for housing. And also, I don't subscribe to a generic anti-development philosophy. But I do believe that the Circle Church is a unique, one-of-a-kind city icon that should be preserved. I would like the Historic Preservation Commission as an unpaid, neutral party be allowed to review and comment on the historic report that was uh, prepared for the developers for the Eretz Circle uh, proposal. Currently, they are really hamstrung by the planning department. I have tried twice to get this on their agenda. At the last meeting, I was advised by the commission that the only way to have this item added is through the city council, and that is why I'm here tonight. I hope you can focus on me. Yeah, can you pass your um, time, please? If I could ask that you please keep your voices down. We're gonna do our best to hear you when you wanna speak, and um, this woman here deserves your respect as she speaks and addresses the council as well. Okay, so maybe we could close the door or something like that if the voices in the hallway couldn't keep it down. Thank you, Fire Marshal. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so there is no specific language in their bylaws or the zoning ordinance that restricts them from reviewing any historic report. So I would like to formally request that the council agendize a discussion about allowing the HPC to review the error circle proposal and historic report. And I hope this can be a formal request. I don't really know what the process is. This center has served as our, our neighborhood as a spiritual center, community center, and park for over 130 years. I believe it deserves this consideration. Thank you, and please, it's important to us. Thank you. Hi, Bruce Thomas, 18-year um, resident of Dufour Street. I've been here before. I'm representing um, the Dufour neighborhood, and with um, some, we're, we're kind of exasperated. Uh, one, I'm passing around a petition that we, a group of us, submitted to the city council and the mayor and city council one year ago over problems that came about with, um, and a lot of them to do with delivery trucks servicing the Blaze Pizza and the Starbucks at the intersection of Dufour and Mission Street. Of the highlighted problems in the front of the page, none have been f addressed. Some efforts were made to paint a curb. Uh, the real problem came, germinated when there was no loading zones designated and two businesses were allowed to go into this former bank building. So here's the latest. It's a real concern, and this is why we're exasperated. We came here in August to um, say that the report that was filed by the planning department that said things were addressed is incorrect. Things were, there were problems we identified in August, double parking trucks during the day. Unfortunately, in the last three weeks, we have double parking happening again at the other location right outside the Starbucks, and it's a traffic safety hazard. It's blocking half of Dufour Street, the entrance from Mission, and I don't know if I, that can be seen, and it's also, this is a car having to drive the wrong way to get around the truck. It's happening every night for three weeks in a row. I've called the police, Mayor Watkins, I've sent you two emails, I've CC'd the city manager's office, and I've been regular emails to the transportation department. It seems to be the city is, is, con, is condoning this. It's a traffic safety hazard. Please help us address it. Um. Is the Bixby Barson eviction scene on the agenda tonight? I'm sorry, no. No, okay, I'll address that. Uh, Nicholas Whitehead, I'm a volunteer with an organization that helps immigrant families. And in the course of that, I've met dozens of families, or my colleagues have met dozens of families, who've been severely harmed by the laissez-faire policies that prevail in the city as regards rentals. Um, when people are working two jobs and have medical bills, they're in a state of exhaustion, and I've seen a lot of this. So these people are being evicted from Barson and Bixby. Uh, you know, we need a fund. We need a fund that will subsidize their rentals until we have that protection, at least of the state, starting January 1st. Uh, I suggest that, that the funding for such a sub rent subsidy should be coming from 
out, uh, outfits like Blackstone and other large corporate entities that are taking over the housing in our area. That would be one way to do it. Uh, I met a 68-year-old uh, woman in a wheelchair in Scotts Valley who told me she couldn't afford the increase in her Section 8 housing when a new owner took over in, in the city of Santa Cruz, and she was made homeless, personally told me. Now she's at the, at the shelter on Coral Street. This is all wrong. Um, hello, I'm here to talk about the same thing essentially. So my name is Clayton, uh, my Clayton Strong, and I'm a volunteer counselor with Tenant Sanctuary. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I received a call from a Section 8 tenant on Bixby Street who was getting a no-cause 60-day notice to vacate. And I basically had to tell her she has no rights in this situation, and she told me she and her middle school-aged daughter will be homeless within that time period. Okay? And the legislature just passed AB 1482, so a just cause eviction bill for the state, and we can debate the merits of just cause eviction all day, but essentially it's already the law. All that is happening now is we have a giant three month gap where anyone can get evicted. We should immediately pass the just cause eviction portion of AB 1482 within the city just to prevent this exact scenario. And we don't have to make anything stronger. We don't have to do measure M. We don't have to do our own just cause eviction, but we need to plug this gap in AB 1482 as soon as possible. Thank you. And briefly, before you speak up, I just want to remind those who are here for that um, topic that this will likely be added to our next meeting, which is a special meeting next Tuesday to be discussed. Okay, go right ahead. Um, hi, my name is Aaron, and I also rent here in Santa Cruz. And I think it's important that the city council take emergency action to protect tenants from these no-cause evictions. I've already seen many of my neighbors forced into cars or into streets when we, be could, when we could be protecting them right now. Our state lawmakers have failed to act to protect us between now and January 1st. So all I ask is that you please take action immediately so no one is evicted during the holiday season. Hi, my name's Jessica. Um, thank you, Mayor, for communicating that agendizement, but we're already here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just felt like I need to give an update since the last time I was here and brought this up. Um, two more tenants from that complex have already been evicted. Um, one has packed their belongings to their van. I don't really know where they are right now. Um, and another couple is living in San Jose, even though they continue to work here and look for housing. Um, if that means anything, it just means that Every day without action means another person is running out of time. Um, it was the legislature's fault for creating this loophole, but I believe it's our city's job to pick up the pieces and make sure that no one else falls through the cracks. Um, renters living in some of our cities, you know, very few last affordable multifamilies now have a target on their backs. Um, and I feel that we can do more and that we can do better. I'm hoping that you'll prioritize this issue before more renters are forced to leave. My name's John Ballesteri. I live there, been a tenant, raised my son there, and now it's time to get out of town. And we got till December 31st, and that's bullshit, because we all, nobody's ready for it. We're not ready. Come on, time to move, kid, get out. 72 years old, uh, my birthday, we offer you three grand, move out today. Sorry, I can't do it. We need some help, thank you very much. My name's Laura and I'm here for the same thing and I just want to second what they said. <laughs> oh, uh, my name's Stephen Case. I've lived in Santa Cruz since uh, off and on. Since 1969, I've lived in my present location for 30 years and I'm being evicted. And it is a horrific uh, experience. There's nowhere to go. It's difficult to move out of town. It's difficult to move out of state. Section 8 is difficult to navigate. Uh, they can just not renew Section 8. Uh, the just cause doesn't really matter. You know, it's just a matter of time. Uh, well, the bottom line is, is that, of course, Santa Cruz is a cash cow. And uh, 
you should really do something to help people <coughs> get out of town, reestablish themselves elsewhere. It's a very daunting thing. I'm 74 years old. I'm finding it difficult. Uh, so there should be more uh, assistance, I think. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nicola. I am a former resident of Bixby Street, and I'm really upset about the evictions that are happening in Lower Ocean. Um, I think we need immediate protections for these next three months. Um, and to not do so is to be complicit in ethnic cleansing. My name is Helen Bradley. I've been living here in Santa Cruz since 2001. I came here from Nashville. I've been real sickly since I've been here. And I go to MHK and I'm here to re to uh, represent MH Can. I've been going there for about, se going on 17 years now. And um, I want to talk about the food bank. You know, we, they give us food, we get donations there. But it would be better if we could get a donation from Second Harvest. It would really help us out. We have a lot of homeless people that come there. And I myself used to be, and now I'm back again being a um, diabetic. But with the food that MH Can was furnishing for us, and uh, it made me not a diabetic, I got my diet together. But now we don't really have enough food in MH Can. We would really appreciate if you all could look into getting a help for us. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Nick Bodsky, and I'm here for the Mental Health Claim Action Network, which is also MH Can. I'm a peer support worker. I help those who are homeless or with uh, mental illness issues going on in their life. Um, it's the month of October, and with that, it's uh, time for our special permit to, to be amended. And we just have a few requests that MHCAN is asking for. Uh, the first request is gonna be um, Second Harvest Food Bank, a delivery once per month. Uh, anything really helps us out. Uh, one delivery per month is little to ask for, but it would be a huge difference for our community who come in and rely on us for, you know, food for the day at times. And um, that's in regards to Second Harvest. And I also wanna ask or um, amend the special permit uh, for us to not have a security guard. It is very intimidating to our clients that go there. Um, some are feel fearful of security guards for a variety of reasons. Um, we've only had 29 emergency police calls at our location, most of which were uh, hangups or uh, medical related for our senior uh, staff and clients. And um, it's just really not needed. Our, our neighbor, Grace Commons, they've had 100 plus emergency calls and they aren't required to have a security guard. So um, if we could have that uh, told to the planning departments, that would be amazing. Thank you. Hello, and how do you do? My name is Grace Butler, and I'm here as well on behalf of MH Can Mental Health Client Action Network and the uh, mental health community. There are some amendments that we were asking. Be, uh, our use permit is in October is when our special use permit is up, and um, I live at Grace Commons, which is on the same is on the same parking lot as uh, as MH Can and. Um, there's really not a any kind of necessary for a security guard. He sits, he sits there, and he just waits for something to happen, and nothing's happening. Um, it just it seems like a way. Uh, I, we would pay for it if it was. Ne we pay for it. It would be if it was necessary, but it's not really necessary. So we're asking if you could take the security guard and put him somewhere else where he's really needed. And also, as far as the second har harvest food bank, MH Can is a day program that. Uh, provide sol solace for a lot of homeless people, a lot of mental health people, especially the mental health people. And having a place to cook and to eat is is fundamental. And uh, having a food bank delivery just just uh, once a month would really be beneficial in in every aspect. Makes it uh, makes them feel a little more um, how do you say independent. So we're asking if you could you would consider those two amendments. And also I'm with Bixby Apartments. Go go with their housing. Thank you. Thanks. 
Gary Richard Arnold, Mayor, Council people. I'm concerned about your uh, constant uh, move to set up a uh, parallel government, a COG, a Council of Governments through AMBAG. Uh, it's uh, made up of uh, uh, sexual rings and old espionage uh, rings. Uh, for instance, we've got uh, Bruce McPherson, who was elected as the a Santa Cruz representative. He was not avoided by anybody here. This was done from the top down. Uh, COGS, the, council, the uh, community uh, TV doesn't show a thing. This is Bruce McPherson received tens of thousands of dollars from a triple Chinese communist uh, uh, aide. Um, here's another one. This is supposed to be uh, Dianne Feinstein's cabbie. This is 40 years ago. He's been in charge of her office in Santa Cruz. If people don't know Panettigate, they better uh, start understanding. Leon Panetta gave military and policy information to a communist spy whose uh, monument is on the courthouse steps. When Leon Panetta was head of the CIA, there were multiple people that died uh, because of, uh, uh, that were American agents in communist China. Uh, you have the documentation in front of you. I only have 15 seconds, uh, but you go down to uh, Ed Buck, uh, Schiff, uh, Ted Liu, all of these people are involved in sexual rings. Uh, Ed Buck ended up uh, having two dead prostitutes taken out of his house, and the last one ran out with an injection needle on him. Next speaker, please. Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. I'm going to hold these up for a moment. This is Israel did 9-11. And it's Christopher Bolin who uh, has the website with an avalanche of documentation and evidence, both circumstantial uh, eyewitness, but more importantly, a scientific and uh, forensic evidence that Israel did 9-11. Why did Israel do 9-11? Well, that's a long story, but it boils down to Israel wanted the United States to fight um, wars for Israel in the Mideast to enable Israel to take over more territory. Uh, Trump is enabling that process. He's uh, certainly in Israel's pocket. His chief funder is a Sheldon Adelson, a multi-billionaire who made his money um, in the sleazy enterprise of gambling. Uh, I think the Democrats are any better. Nancy Pelosi said, this is almost a direct quote, Nancy Pelosi said, even if the U.S. Con uh, Capitol crumbles into ruins, our top priority will still be to support Israel. Can you believe that? Look it up. I'm not making this up. We've got to confront the Israel lobby, by far the most powerful and intimidating force in American politics. Thank you. Next speaker. And I'm going to be concluding um, oral communications at uh, 7.40. So uh, you'll have up to 90 seconds, and we'll go ahead and stop, and hopefully you'll be aware of the people behind you if you want to keep your comments brief. Okay. Garrett Phillips, Santa Cruz. Uh, this is the press release from Santa Cruz United. Probably already saw it. I'll hand it in in case you didn't. And uh, it, it basically says that the people are not fooled by the anti-recall groups who just lie about everything. And uh, it's a pretty overwhelming statement. And it basically, the Spanish translation is uh, hasta la vista, you know. So I'm going to hand that in later. But I also wanted to talk about socialism. Your, earlier today, we saw a perfect example how all of you are pretty much, uh, well, <laughs> uh, socialists masquerading as nonpartisan city council members, some worse than others. And uh, in particular, when you start talking about not protecting the health and safety and individual rights of people, but talking about design rules, central planning for downtown, not listening to the private sector who it's their money, their property, and, and deciding for them what they're going to do with their money, their property, now you're on dangerous ground. 
Okay, and I would like to read a little bit of the, uh, I would point out that the Cato Institute, Re Cato Institute released its 2019 report on what Americans think about welfare, work and wealth. I suggest you read it. Some of the headlines, I don't have too much time for, but 50% uh, of Democrats say Trump has soured their view of, of capitalism versus 6% for Republicans. 47% uh, of strong socialist sympathizers say violence against the rich is sometimes <coughs> justified. And uh, quite a few others, very eye-opening. Okay, next speaker. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first of all, you need emergency action to deal with the renters tonight. You could do that if you want. You've gotten testimony tonight of evictions you hadn't heard about until tonight. So take action tonight. Secondly, MH Can needs true and real support so that they can return to a policy of being able to serve the people that they served three and four and five years ago. You've already heard speakers on that. Crowded shelters are full, waiting lists are long, disabled senior and other vulnerable people have returned to sleep next to the post office fence on Water Street as they did two years ago after being driven from City Hall. Two years ago, Chief Mills directed a substantial number to San Lorenzo Park in the spring of 2018. A fraction of those were admitted to the expensive and restrictive River Street campground run by assistant manager Susie O'Hara. Last fall, O'Hara and the council betrayed that population by evicting them for the winter. Authorities herded them to the Ross camp. They were then driven off in May to the imaginary non-existent shelter fabricated again by O'Hara. With the help of the Watkins minority and Vice Mayor Cummings, defection from the progressive majority. In Berkeley, survival campers at the Where Do We Go campsite are standing their ground. Berkeley housed residents have come to their rescue. We need to do the same here. We can expect less than nothing from the Watkins Cummings Council and its staff. Worse, cynical financing for police and ranger raids, a council that locks bathrooms against the poor can't be counted on for kindness or rationality. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, um, my name is Charlie Vasky. I wish to thank you for agendizing emergency renter protections. Um, though AB 14 is a great victory for housing advocates, there is this loophole. And until it goes into effect in January, tenants can and will be evicted. And according to journalist Matt Levin from CalMatters, prominent lawyers are recommending uh, to landlords to evict now and raise rents where they can. Um, as we've heard, this is happening in Santa Cruz, but it's also happening across the state. Um, one other thing that you might not have heard yet here tonight is that today, Los Angeles' City Council unanimously, 14 to 0, passed emergency renter protections. Um, and with that, they have canceled 60-day uh, eviction notices. I urge you to quickly pass similar measures here. Thank you. I'm Keith McHenry, and uh, yesterday I was getting my mail in the evening at the downtown post office, and a, a young woman came to me and told me that she had just lost her apartment, and she had spent the last couple of nights sleeping in doorways downtown, but had found the safety of the men at the camps outside the post office reassuring. And um, she just had her birthday, uh, for her 45th birthday, um, homeless on the streets of Santa Cruz. And it's very clear if you go around outside that the, the uh, eviction at Ross Camp has resulted in hundreds and hundreds of people seeking shelter in our doorways, including many, many women who are losing their, their, their homes as a result of uh, the vicious um, increase in rents that are happening and, and other w efforts to drive people back uh, out of their homes and into the streets. The other thing that is happening is quite, she lost her car or did not have a car to live in, but many women uh, tried to find sanctuary in a vehicle, but are unable to pay um, registration and so on. And then the city tows their home and then they end up living in a doorway downtown and then they get to go and live with a group of guys to for protection. And we heard this all before with Ross Camp. So we told you this would happen. It happened. It is happening. And, and more and more people are joining the ranks of the, un, of, uh, the unhoused. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and see how many people are here in line at, for oral communications items not on today's agenda. You'll be our last speaker in the glasses then with the gentleman with the gray shirt. 
So we'll have four more. Go ahead, you'll have 90 seconds. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Fordham. I live at uh, 123 Bixby, uh, the apartment complex where people are being evicted. Um, I live next door to Stephen Case, uh, who just spoke, and John Ballesteri. And I also know that, uh, that my neighbors, uh, there was a married couple who were working more than 40 hours a week each, and they uh, uh, now have no place to live. They've just moved out a couple of days ago. Um, I just think that um, an emergency, uh, um, I, I honestly believe that, uh, that just uh, a few months would, would, would help an awful lot of people an awful lot of people who are going to have a really rough time if they don't get a little bit of emergency help. Please. Marilyn Garrett, and thanks very much to Keith McHenry and Food Not Bombs for all their decades of work helping the unhoused and hungry. I'm going to refer you to another city council member and the mayor of Nevada City, California, Renette Sinem. She did a presentation on why the rush to 5G, and she says 4G in part, and 5G in the public right of way is a corporate and hostile takeover of our public right of way and with no concern for public health and the environment. And Dr. Mercola wrote an article, I'll give you the 5G war, technology versus humanity. We should focus on preventing the deployment altogether. We should focus on preventing the deployment all over. This is dangerous microwave, millimeter wave radiation. Join with the mayor of Nevada City, California, Renette Senum, in joining the opposition to 5G and also sign on to the international appeal to stop 5G on Earth and in space. Thank you. Hi there, Monica McGuire, Santa Cruz County, 22 years, and we just had a really wonderful meeting with the EMF Santa Cruz, EMF Aware Santa Cruz group, and it was excellent, and most people didn't get to learn about it, so I wanted to make sure it was available to more than just all of you. My husband, uh, Dr. Carl Merritt, spoke and gave more up-to-date <coughs> information, and people looking up this website will be amazed at the incredible amount of information that is available about 5G and why we need the precautionary principle. And I wanna make sure that that's understood by everybody, as well as asking that people understand you have been looking at it from the standpoint that you have, and we're so grateful that you have taken that precaution already to put off the decision, and it's going so great that way. Additionally, there's more to talk about with the homeless issue, I believe, across the county, and uh, the entire county needs to be involved, and one of the other great ways that you've already worked on is bringing in the People Wisdom Group here, which I'm a part of, and the um, Center for Wise Democracy. So peoplewisdom.org, uh, I know most of you know about, but everyone else who doesn't yet, please do look into peoplewisdom.org. It's exciting to have ways that we can bring everybody together and have even opposing difficult conversations lead to unity and creating ways that we all see ways to go forward and hopefully assist you in your very difficult jobs with uh, all of these topics. Thank you so much. You'll, you'll be our last speaker. Good evening, uh, Darius Mosinine. I just want to mention there's enormous amount of confusion regarding uh, rent, rent control, evictions. A, uh, AB 1482, the statewide rent control law, does not apply to jurisdictions with existing rent control. So the emergency rent control that uh, was enacted way back in February of 2017 or and then uh, <clears throat> or 18 and then extended is still in place. 5%, 7%, two month relocation. It's still in place. AB 1482 will apply to those units that are not covered under the current rent control 
in Santa Cruz City. So just to dispel a lot of the confusion, the existing Santa Cruz City rent control laws supersede AB 1482. And um, at the risk of sounding like I'm making a commercial, um, for the folks that are getting eviction notices that are on Section 8 from Bixby, I have a two bedroom available now, and I have a one bedroom available in two weeks to a Section 8 tenant, so if you wanna to talk to me outside, I'll be out there. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and, um I'll go ahead and get your attention here. We're gonna go ahead and close oral communications for this evening. We have one item on tonight's agenda. It's a public hearing item for 190 West Cliff Drive. It's a coastal permit, design permit, special use permit, um, et cetera, that um, will be before us. Before we go ahead and jump right into that item, I'm gonna go ahead and allow for maybe a five minute trans, uh, sort of transition time for those who are here to speak during oral communications to find their way out and those who are here for this evening's item um, to settle in. So we'll go ahead and have about two or three minutes for that transition to take place. So if you're here, uh, that were, if you were here for oral communications, you're welcome to go ahead and leave at this time if you're not staying for the <coughs> evening item. Okay, if I could get your attention, please. If I could get your attention, please, again. Thank you very much. All right, we'll go ahead and reconvene our meeting. If I could get your attention, if you wanna continue your conversation, you're welcome to do so outside of council chambers. We're calling our evening session back to order. Um, before we get started, it looks like I have a question here from yeah, Councilman McGovern. Absolutely, so um, thank you, first of all. Um, the Situation that's going on over at Bixby Street, we can't talk about it too much, but um, hearing from so many people in the community, especially after the motion I made two weeks ago for us to be able to do something to protect them, which is exacerbated over the last two weeks, I really think it is in our, it's our duty essentially to enact an emergency movement now, tonight if possible, uh, and then if uh, I would like to turn to the city attorney and find out if there's a way for us to take action tonight on figuring out ways to protect people from further displacement and at least ease the fears of there being potential uh, evictions between now and two weeks from now. Mr. Condotti. Uh, the problem I would see is that I've only been given the language this evening. I haven't had a chance to review it. Um, but I, I have spoken to Council Member Brown and I do think we'll have something uh, available for the council uh, on the 29th meeting that the council, if there's support for it, could enact as an emergency measure. measure. But my question is, is there, um, is there a process in which tonight we could do it? Is there an emergency, like I, I think with, with emergency movements, it takes five votes. Is, is that possible to do tonight or? Um, procedurally it is, um, but I'm, from what I've heard, most of the tenants have received 60 day notices um, and so I think there's time to put this together by the 29th that shouldn't affect tenants who have not, um, in the, if the notice just went out at the beginning of the month when the governor signed. I, I understand that yeah. timeline, except that in the last two weeks, more people have, been, have left. They've physically moved out of the, the property since, uh, since those two weeks ago when I made the initial motion, which we failed to move on. So is there a way tonight that we could do it? And if so, can you just elaborate for us what that is? The charter provides, and I can look that uh, language up real quick here. Thank you. Apologize for the delay. I wasn't planning on doing this, everyone, that's why. An ordinance declared by the city council to be necessary as an emergency measure for preserving the public peace, health, safety, or property and containing a statement of the reasons for its urgency may be introduced and adopted at one and the same meeting if passed by at least five affirmative votes. So if the council um, could put together emergency findings um, to incorporate into the draft language, which merely mirrors the language of um, the state statute that was recently enacted by the legislature, and if there's support on the council for um, for adopting such an ordinance as an emergency measure, then 
it's conceivable that you could do it as an emergency. Thank you. So before we move on, um, I would like to make a motion to enact an emergency measure based off of the evidence provided tonight by the individuals that made the statements uh, about their imminent displacement, as well as the evidence from the last two weeks of those that have been displaced physically from their location of residence to enact uh, the language that was, I guess, is there, uh, that mirrors the uh, state language. I don't know if that's the right way to frame it, but. There's a motion by Councilmember Glover. Second. second. Second by Councilmember Crone. Mr. Kondite, can you read the uh, policy again, please? Yes, this sorry. is not an agendized item, and if it's going to be on um, <clears throat> a future meeting. Um, Any or ordinance meeting? declared by the City Council to be necessary as an emergency measure for preserving the public peace, health, safety, or property, and containing a statement of the reasons for its urgency may be introduced and adopted at one and the same meeting if passed by at least five affirmative votes. As I am thinking about it, however, I would note that um, the Brown Act requires different emergency findings, and so I would need to review those findings as well before, um, before we could um, move forward. Because I think, for instance, the council could call a special meeting on 24 hours notice and have something in, in effect by tomorrow if that's the pleasure of the council. We also don't have an ordinance before us to review, so I think I'm confused as to whether or not we could pass an ordinance we haven't written or have before I, us. I share that concern, but I've been responding to the council members' questions with regard to whether as a, as a, as a legal matter we could adopt it, such an ordinance as an emergency. But I agree with you that um, I don't have that ordinance ready for you to adopt right now. It's been prepared in a draft form that mirrors the language of state law practically verbatim. So it needs to be incorporated into a format that um, applies to the city as opposed to applies statewide. Okay, Councilman McGlover. So um, I would be happy to change the motion to prioritize uh, the scheduling of an emergency meeting tomorrow uh, October 23rd, and I understand uh, in order to discuss this review, the submitted language, and uh, discuss the implementation of emergency action, specifically because if we wait another week even, who knows what's going to happen, people are living in fear, they're being displaced from their homes, and uh, I think it's our duty as elected officials to take action as soon as possible, which sounds like tomorrow is the day. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I'd just like to say that um, Myself and Councilmember Brown met with a number of the tenant advocates who've been working on this over the weekend, and they brought it to our attention and asked if we would um, contact the mayor and get in touch with her to get this on our emergency meeting that's coming up on the 29th. Um, we went and spoke with her today, expressing their concerns, which is why she was mentioning that we are working on trying to get this on on the 29th. I think that I'm very much concerned about the situation that these tenants are in. I've gone by Bixby and spoken with them. I've been in constant contact with the advocates. Um, I think that for many of us currently, um, bringing this forward tomorrow would be problematic for a number of reasons. Um, I think in particular, the fact that many of us haven't finished drafting this language. Um, many of the council members haven't read the language that's being proposed. And so um, I think that some of my other colleagues, as much as I want to see this move forward as quickly as possible, I think that many of my other colleagues on here probably would not be in support of this. And if we're able to move forward at the pace that we're going and have this on the 29th, um, there might also be potential for retroactivity of this. And so I would just um, state that as, you know, why I'm probably not going to support this right now. Hey, Mr. Kondani? Yes, um, just to clarify, having reviewed the applicable provisions of the Brown Act, the council cannot take action tonight. It would have to be on 24 hours notice at a minimum. Okay, <clears throat> that makes sense. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Well, um, as much as I would really like to do this tonight or within 24 hours, I have to say that it's not possible for me to be present tomorrow for a vote, which makes it a challenge to get the votes, I imagine, um, one. And two, I think um, the language that we have provided to Mr. Condotti does not include some additional language and I, um, that I heard in our <laughs> oral communications related to the nullification of prior notices, um, which would um, 
require a little, I think a little more work and um, could protect people who are, have already received those notices. So um, my preference would be that we sort it out and have it prepared to, to consider on the 29th. Given this information, week. yeah, not two weeks. No, appreciate that. Given this information, do you want to withdraw your motion at this time? Um, no, uh, I'm going to maintain the motion for a 24 hour emergency uh, meeting for tomorrow. I can understand the perspectives of my colleagues. However, uh, we could have acted on this two weeks ago and we failed to. to at least two people have been physically left for their homes. They're homeless. People are living out of their cars right now because of our failure to act. And even if we need to spend five hours sitting with an attorney, reviewing the language and figuring out what the ordinance needs to read like, we should do that in order to protect the residents of our community, which we have failed to do since we were elected in, since I was elected in November, and that's uh, unacceptable in many, many regards. Okay, so the motion before us was, uh, the original motion was to make the emergency findings and to make that policy decision this evening. Given the information, that's not possible. So the new motion, if I understand you correctly, is to schedule an emergency meeting within 24 hours. Is that tomorrow, correct? Tomorrow night, correct. Is the seconder of the motion still supportive of that? Yeah, and um, let's call the question. There's a lot of folks waiting uh, for this evening's uh, agenda item. Okay. Unless there's any further discussion, we'll, we'll just go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. So that fails with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Myers voting against, and Councilmember Cronin and Glover voting for. Okay, we'll go ahead and move right on then to our uh, regularly scheduled item this evening, and Mayor. we'll invite uh, Councilmember Matthews. Uh, would it be fair to say that, um, to just give public notice that we fully intend to agendize this? It, we fully intend to agendize this. And, this was and to be me. as aggressive as possible on retroactivity and other protections. Totally fair to say that. Thank you for that. Absolutely. And that will be, that was brought to my attention this morning, as I had mentioned, there's been conversations around drafting the language that will be on our, we happen to have a special meeting scheduled for next Tuesday. And so that will be incorporated into the agenda. This, and so that was agreed upon. Thank you very much. Okay. May I just add also that we are following up with any of the Bixby residents. There are particular circumstances or issues that we can be of assistance between, between now and uh, whatever situation they're in that's uh, coming forward as well. I appreciate hearing that. Thank you very much. Can I ask a real quick question on that? Yes, we um, who should yes. people contact? Uh, Sarah Fleming actually is who uh, is, uh, I've got some contact information about some residents who if they want to talk to, uh, it's a planning department, Sarah Fleming is a person. She had reached out to uh, Jorge at, at one point, but yes, so if, if people have issues or concerns, they can reach out to staff and we're happy to assist them in whatever way we can. So any of the members of the community who were here on behalf of the Big Speed situation, they can reach out to the city um, planning department. Sarah Fleming is available to support you correct. at this time. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in um, a week from today, and at this time now we'll move forward with the evening item. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the City, and uh, tonight we're talking about the 190 Westcliff Drive proposal. The property there at the corner of Bay Street has served as an underutilized surface parking lot for a number of decades now. It was formerly the site of a hospital uh, from 1924 to 1967, and that building was demolished in 1980. In the mid-2000s, the City Council approved a new conference center development on this lot and the Dream Inn Hotel across the street, but that decision was appealed to the Coastal Commission, who never acted on the project after the developer withdrew that application. We're here now 14 years later, and um, we have another development proposal before you. It's a mixed use project containing two levels of subgrade parking, ground floor commercial. Can I pause you for just sure. one second? If you have a sign in the back, please lower your sign so to not obstruct the view of the people behind you. So if your sign is being held up, could you please lower your sign no higher than your shoulders to not obstruct the view of the people behind you? Please continue. <laughs> Of course. It's a mixed use proposal with two levels of subgrade parking, ground floor commercial, and 89 residential condominium units. Um, some of the things that we've heard in the community, uh, a lot of them relate to the affordable housing portion of the project, and so I wanted to touch on that for a moment. Um, there are 11% of the base project's units um, proposed as affordable to very low income residents. And that is those making 50% of the area median income. 
The project is eligible for a 35% density bonus and a height waiver pursuant to our local ordinance and the allowance of which is mandated by state law. We saw a number of comments from the public about this project not having enough affordable housing, and I wanna clarify a few things related to that. Um, so state law expressly indicates that for density bonus projects, the percentage of affordable units is based on the base project. In this case, the base project is 66 units, and that is the number of units that's allowed without the density bonus. So the percentage of affordable units that's required to achieve the density bonus is based on the 66 units, not the 89 units that are proposed um, with the density bonus. This is state law. We don't have discretion over applying the density, the affordability requirements to the 89 units. Um, We've also heard that the density bonus and our affordable or inclusionary housing ordinance should be additive or stacked on one another so that the number of affordable units needed to qualify for the state density bonus should be above and beyond the already required inclusionary housing units. There is a, a case law that applies to the city. It's Latinos Unidos versus the county of Napa. And that expressly precludes this stacking of density bonus and inclusionary. And so we have to treat those together um, and aren't able to, to stack them on top of one another. <clears throat> During various community meetings and in written public comments, we've heard from many individuals in the community regarding this project. Um, on the, the support side of things, we've heard uh, about the affordable housing that the project is providing. We've heard um, support for the development of the site and for the commercial amenities. Um, on the concern side, we've heard about traffic and parking and noise, emergency vehicle access, water availability, cliff stability, building height, and various other issues. We appreciate those concerns, we take them very seriously, and it's understandable that the community has these concerns. Um, when we went to the Planning Commission, we had over 1,200 pages of documentation for their review, and we've provided additional documentation to the council here. Um, environmental review has been conducted as part of this project, and it's it has been a thorough review. We have prepared technical reports, including but not limited to recent reports on traffic, noise, vibration, geotechnical analysis, archeology, span stormwater control, and various other subjects. Um, as a result, we've incorporated various standard measures into our conditions of approval, as is typical for new development projects. Our team has carefully analyzed the project proposal and as detailed in the staff report, we believe that the project meets the objective standards set forth in the city ordinances. And there are some new state laws in effect that have implications for projects that meet objective standards and we're happy to talk to the council uh, about that in more detail if you have questions about it later. We've had many departments and outside consultants working diligently on this application. We've got a, a team here with us this evening. Um, Ryan Bain is the senior planner who served as the project manager on this. Eric Marlat, our assistant director of planning and community development oversaw the work. Um, Bonnie Lipscomb will be with us, our economic development director, Chris Schneider, our assistant director of public works. We have Stephanie Strilo with Dudek and Associates. She led the environmental analysis team. And then we have several um, attorneys who are with us as well. In addition to our uh, city attorney, Tony Gandhati, we have Sabrina Teller. She's an attorney with Remy Moose Manley who advises us on CEQA issues. And we also have Barbara Kautz, an attorney with Goldfarb Lippman, who advises us on density bonus and inclusionary law. So with that, I will turn it over to Ryan Bain to talk to you a little bit about the details of the project. Good evening. Um, gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, what we have is a 2.2 acre uh, project site that's located on the northwest corner of uh, Bay Street and Westcliff Drive. Um, to the west and to the north, you can see we have a uh, mobile home park. Um, to the north and to the east, we have um, hotel uses as well as, and then to the south, we have uh, uh, multifamily uh, townhomes or condos. Um, as you can see, there is a mix of uh, visitor serving commercial and residential areas that characterize the beach area to the north of the site and mainly residential uses that are found to the south of the project site. Um, as you can see, this, the site is currently an at-grade uh, parking lot with associated uh, landscaping. 
So as Lee mentioned, the proposal is for a four-story mixed-use project, uh, two levels of underground parking, um, commercial space, uh, a public plaza, and 89-unit uh, residential condominiums. Um, in terms of what's <coughs> involved with the entitlements, um, we have a design permit, coastal permit, special use permit, uh, density bonus, encroachment permit, and tentative map. Both the density bonus and tentative map require council approval. Um, therefore, um, the, and the Planning Commission made recommendations to the council. The project was heard by the Planning Commission on, on August 15th, um, where they recommended approval on a 3-2 vote. Um, in addition to the approval, there was some direction given by the Planning Commission um, regarding um, augmenting the CEQA checklist, uh, as well as some added conditions of approval. Um, in regards to the CEQA checklist, they wanted it to incorporate a noise impact analysis that also looked at vibration impacts. So that was prepared uh, between the Planning Commission uh, and the City Council meeting tonight. Um, also, uh, there were conditions regarding uh, trying to, um, uh, the feasibility of moving some of the trees that are on the site, um, as well as some conditions regarding um, opaque uh, deck railings, uh, pro uh, providing an internal traffic management plan as part of the conditions of approval, um, that the project be LEED Gold certified to ensure energy efficiency and access, maintaining access to Wi-Fi for the uh, Clearview Court um, mobile home park uh, adjacent to the site. And I'll, I'll uh, touch on some of those uh, items uh, later in the presentation. So the subject parcel uh, general plan designation is RVC, Regional Visitor Commercial. Um, this designation applies to areas um, that emphasize a variety of commercial uses that serve Santa Cruz residents as well as visitors. Uh, Mixed-use development is strongly encouraged in RVC districts, so that's something that this project meets. Um, the beach area, which is um, is to emphasize visitors serving commercial uses, such as hotels, motels, restaurants, and amusement parks, as well as residential and mixed-use developments in the beach area neighborhood. Um, the flow area ratio that's listed or allowed in this uh, general plan designation is from 0.25 to 3.5. Uh, this project uh, comes in at a little over two. So it's within that range. There are numerous uh, general plan policies that this project uh, meets and upholds. I don't want to go through all of them, but I'll just read a couple of them that I think are key. Um, one being in neighborhoods near visitor areas, give priority to uses that serve both visitors and residents. Um, encourage higher intensity residential uses and maximum, maximum densities in accordance with the general plan land use designations. So those. All of these policies are being met by this project. Um, in terms of economic development policies, um, a couple of key ones, encourage development of year-round business and visitor activities, resources, and destinations that can also attract and engage local residents. Uh, encourage the development of new lodging facilities, particularly those targeting a higher-end market and those providing additional visitor amenities. So uh, the project is meeting those as well. A um, couple other ones uh, provide for residents daily shopping needs in local serving neighborhood commercial centers um, with, the, with the commercial portions of the project that are included that, that meets that um, policy. Uh, also support the development of neighborhood gathering places in conjunction with local serving neighborhood commercial. Again, with the plaza, the public plaza that's being proposed and the commercial um, uh, amenities that are being proposed, that meets that policy. The project is also part of the, and included in the Beach and South of Laurel Comprehensive Area Plan. Um, it's specifically located in the beach commercial sub area of the plan. Um, that includes the Santa Cruz boardwalk, um, motels, beds, bed and breakfast, and commercial uses. Um, this project site was listed as an opportunity site for residential in that Beach and South of Laurel Plan, and it maximizes development potential for an underutilized infill site, which is currently a parking lot. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Some of the policies that are listed uh, in the Beach and South of Laurel Plan, uh, the project meets um, all of these policies. I don't want to go through all of them, but certainly um, mentions multi-level large-scale development uh, to ensure general upgrading of entire beach area, or I'm sorry, multi-level large-scale development to optimize use of opportunity uses. Um, 
locating parking lots to the rear of structures and wherever possible underground, uh, the project does that as well. Um, also includes balconies, terraces, and courtyards and similar outdoor spaces. Um, in regards to the zoning district, it's RTB per. Um, this zoning district uh, is kind of unique to this parcel. Um, the history kind of behind it, um, it was zoned this as part of the Beaches Health of Laurel Plan when it was adopted in 1998. My understanding is that there was significant public input as part of the adoption of the Beach and South of Laurel Plan. And a lot of that um, public input did not want to have any hotel um, rooms on this site. So this, this zoning was basically crafted specifically for this site and um, basically limits it to ancillary hotel support facilities and residential development. So um, let's see. So the, the purpose of this overlay district is to establish and control uses to ensure development, which protects neighborhood integrity and supporting appropriate uses. And the goal of the district is to limit the future development of hotel or motel rooms in the district, but to allow ancillary hotel support facilities, as well as additional residential development. So what's being proposed here is uh, amenities for a larger hotel to dream in which a lot of larger hotels, common amenities are fitness gyms, spas, restaurants, cafe, and small retail components. So that's what's being included as part of this project. Um, this this kind of shows a good um, layout of the general uses in the area. As you can see, in the, to the north of the site um, is mostly beach commercial. Um, to the south is mostly um, is residential. So this is kind of a right in between. It's a transition area. And so the proposed mixed use of residential and commercial really is a good hybrid um, for that transition area. Um, just kind of going through some of the different levels of the, of the proposal. Um, this is the, the lowest floor. This is mainly for hotel and commercial valet. Um, there's there's 200 there's 217 hotel um, stalls. It's going to be replacing the 216 that are currently on the site. Um, so these this will be available for the commercial and and hotel um, um, folks that are going to be visiting the hotel and visiting the site. Um, the, the level P1 parking is strictly for resi the residents of the of the uh, proposed um, project. Um, so they'll have assigned parking as well as um, also provides a uh, bike storage and, and general storage for the residents. Um, at ground level, um, kind of just to give a general idea of the site plan layout, um, we have West Cliff to the east, Bay Street to the south. Um, there's two driveway entrances um, along the west and north. Um, the coastal plaza and commercial areas are all generally open to West Cliff and um, adjacent to the hotel, while um, we have the guest parking here to the rear. Also along the south, along the Bay Street, we have um, multi-level units that basically mimic the multi-level um, townhomes that are directly across the street. Um, this is level two, which is mainly all residential. There's a fitness and yoga for the residents, um, as well as a pool. Here's on the level three. It's also courtyards that are uh, available and open space for the residents. And we have level four, the same thing. And then on the roof, um, there are proposed roof decks um, for access um, that access the, uh, the top floor um, units. Um, the subject of rooftop decks was discussed um, at the Planning Commission hearing. Um, there are, as you can see, there are roof structures proposed that extend above the roof height of 47 feet, including stairway housing um, for access to those decks, as well as um, trellises that house photovoltaic panels. Uh, also, there are safety railings for those rooftop decks. Um, our zoning ordinance does have a section that allows architectural features to exceed the height limit. Um, and additionally, the Beach and South of Laurel Plan um, calls for flat roof buildings 
to incorporate porches and window overhangs, trellises, walls, and art to basically enhance articulation to, to avoid a, a bare box appearance. So staff um, thur thoroughly analyzed the wording of this section, which is discussed in detail in the council report. Um, we concluded these elements fall under the height limits modification section of the ordinance and, and would therefore be permitted. Um, we found that rooftop decks really are an efficient way of providing open space for multifamily um, projects. There's been several that have improved, that have been approved at city projects in the recent past. And um, the interpretation was discussed at the planning commission hearing and the majority of the commissioners agreed that with staff's interpretation and supported the uh, open space on the, uh, on the roof. So this is, um, this is a look from West Cliff across from Dream Inn. Um, the proposed building has been designed um, in a Spanish colonial style. It's consistent with the previously listed uh, Beach and South of Laurel area plan design guidelines. This is a look uh, looking toward the ocean from Bay. Um, you can see the overall massing is broken up by some architectural treatments, including decks and trellises and overhangs. Um, utility installations and enclosures, storage units and parking are all within the building and so they're all screened from view. This so is just a quick look at the north and west elevations. Um, and then here is a site section. So the maximum height of buildings in the RTB zone uh, is 36 feet. Um, however, um, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a density bonus that's being requested as part of this. And as part of that density bonus, um, it, the tools are to incentivize affordable housing um, and deeper levels of affordability. Um, one incentive is that the applicant can use like a waiver or a modification to development standards. And if those standards would physically preclude construction of the density bonus project. Um, for this project, the applicants are proposing a waiver to the district height um, standard to allow for an additional story, um, bringing the overall height of the building to 47 feet. Um, this height will be similar to the multiple family residential condominium complex across Bay that is 48 feet in height, um, but will obviously fall well below the Dream Inn, um, which is uh, approximately 83 feet in height. I was, I was also just gonna mention, so, while the neighboring 20-foot-tall um, hotels to the north, as well as the, the mobile homes, which are generally, I would say, approximately 12 feet in height, are much smaller in scale, um, the proposed structure does maintain a 25 to 28-foot setback to avoid looming over those uh, adjacent structures, which is about double uh, what the required setback is. So in terms of the zoning development standards, as I mentioned, the maximum height is 36. With the density bonus, height waiver, they're proposing 47 feet. The setbacks are all being met or exceeded. Um, Off-street parking is all being met or exceeded, uh, as well as the open space requirements. Um, another, um, there's other standards as well that I'll have on the next slide, but um, this was also a discussion at the planning commission meeting was the interpretation of a section of our ordinance regarding the setback for a third story element. Um, as you can see here, this is taking a look from the, the west elevation looking down Bay Street toward the ocean. You can see the first and second floor here um, have a have a, about approximately eight foot setback. And then the third floor is set back um, an additional, I think seven feet or so. <coughs> So this is the section that was discussed um, in terms of the, and kind of um, discussed about the interpretation of it, um, about third story element being um, stepped back from the two story element by at least 15 feet from the property lines at the street. So um, the section is poorly written and <laughs> not very clear. And we discussed this early on in the project and, and in part of, as part of the review process. So we provided a detailed analysis of that wording in the staff report, and staff has concluded that the third story element maintains a minimum 15 setback from the property lines that border the streets. That's how we're interpreting it. Um, they're providing a 15 foot nine inch, so it's certainly meeting that setback. Um, and as I mentioned, the third story, third story is stepped back from the second story. 
Um, in terms of landscaping, um, there's currently a total of 55 trees located on the project site, 17 of which are heritage trees uh, pursuant to our city regulations. Um, they are, the project would retain five existing trees um, in place, as well as save a Mexican fan palm, which will be moved um, to the plaza. Um, the project's proposed tree and planting plan, plan will include a total of 33 new trees on site. Um, so this um, more than exceeds the two to one replanting ratio uh, with 24 and 36 inch box trees. Um, and uh, additionally, a condition of approval has been um, added at the request of the Planning Commission um, that requires applicants to look into the feasibility of moving some of these trees uh, based on um, their condition. Uh, in regards to traffic, um, a project traffic analysis um, was completed by Pinnacle Traffic Engineering, which evaluated impacts to seven intersections. Um, the analysis evaluates impacts um, with proposed installation of a signal or mini roundabout at the West Cliff and Bay Street intersection. Um, all the study intersections are currently operating within the acceptable um, level of service during the weekday PM peak hour based on city and Caltrans standards, uh, except at this uh, Bay and West Cliff intersection, which is currently operating at LOSE. Um, the intersection would operate at LOSB during the weekday PM peak hour with the installation of a signal and at LOS uh, A to B with installation of a mini roundabout. Um, the city's public works department requested uh, a qualitative evaluation of the pros and cons between a signal and a roundabout from a traffic consultant. And the, the, they determined that they would uh, recommend that they do the, the mini roundabout um, based on a few of these um, reasonings, um, reduced flows and delays, slower but more consistent traffic flow. Um, they feel it's safer than a signal, um, better pedestrian experience, and uh, less greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a coastal permit, as I mentioned, is part of um, the entitlements for this. Um, the, um, the project protects coastal resources such as views. It's not located in any sensitive habitats. Um, coastal access will be improved with road improvements. Um, the plaza will provide public access and um, the ancillary hotel facilities will provide new visitor um, serving amenities. Um, special permit is also part of the entitlements. Um, this is required for all um, hotel support uses and cooperative parking. Um, I should mention, so we have the market hall, food services, the cafe, spa and retail. So those all fall under the umbrella of a special use permit. Um, which provides, all of these provide um, important visitor serving uses. Uh, I was just gonna mention that um, alcohol service is not included as part of this um, special use permit. Um, one thing that we discussed after the planning commission meeting in regards to um, special use permit is in the future, what type of uses could potentially come in down the line. It may not always be a cafe if that goes out or something like that. So we, we we're proposing to add a condition of approval that kind of addresses that. So staff can have some leeway in terms of if someone comes in with some type of a use, say, um, you know, surfboard rental or something like that, we can propose to um, send that to the planning commission for approval. Um, also under the special use permit, uh, is uh, the cooperative parking facilities. Um, so the parking demand accounts for all uses at the hotel, as well as the residential units, um, which qualifies it for a reduction for cooperative parking. Um, so the shared use cooperative parking facilities reduction accounts for the parking facilities at a single site being used for multi-purpose trips. So folks that are visiting the hotel also are using the amenities as well as residents that are there will use the amenities. So um, there's, a, there's obviously a cooperative and overlap there between the uses. Um, the planning director touched a little bit on, on density bonus, um, but I'll give, I'll kind of go over some of the, some of the details. Um, so 
as you're aware, to address California's need for affordable housing, um, the state enacted the density bonus law in 1979 to encourage the provision of affordable housing using this by offering a combination of benefits to developers. Um, the amount of the density bonus is based on the number of affordable units at each income level that are included in a project. Um, and to determine whether a project qualifies for a density bonus, the percentage of affordable units is based on the maximum number of units that would be permitted under the city's zoning code or base density, which in this case is 66. Um, projects providing a, a higher amount of affordable units at a deeper level of affordability are entitled to a range of increases in density, ranging from five to 35%. Um, so the additional units, um, the general idea is they help offset the increased costs associated um, with the increased number of more deeply affordable units. Um, in addition to allowing more market rate units to offset the cost of providing affordable units, the law also provides a variety of tools that can help to um, utilize to make projects physically or more economically feasible, including waivers. As I mentioned, they're requesting a height waiver um, to allow for those additional 23 units. Um, in this, for this particular project, they're proposing um, eight very low income units and two low income units um, based on that 35% density bonus, as I mentioned, which allows an addition of 23 units. Um, uh, I should mention that cities have very limited discretion when reviewing um, density bonus applications and are required to approve these if they, if they meet the affordability requirements. Um, Lee touched on the stacking. So that this was discussed at the Planning Commission meeting. Um, but as you can see, there's, there's case law that does not allow the stacking um, of both density bonus and um, inclusionary units. There was um, quite a bit of community outreach for the project. Um, even early on, there were, um, before I think they even had an application with the city, um, there was outreach from the applicants um, as early as I think June of 2017. Um, there were two community meetings or, um, organized that the city was involved with, one on December 3rd, where there were approximately 150 members, and then on a second one on July 10th, um, where there were approximately 60 attendees. Um, in addition to the community meetings, a project webpage was created and posted it on the City of Santa Cruz website um, that allows for members of the public to submit comments. Um, and uh, staff, planning commission, subcommittee, um, we all attended these meetings. Um, environmental review. Um, again, Lee touched a little bit on this. I know there's been a lot of discussion about whether an ER should be prepared. Um, really, the purpose of CEQA is to analyze a project, uh, determine the impacts, and mitigate any potential impacts. Um, CEQA law also discusses streamlining that process whenever possible. So we've done the full analysis of what would generally be included in an EIR uh, and determined that the existing environmental documents already provided an adequate analysis of potential environmental impacts. Um, CEQA also allows the lead agency to avoid repeating analysis that were already provided in a certified general plan EIR for development project that is consistent with the general plan, which this project is. Um, we have public resources code 2108.3.3, um, and that's a parallel CEQA guideline provision section 15183 that provide for streamlined environmental reviews for projects consistent with the general plan. Um, that was certified. And so um, the application of CECA will be limited to effects on the environment which are peculiar to the parcel or to the project and which were addressed as significant effect and were not addressed as significant effects in the prior environmental impact report or which substantial new information shows will be more significant than described in the prior environmental impact report. So an effect of a project upon the environment shall not be considered peculiar to the project if a uniformly applied development policy or standard will substantially mitigate the environmental effect. Um, as I had mentioned at the Planning Commission, there was discussion of uh, a request to have a noise study prepared. Uh, that, that noise analysis and vibration analysis was prepared. 
following the Planning Commission hearing. Um, the, the study touches on operational noise generated by the project, as well as noise and vibration during construction activities. Um, based uh, operational noise associated with the project, as well as construction noise and vibration are, are predicted to comply with the City of Santa Cruz noise standards and will be required to do so for, uh, for the conditions of approval. So based on the secret review, it's been determined that the city's general plan uh, ERR, as well as the city, city's uniformly applied development standards uh, have adequately addressed the issues and no further environmental review is required. Um, <clears throat> following the planning commission, um, we did go over a few um, conditions of approval that, that we thought might be appropriate to be added. Um, Given the level of discussion um, regarding construction impacts, uh, new construction hours, a new construction hours condition has, has been, rec been recommended to be added. Um, um, also, condition number 22, um, which has reference to um, excavating materials, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it basically reads that, uh, let's see. I think the, the condition originally read that excavating materials should be not allowed between the hours of 7 to 9 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. due to peak traffic hours on weekdays. However, after further discussion with our public works department, it was determined that the restrictions on hauling will likely extend the project excavation to more days and be more costly. So with p.m. peak hours generally being greater, recommending that the a.m. peak restriction be removed and that the condition be revised to read that hauling will be allowed from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. So that's a recommendation that staff has provided. Um, another <clears throat> condition that we're proposing is, let's see. So the city's municipal code allows a 10% reduction for non-automotive use programs. So the applicant has prepared a transportation demand management plan that aligns measures to be implemented, including provisions of on-site bicycle parking, free employee passes, among other strategies. Among other strategies. So we did receive some questions uh, about the transportation demand management, demand management plan um, from Vice Mayor Cummings. And, and based on those conversations, are proposing to add this condition to ensure the success of the program. Um, basically, it kind of quantifies um, the, res uh, the requirements of the transportation demand management to make sure it's working. So therefore, staff is uh, recommending that the council acknowledge the environmental determination, uh, approve the coastal permit, design permit, special use permit, density bonus request to exceed height, encroachment permit for street and intersection improvements, and tentative map for the proposed project based on the findings and conditions that we've provided. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. I um, failed to mention when we first started the item that what we have before us is a public hearing for a land use application. This is not an appeal. So I wanna just sort of explain to the community and those in the chambers the process. So we've had our uh, staff presentation and unless there's any burning questions from the council, we'll go ahead and have the 20 minute um, uh, applicant presentation. And then at which time we'll uh, allow council members to ask any uh, clarifying questions. And then we'll go ahead and open it up to the public. I know members of the community as groups requested additional time. Um, since there isn't an uh, appellant or there's nobody appealing this, it would just go uh, to our, our general process around group, group presentations, which is four minutes for group presentations. If members of your group want to um, take kind of the torch as you, if you will, um, and, and, and final kind of comments in terms of the presentation, if you weren't able to complete it within the four minutes, um, that's been a common practice. So you're welcome to do that. So again, uh, we've concluded our uh, uh, staff presentation. We're gonna go ahead and open it up to have the 20 minute, up to 20 minute um, uh, application presentation, at which time we'll go ahead and uh, go to our group presentations. So do we have the applicant uh, ready and prepared for up to 20 minutes to um, make their presentation? Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Cam Baboff. I'm the founder and chairman of Ensemble Real Estate. 
the uh, owner and of Dreaming and the applicant in this application. Um, first, I want to thank uh, the staff for the uh, hard work the last several years in culminating this application, getting it to uh, this point. And second, I'd like to thank, <coughs> excuse me, the city council for considering this project. We love Santa Cruz, as most of you know. And we're happy to be here tonight to present this project and take the opportunity at this time to give you a history of the, our ownership of the Dream Inn and my colleagues will uh, <clears throat> get into the project descriptions. Um, as most of you know, we purchased the Dream Inn, um, which at the time was called the Coast Hotel in 2006. Um, the property was in uh, very bad physical condition and doing poorly. We saw the potential and the uh, uniqueness of the property and went about our plans <clears throat> to make these badly required uh, improvements. We closed the hotel in 2008 and then in 2009 and completed a top to bottom rebuilding and refurbishment. And then with the community input and a lot of involvement, we restored the original name, which was the Dream Inn. <clears throat> I won't go into the suggestions of names, which was we had a lot of funny suggestions at the time. One of them was, uh, yeah, I won't go into that. <laughs> um, we are um, we're very proud of our ownership and stewardship of this very important community asset, which is the way we view this, this hotel. And we continue to improve, improve the property as demonstrated by another major refurbishment in 2017-18 and the addition of the Jack O'Neill Bar and Grill uh, earlier this year. We are also very proud <clears throat> that the Dream Inn provides 175 full-time union job. Well, we are the only union hotel in Santa Cruz, and we routinely support a number of community and charitable organizations in Santa Cruz. While providing more than over $1.8 million, $1 million in TOT taxes, which is almost 18% of the entire TOT collected by the city of Santa Cruz. We are committed to the city, we are committed to the community in the long term, and that's why we're here presenting this uh, housing project for your consideration. Um, I think we, our staff, and uh, you know, headed by Tyson Sales, has worked very hard to engage the community over the last uh, two to three years, with several meetings, uh, numerous that I've attended some, and uh, we've worked <coughs> to incorporate the suggestion changes in response to the community concern. Um, at this point, um, unless there's any question, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Tyson Sales to go over the particulars of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me see how we switch this over to the presentation. All right. Okay, there we are. Okay, just technical difficulties, sorry. the presentation here okay, here we are uh, thank you uh, to the uh, thank you madam mayor and the city council members and I'd like to thank staff for doing a thorough job we're pleased to speak here I'm not going to take the full time I'm going to reserve any additional time to the end to uh, rebuttal I'm going to speak up for about 10 minutes we're here to provide a brief recap of the project and then to address some of the most salient points specifically the outreach process housing affordability, sustainability, and traffic improvement measures. So this is a view of what the project will look like when it's complete instead of a parking lot. Um, it's a collection of four-story buildings with a variety of materials, and I wanted to highlight the uh, one-story commercial building in the front is actually going to be made of rammed earth, um, a lot of which is going to uh, come from the site itself. Uh, uh, we have an open ground floor with a big plaza, so it's a highly articulated design, very special one of a kind, site context, um, uh, highly sustainable, not a big block. The project has been designed to align with the Beach and South Laurel uh, area plan, general plan and coastal plan, and staff has done an excellent job of pointing out. Um, this is a brief timeline of the project, project progress. Our efforts actually began four years ago um, with uh, initial discussions, informal discussions, and involved considerably over time with dozens of studies and reports done in 
response to a thorough planning process. The uh, community outreach, the first large meeting which was done prior to submitting an application was in 2017. Um, we did some visioning exercises back in 2016 with meeting various stakeholders, local retailers, makers, bike groups, transit groups, <coughs> affordable housing groups, and a few neighbors. The first large public outreach meeting was in 2017, and that's led us to a series of meetings. And I um, just wanted to briefly go through uh, the exercise that we went through. Our first major community meeting was back in June. 2017, at the time we were proposing a modern architectural design from a San Francisco architect. And in response to the community feedback, we literally decided to start over with the design from the project from scratch. So this has been a, a long evolution. Initially, our plans in 2015 um, did have uh, a, a much smaller plaza. The plaza has evolved to become larger, more open space. We hired a new team, a uh, new designer, and went to head down a different path. Since then, we've had more than 70 meetings, both formal and informal, including the two large formal community meetings that planning took part in in December of 2018, July of this year. Um, but prior to that, a lot of small informal meetings. And it's been very helpful to get input and listen, answer questions and provide answers. And we heard loud and clear at our first meetings that there was a lot of concerns from our neighbors. And since then, we've set up meetings um, with uh, neighbors, specifically with Clearview Court and the, t and the uh, West Cliff Villas townhouses, including meetings with our chairman earlier this year. And I briefly wanted to go through some of the items that we uh, changed in those projects, in this project in response to those meetings. Um, we've increased the setbacks. Um, we also uh, committed to move the rear fence line with Clearview Court by about 18 inches to increase the yards, which in some cases uh, their windows are two feet away from the current fence. Um, that was really all we could do with still accommodating all the parking and everything in the building, but we're actually creating uh, larger yards for the residents and it also creates space to construct a more sturdy um, sound wall, which is not required by any noise studies, but something voluntarily we want to, to do. Um, we're arranging and paying for inspection, monitoring any repairs of any foundations if they are actually accidentally damaged during construction, but we're going to voluntarily um, do any foundation bolting um, that any residents uh, desire to have happen based upon inspection prior to construction. Um, and we're engaging third parties to monitor and address other impacts during construction. Um, as staff has mentioned, we've, uh, we've agreed vo uh, vo to a voluntary condition to add access for satellites to the roof, not just for Cruzio Wi-Fi, but also for residents if they want to uh, um, have uh, satellite repeaters for, um, uh, for, for free services like uh, television. That's also going to be available. So there's going to be a roof area so we can facilitate uh, that for uh, Clearview Court. Um, we removed a lighting fixture at the market hall. We've agreed and uh, we're designing the, mo the lighting for the project to cast light down and not out. And we've committed to noise standards that exceed the city standard. And we also conducted a whole series of additional studies that were not recommended by the um, CEQA checklist and the third party city consultant. Uh, uh, in some cases, we've uh, uh, provided ex extra studies like the uh, um, supplemental air quality analysis, supplemental shadow studies, and um, also uh, we've posted the answers to the specific questions that have come up in the public outreach sessions to an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, document that's been available online for a couple years now at the 190 West Cliff website, and we've updated that over time to try to address um, the questions that have come up in the public forums. Um, the project has been designed around a couple big ideas, as I mentioned in the intro. Um, we, the first and foremost is the project is, not, is a housing project with affordable housing on site that's available for sale to very low income residents, which happens to be the least served in Santa Cruz and also happens to align 
with the incomes the predominant they're predominant in hotel and service employees um, so the very low income units are as a deeper level of affordability than the city standard and I just want to point out that the city is expected via the state regional housing needs assessment to provide uh, at least 180 very low income units by 2023. And that's the current standard. It's actually being updated by Sacramento. There's newer, higher standards that are going to affect next year. But currently the city is, ex uh, is expected to provide 180 very low and it's well behind that. And eight doesn't sound like very much, but that's in comparison to 12, only 12 that have been added citywide over the past four years and zero for sale. So this is a, a very much needed housing type. Wanted to point out how deep the level of affordability is. And these are 2019 numbers. So these uh, numbers will change uh, if and when the project is approved and ultimately um, uh, units become, uh, homes become available uh, to the public. It'll, these payments will be based upon the mortgage uh, uh, HOA dues, insurance, and utilities at that time. But as of today, a two bedroom would be at $55,000 as the 50% median income uh, in the published Santa Cruz County um, uh, uh, housing affordability tables currently, which equates to a total payment of 1,381. And based upon today's mortgage rates, that would leave about $208,000 for, for, for a sale price. So we're talking about 142,000 for a one bedroom, 208 for a two bedroom, and 226 for a, uh, for a three bedroom. So, um, and that's in comparison to the city standard, which today is about 381 for a, two, for a one bedroom and 431 for a two bedroom. So it's significantly more affordable. Uh, the payments are significantly less at the 50% uh, AMI compared to the 80 to 100% AMI. Um, the, as the owners of the Dream Inn, we're very aware of local impacts of traffic on, excuse me, on our hotel as well as on the community. And we designed this project, excuse me, to be a part of the solution. <clears throat> and that's been a major premise of the project since its inception. And so over the past few years, we've hired multiple consultants, multiple traffic consultants to work with public works, including a roundabout expert, including um, local and national traffic experts, and took multiple traffic counts and worked with the uh, staff for over a year and a half to not just analyze the traffic, but to analyze potential solutions. And the result of that process is a commitment to, um, com to construct either a roundabout or a traffic signal. Both are analyzed and proposed in the CEQA document and ultimately it's city council's choice. The staff report is recommending the roundabout. Either would significantly improve traffic flows and delays and be a much safer option, but the, but, but the final solution choice is not dictated by us as the developer. It's the city council's choice. I did want to mention that as the applicant, we're voluntarily uh, creating a dedication. It would move the sidewalk line at the corner uh, about about eight to 10 feet for the micro roundabout. So that option is feasible and available only with this project um, because that intersection widening is taking um, land in addition to dollars. And the project is contributing $504,000 in traffic impact fees, which can also be directed towards the intersection. Um, Another major priority is uh, encouraging pedestrian bike use and making the site and the West Cliff Trail in this location safer for bikes and pedestrians. This project is, uh, we're voluntarily proposing to widen the bike lane and the sidewalk, and we're doing that by realigning West Cliff to take some of the frontage from the parking lot 
and dedicate that for uh, for, for uh, sidewalk purposes, a sidewalk easement in the site so that we can use the right of way to widen the bike lane and we can accomplish wider sidewalks. We're also undergrounding utilities, not just for the visual light, but to improve sight lines for cars and pedestrians and bikes and to remove obstructions from the sidewalk so that you don't have uh, baby strollers and segways going to the bike lane as they currently are. Um, so the goal here is to create a safer, more bike and pedestrian friendly environment, uh, as well as better moving cars through the area. Um, wanted to point out um, some of this, a few of the sustainability measures for the property. In addition to committing to a lead gold standard, we are incorporating gray water systems for landscaping, supplementary solar panels, or so, solar pa power, um, some uh, innovative water technology measures such as the buoy smart meters. And we're trying to pilot um, technology and use the plaza to tell a story about healthy outdoor lifestyles. We plan to use composting on the roof garden and try to you know exhibit a, a, you know a, a virtuous cycle and to showcase those technologies because we believe that uh, visitors as well as home buyers will enjoy being a part of the sustainable community and there's an opportunity to hear to tell a story about sustainable development through the uh, through, through the plaza um, the landscape side, we're integrating local and drought tolerant plants and the plaza is designed to be uh, similar in the planting vocabulary as the West Cliff Trail. And in conclusion, um, we fully recognize this project will have impacts. We, we get it. Um, we've worked hard to listen, adapt and meet the needs of the community as best as we can. Um, and we're bringing forward a project that has real meaningful deep affordability and we've worked hard with city staff to find a solution for traffic that we think is really gonna improve the quality of life out there for residents as well as the quality of life for the visitors of the hotel. This is a, uh, a long-term um, commitment ensemble has made to the hotel and the community of Santa Cruz, and we've worked hard to bring forward a project that's consistent with local standards and requirements for the design we're proud of. And with that, we're submitting the project for your consideration tonight and look forward to a vibrant discussion and answering your questions. Um, so I just want to confirm that the time remaining was uh, asked to be reserved at the very end of public comment, correct? Do we have an uh, understanding of what time was left? Okay, great. So we'll have that at the end for you. Um, so now would be the time for the council to ask any clarifying questions on behalf of the applicant or on behalf of our staff. I'll go ahead and see if there's any questions um, from the council at this time. Does members have any questions? Um, Vice Mayor Cummings? I have a number of questions. Um, <clears throat> I know that many members of the public have been pretty concerned because of the way that um, this exemption was decided upon versus doing a full EIR, and many people have been coming forward asking why a full EIR wasn't done on this project. I'm just wondering if somebody on the city staff can speak to that. Um, we'll go ahead and bring up our uh, CEQA attorney, uh, Sabrina Teller. Good evening, Vice Mayor, um, Mayor and uh, Council Members. I'm Sabrina Teller with the law firm of Remy Moose Manley. Our firm has represented the city as outside CEQA Council for a number of years, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the CEQA process. As I understand it, your, your question is aimed at why wasn't an AIR prepared here? And the answer is that uh, this is the best tool to fit the project and the circumstances presented uh, in the project. Uh, there are a number of tools in the CEQA toolbox, including an EIR, mitigated neg deck, but also these streamlining tools, um, like the one used here under Public Resources Code Section 21083.3 and Guidelines 15183. Uh, so it's important to note first that looking at the language of those provisions in the streamlining process, it uses mandatory language directing the city to use 
this tool in circumstances like these. Uh, that provision says that if there's an EIR for a prior zoning or planning action, here your general plan EIR, and a parcel has been zoned to accommodate a particular density of development, the agency's application of CEQA for a project that is consistent with that zoning or plan shall be limited to effects which are peculiar to the parcel and which weren't addressed in the prior EIR or which substantial new information shows will be more significant than disclosed in the EIR. So if the city were to have decided here that an EIR should have been prepared instead of following the 21083.3 streamlining checklist analysis process, it would have needed to cite to substantial evidence supporting a determination that there are new or different impacts peculiar to this parcel or project that were not covered in the general plan EIR and that the uniformly applied development policies and standards will not mitigate to a less than significant level. And so the city started with that checklist process, went through it, concluded that there were no, that there is no substantial evidence kicking the city out of that process, kicking this project out of that process into an EIR or a more, or a, um, a more traditional type of analysis. And therefore that's why this streaming landing tool is appropriate. So it's within the city's discretion to decide that a different tool uh, should be used here. But to do that, to make a different choice, you would need to cite to substantial evidence that kicks you out of that process, that, that shows that there will be uh, impacts that are not mitigated by the uniformly applied development policies as explained in the checklist. And as, as based on the evidence that I've seen so far, I think that the checklist tool is still well supported. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, so in the staff report, and this is for clarity because many people have been asking questions regarding this. In the beach area plan, it, it this was based on 47 residential units, 230 additional hotels, and 21,872 square feet of commercial space. It stated that currently six housing units have been constructed, 19,100 19, square feet of commercial space, and 346 hotel units have been constructed. And then with this additional building, there would be 89 residential units, 15,790 square feet of commercial. And so it seems like um, what's listed in the beach area um, plan that was um, initially identified, this goes above and beyond the numbers that were in our staff report. And I'm just trying to understand how, how the EIR covers these additional units that go above and beyond um, what's, lift, what's listed in the staff report under the beach area plan. So, so as explained in the staff report, those numbers were estimates, not caps. And um, as with any general plan, there it, it's sort of like squeezing the water balloon. You know, you're, you might have uh, more pressure in one area and it results in a certain number of impacts and, or I'm sorry, a certain number of units or a level of development and it, and it might have a different area that doesn't develop to the full, you know, say potential outlined in the general plan EIR. And because those are not caps, um, the information presented in the staff report, it just explains basically how close you are to meeting uh, the estimates uh, where the general plan thought you would be at full build out. And as the explained in the general plan, I'm sorry, in the staff report, you have approved a certain number of level of development of units and, and square footage since the general plan EIR was certified. And this project you know, adds an additional increment of development, um, but it was not limited to in a, a particular area. There wasn't a cap set on a particular area, and it is generally consistent with the amount of development anticipated for the city so far. Um, that said, also, to the extent that there's a concern under CEQA about the consistency of those numbers, CEQA is concerned not with the compliance with those types of hard number caps, even if there's not a cap here. It's more concerned with, and that the way that the question is posed in the CEQA checklist is, would an inconsistency with a land use policy adopted to avoid uh, an environmental impact does that inconsistency result in a physical environmental impact? And so again, these not being caps, but rather estimates, it's not an inconsistency with a policy. 
that's aimed at an environmental impact. It was just a level of development that was anticipated in the general plan and the staff report explains how close you are to meeting that anticipated level of development. Um, I, I'll allow if other folks have questions too, if they want to chime in. Otherwise, I can continue. And why don't we um, have any questions go for the next maybe 10 minutes or so and then open it up to public comment and then we can return back for more follow up questions. I know some of the folks have been, we got a little bit of a late start. Um, so, other council member questions uh, at this time before public comment? Thanks. I think it was Councilmember Myers, Glover, Crone, Brown. Okay. And we'll, if you didn't get your questions answered before we open it up to public comment, we'll go ahead and return back after for those clarifying questions to happen. Okay. I just have a, a question a little bit about um, the commercial uses. Um, no more CEQA may not be the on your, yeah. <laughs> um, my, my CEQA questions were covered by uh, the Vice Mayor. Um, maybe, I don't know if someone from the project sponsor um, just Maybe I have a couple, just a couple of questions about your um, commercial uses. So you have the marketplace, the cafe, um, let's see, spa. spa. Spa is um, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm assuming is just hotel, uh, just hotel use and the retail assigned as, along with that. Uh, so hotel users would be using the spa. That's not a public space, correct? If you could, uh, sir, please come forward and speak. The spa, like most hotel spas, would be open to guests and members of the public. It would be. Okay. Okay. And um, the market hall, kind of the intent is, is that that's um, hotel supportive, so could be, um, what, what, what exactly kind of is the vision a little bit there in terms, I'm just trying to get a sense of sort of the commercial commercial area uses. Yes, yeah, so the market hall is a little under 4,000 square feet, so it's the size of a large cafe. Mm -hmm. um, it would have a combination of you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, meats, it could be grab-and-go foods. Currently, the hotel has a full-service sit-down restaurant, but there's no grab-and-go type of cafe. Um, it would also, it would also be able to have convenience items for hotel guests or for members of the public so they don't necessarily have to run all the way over to Walgreens and create extra, you know, trips in the area. Um, so it is a, uh, an amenity for the hotel as well as for the neighborhood. In the cafe, I know you have uh, a coffee, kind of a coffee cafe in the hotel currently. Is that use kind of anticipated to potentially move into this side or would this be additional to that? I mean, this would likely be, a, and this would likely be additional. Mm -hmm. the, the, the coffee cart may end up going away. This may be operated by Verve. It may be operated by someone else. But this is about 1,200 square feet, so that's the size. Of, it's, it's a small cafe, so it'd be some seating areas other than just the lobby. So it'd be, you know, some a place where someone could uh, go sit with a laptop and have a cup of coffee, whether they're a hotel guest or a member of the public. Okay. Thank you. And the uh, the courtyard patio is is quite large, and obviously that's available as well to the public. Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'll just stop there for now. Okay. <laughs> Councilor McGlover. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, thanks for the presentations, both for staff and the and the applicants. Uh, let's talk affordability for a moment. So the. Units are going to be low, very low, which is wonderful. The the location or the the price point was looking nice, I guess, just in general for being able to allow people to potentially purchase a home. Something that came up for me was the process in which people will be selected in to live there. Uh, first of all, if you could speak to that um, and what that looks like, uh, since I can imagine that it will be very. Um, competitive, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and then also, are those locked in affordability forever and in perpetuity, or how does that work with regards to if someone were to purchase it and then turn around and sell it? Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to say, first of all, the sale of the units will be governed by an affordable housing agreement with the city, That's uh, and those guidelines are set forth in Measure O and the city's uh, policies, and um, I'd like to actually, if you have detailed questions on that, I'd like to direct those questions to Bonnie Lipscomb. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but those units would be sold um, 
uh, and the residents would be income qualified um, in cooperation and under the guidance of an affordable housing agreement that would be administered by the city. Wonderful. I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page and people in the room were about it. Um, and I can, uh, I mean, if someone from the either economic development or planning wants to talk about the affordability and perpetuity, and then I have two other questions and then we'll move on and I'll be done. I just got a text from Bonnie and she is watching from her office and says she'll be over <laughs> um, at the end of public comment so she can address that then. Wonderful. It is in perpetuity and so subsequent sales would have to qualify at the 50% area median income level at that time. Um, and uh, it would be based on a variety of factors including the uh, interest rates at the time um, and HOA dues, um, the, the cost of those would all factor into what the <coughs> ultimate price is. Um, in terms of the process, the selection and so forth, um, I would defer to Bonnie on that and she can Absolutely. answer that in just a bit. Thank you. Um, so next is sound, and we'll talk about sound just really quick. Uh, so I'm looking at the blueprint of your ground level uh, display of what it's going to look like. And uh, one of the concerns, because there are many concerns that have been brought forth, especially by the low income mobile home park that's directly behind or next to the community uh, or the proposed development. Um, the location of the trash that you can see right there, uh, it's that dotted box on the left side, that is incredibly close to the dividing wall. And so one of the main concerns with the neighboring community is the impact of vibrations and early morning deliveries of delivery trucks as well as trash trucks coming to pick it up from that location. Um, can you speak to that and what issues? I know you mentioned a sound wall, but uh, what was the height of that sound wall and is it proven to be um, effective at blocking those kinds of sounds from the, because those are people's bedroom windows literally on the other side of that uh, red striped line. So what's being done to address that? And you mentioned the shoring up of the foundations. How do you plan on going about that and how you know it needs to be done before the um, situation happens? And then just for uh, time, the CEQA question I had had to do specifically with their concerns about uh, the, the access of solar light specifically the shadowing of the homes. Uh, I know that, I don't know if that was included in the original CEQA general plan and uh, their feelings specifically, uh, just to make sure that they're represented here uh, in this development conversation, is the impact of the reduction of light, elderly people living in those mobile homes and then being susceptible to mold, mildew, and having to increase their cost of upkeep. So I wanna just touch on those two, if we could hear something yeah. from the, whoever is most qualified. Okay, I'll try to take uh, these questions uh, one at a time. Great. Um, I, I think the foundation bolting and inspections is the, probably the easiest. We will uh, hire uh, third parties, and we're and there's a number of them, and we're willing to work with the residents to uh, provide a list of several that are qualified, um, and we would have a third party uh, go do <coughs> inspections and make recommendations. And this is you know as much to protect ourselves from liability because it's much cheaper to fix something up front than later on. Absolutely. Um, so uh, that's the first one. Uh, with regards to the trash, there is a additional supplemental noise study that was done by the city's CEQA uh, consultant that um, I can refer you to them for more additional details. The um, doors um, have to be oriented away from the street via the, the, the city's ordinance. Um, the wall, um, I, I'd have to ask our architect, it was either six or eight feet, Juan? Six feet. Uh, it, was, uh, it was six feet tall. Um, so I'm six feet tall, and I don't think that a wall my height would stop the sound of delivery trucks, semis, and or trash trucks. Do you? Yeah. Well, I think that also the plan is to wheel the bins out to the public right of way um, rather than having the trash truck actually pulling up and reversing. So they would actually be wheeled out by the maintenance staff. So the trash would actually be picked up at the right of way. So we could arrange to have that be a little bit further from the property line as well. Okay, great. And, we can, and, and we'll make sure that um, all the trash deliveries are done in a manner that's consistent with the noise ordinance in terms of uh, uh, hours and sound. And um, uh, would the city's consultant like to add anything about the noise study? <coughs> I, 
I leave out there again, and I was just talking with our um, assistant director of public works as well as our um, secret consultant about this. And uh, essentially what public works indicated was that we will work with them to minimize the number of pickups throughout the week. Um, because these are temporary in nature, you know, once a day, um, single events, um, and, uh, you know, a, a limited number of times throughout the week. Uh, we would not anticipate any um, noise standards being exceeded. Um, and it, we certainly recognize that that still is uh, an effect on the adjacent residences. And so Public Works um, does uh, need to still see how they can best minimize that. That's coordinating with the applicant to say, all right, how can we do this um, as infrequently as possible with the number of pickups that are scheduled and the size of the bins? Um, and that's something that um, the Public Works Department will work through with the applicant. Great. Um, there's, you know, I just am a little concerned, especially because we've heard the representatives from Dufour Street come for a year, apparently, because of double parking. And so the concern of how fast the city can move if there is an issue that is unforeseen. Um, but now, in the interest of time, CEQA, uh, there is the um, shade and lighting, which may or may not have been included in the original study for the general plan, but then also the two-story parking lot underground in the cliff. So I don't know if that was included in the original EIR for the 2030, but if not, and there wasn't the consideration of a two-story underground parking lot on a cliff that is already kind of sketchy, um, shouldn't that require an EIR? And that's either for you or for their, our EIR our lawyer. I think it's shading. So to respond to the, the inquiry about shading yeah. and solar access, that's not a CEQA issue. Mm -hmm. It's not in the checklist. Um, that said, um, one of the design permit findings that you need to make um, is that it uh, minimizes uh, the project preserves solar access to adjacent properties. Um, as, uh, as the applicant mentioned, there was a solar study done and, and, um, and then also as Ryan mentioned as part of his report, the setbacks on the Clearview Court property lines were more than doubled. And um, if, if you look at the, the, the solar studies that were done that are included in your plan sets, it really does minimize the overall shading to, to the overall Clearview Court property. Granted, there are a couple of units that are on the north side that are gonna be fairly shaded the majority of the day during the winter solstice. But overall, if you look at the whole year, um, those setbacks have really gone a long way towards minimizing solar impacts on the, those adjacent uh, property lines. Thank you. I'll invite Stephanie Strelow up, our um, DUDEC consultant on the CEQA analysis to talk about the geotechnical reports that were done regarding cliff stability. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Um, this issue was addressed. There was a re review conducted by Gary Griggs, and it basically concluded that with the excavation that was planned and the formations that are present, um, there wouldn't be any issues with risks to slope instability, mostly because of the distance and um, the type of formation that exists in this location. So it was reviewed and it was um, summarized in this checklist. But uh, there, was that included in the original CEQA analysis for the general plan? Because according to the provisions in the code that keeps or keeps being references if it's something that was outside of the original analysis. So was there geo analysis of an underground two-story parking lot on that location for the 2030 plan? The general plan provided a general overview analysis of the kinds of impacts that would occur with relation to slope instability um, and various geologic hazards. So yes, it was addressed in the general plan EIR. And then the studies for the project just provides the detailed site um, evaluation that confirmed there are no new impacts that were not otherwise evaluated in the EIR for the general plan. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and um, ask my colleagues to um, uh, pause their questions at this time. We'll go ahead and come back after public comment uh, to Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Brown uh, to, and then Count Vice Mayor Cummings to reconvene <coughs> questioning and comments. Um, we're at 9.15 and I know there's many members of the public who want to address us on this item. 
Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, pause questions and open it up to public comment. How this will go is we will hear from the uh, uh, three groups that requested extra time in advance. Um, they'll have up to four minutes to address the council. I'll then open it up to one minute for any member of the community that just wants to briefly uh, say their uh, thoughts on this um, item. And then we'll go ahead and open it up to two minutes and um, hopefully get a chance to hear from everybody. I ask that you respect your fellow citizens as they express their opinions before us this evening. Um, we're gonna um, ask that uh, you receive the same level of respect when you speak as well and I'll do um, all I can to ensure uh, decorum as we move forward at this time. So I'd like to invite up our first uh, uh, group presentation. You'll have up to four minutes and Kate Roberts um, on behalf of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, please come forward. Thank you, Mayor Watkins and good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Kate Roberts, President of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, otherwise known as MBAP. Um, MBEP strongly recommends the approval of this 190 Westcliff Drive mixed use project that is before you this evening, which includes, as we've heard in uh, detail, 89 homes, 10 of which are affordable to very low and moderate income home buyers. MBEP was founded in 2015 with a mission to improve the economic health and quality of life in the region. Uh, we consist of 87 public, private, and civic entities throughout the region, which consists of Santa Cruz, Monterey, and, and San Benito counties. Our strategy is to create and implement initiatives aligned with this vision. Our current initiatives obviously include housing, as well as workforce development, transportation, and broadband. We strongly advocate for more types, uh, housing of all types, and furthermore support higher density housing, both rental and for sale at every income level in appropriate locations near transit options, jobs and services, which maximize public infrastructure investments and prevent sprawl. We've reviewed this proposal by Ensemble over a year ago and have been involved since then. They have obviously improved their plans after incorporating lots of neighborhood uh, comments and feedback, and as we've heard, have met all the city and state requirements for the site. This site, which currently is a parking lot, but at one time, as is mentioned, was a hospital, which is kind of interesting, uh, will be repurposed to meet our community's need for more workforce, market rate, and affordable housing. The city needs more housing, which you're obviously very well aware of, that serves all income levels, especially lower incomes. And this project, the 10 homes, which we've been discussing tonight, will be extraordinarily affordable prices, ranging from 114 to 265,000, which is obviously dramatically different from the median selling price of 850,000 in Santa Cruz, based on recent data from Zillow. Please join our large and diverse coalition of local business leaders, housing advocates, and residents in approving this much needed project. I just wanna say personally, anecdotally, I know somebody that lives in the condos next to, I think is gonna speak later, a young guy with a family that, you know, would really like to see this type of housing be available for more of his peers. So I hope that you guys will be able to vote it through tonight. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your consideration. Next, I'd like to invite up um, Jim Conway, who's president of the Clearview Court Homeowners Association, and I think he will be co-presenting with Anita Webb. Um, you're welcome to come forward, and you'll have up to four minutes. Okay, okay, so you'll be speaking on behalf of the group. Thank you. Yes, yeah, since we were only given four minutes, we okay. felt that was best. Um, honorable Mayor and City Council members, our vulnerable 68 home community, approximately 150 residents, orders this project on the north and west fence lines. Our windows are within three feet of the expected additional 1,500 car trips daily using the project's roadway. In addition to that, our commercial and residential deliveries, city services, special events, whether on-site or the many athletic <clears throat> events that close down streets on this corner throughout the year not being studied, impacts will be direct and lasting. <clears throat> No consideration has been given to um, Clearview residents whom will bear cost increases caused by impacts such as for maintenance, keeping mold, moss, and mildew at bay, and for heating and lighting under long reaching project sad shadows, which is all day during uh, colder weather 
fall and winter months along the north when we depend on every ray of the sun, not just on the one day of winter <coughs> solstice, and year round in mornings on the west when we depend, or, excuse me, lots of food gardens which need sun that supplement our grocery bills, the building mass blocking signals to those who have over-the-air digital TV antennas, and dish, in, dish TV was talked about, I guess, earlier that was new information. Major noise round the clock and artificial light intrusion, car and commercial vehicle exhaust pollution, all are known contributors, contributors to uh, increased health risks, uh, loss of privacy, five levels, many balconies, windows, penthouse decks. We will all suffer loss of quality of life uh, and livability of our community, uh, loss of home values. A home already cannot sell due to the prospect of this project. It's sitting on the, the fence line if anyone's interested. And you, um, and could affect emergency response times. Many, uh, most our residents cannot afford to move and some are homebound with disabilities or chronic illnesses, so they're exposed all day to uh, impacts. Then we must endure the two to three years of heavy construction. Is it fair to sacrifice these largely low fixed income homeowners again so the wealthy can benefit instead? You've received our written comments. Uh, the needs for all developer verbal statements addressing CBC impacts need to be included in the conditions. They're, they're not in there. In compliance with uh, the general plan page 95 for noise, which does require a sound wall, we are asking for eight feet for it to be effective. Otherwise, it'll be the same as a four foot uh, our Homes are elevated, we can see over a six foot fence. If you can see over it, you can hear. Um, we need that installed in advance of construction, which was verbally agreed to. Uh, sound dampening materials on building and roadways um, also required under the general plan, particularly on the north where the second through fifth levels actually swing out towards us. Uh, at an angle halfway over the road. That side is not vertical. It's not the full uh, setback mentioned earlier. Um, and it will contribute to impacts and noise amplification. Um, you need to know that the various reports submitted are to planning are riddled with errors and omissions, yet being accepted as fact without fact checking and uh, commission. Your time is up. You're welcome to submit your comments or to have um, a, a, a colleague or uh, somebody from the, your group to, sh to share the remainder during their okay. time. Okay. Okay. Please so do we have due a, diligence. We have one more um, group presentation, and that's Julie Phillips. <laughs> and you're representing Save Santa Cruz West Side. And you'll have up to four minutes as well. Actually, Julie has. Uh, had me come and do the speaking. Good evening, I'm Adrian Pearson, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Santa Cruz West Side Group, a large association of concerned residents. And I'm gonna be addressing specifically concerns about the building height code violation in the plan design. An experienced real estate land use attorney has studied the relevant city code alongside the plan design and concludes the project exceeds zoning code requirements and a height exception does not apply to a proposed fifth level. Now each council member should have received a copy of the attorney's letter with the legal analysis along with appropriate sections of the permit application and the city code. The legal observation is the following. The specific uses that would qualify for a height exception are listed and named under the city's code section on the height exceptions. That's section 24.12.150. The list is rather short. It's quite specific. For example, church spires and lifeguard towers have height exceptions. And importantly for tonight's discussion, roof decks, roof deck walls or rails, and rooftop trellises over roof decks are not on the list that is allowed to exceed regulated height. Because roof decks and their associated vertical structures are not allowed under the use exceptions, any height associated with these is not permitted to exceed the limit, which in this case is 47 feet. These rooftop structures cannot be 10 feet tall, they cannot be six feet or four feet or even one foot over 47 feet. This is a sensitive coastside zone. The height limit here is three stories or 36 feet. 
The maximum allowed height of 47 feet was ach achieved after applying the applicant's requested bonus. The plan requests a fifth level to be added to the fourth story rooftop with 27 private decks access, accessed by 27 private staircases from the penthouses below with 10 foot tall canopy style trellises covering all rising to 56 feet, perhaps more. Essentially picture a 10 foot high roof on top of the four story roof with a resulting mass that appears as five stories. If anyone else in this room asked for a permit that violated height regulations, it would be rejected. One justification cited was for over limit height seems to be enhanced articulation under the city's design guidelines. There's nothing in the design guidelines that allow height violations. Height exceptions are governed by that section 24.12.150. In summary, there's no legal basis for a height exception. The applicant has 47 feet to work with and should get the job done in their 47 feet, which is already one story higher than our vision for our city under our regulations. As council members, whatever your personal views on this project might be, the public expects that each of you will hold the line on upholding our codes and our height limits. You are our environmental stewards. You are the who the community looks to for principled leadership. You are charged with the ethical responsibility for upholding our codes and regulations. And for ease of reference this evening, a copy of the very brief section governing height exceptions will now be distributed. There are very specific exceptions and what's being proposed is not among them. You will not see roof decks on the list of exceptions. It's important you have an accurate copy uh, for your use this evening because there were some typos I want to make you aware of that were in the text of the code that was in the staff report and the applicant's attorney's letter which may have caused confusion. I will give these to the uh, clerk for distribution. I've made an extra copy for um, a file copy for the for your Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this time, that concludes our um, group presentations for public comment. I saw somebody in the audience that had um, children here. I don't know if that person's still here. I wanted to invite you up to speak if you're interested in speaking. I'm recognizing tonight is a school night, um, but I'm not sure if that person's still here. So I just wanted to honor that. Um, Oh, they are. Were you interested in speaking this evening? Okay, okay. Um, so what we'll do at this point is we'll have any member of the community that wants to just briefly address the council in one minute to please come forward. Um, and then we'll open it up to two minutes for those that want uh, the longer amount of time. But if there's some members of the community that just want to briefly share their comments, I want to invite you up for one minute to do so. Um, and if you will, uh, you're welcome to stand up to my left. Go right ahead and you'll have one minute. My name is Nathan York. <clears throat> I'm a Santa Cruz City resident. Uh, we heard quite a bit tonight from folks who have experienced the effects of the housing crisis in our city. And so I wanna ask tonight that you prioritize people over parking lots. Um, <clears throat> this plan, this project will not fix the crisis of housing in our city, but it will provide uh, low income units for ten, uh, eight families and uh, two additional uh, moderate income, <clears throat> and those are people who desperately need housing in our city. Um, and in addition to that, it will provide uh, 81 uh, housing units for households that uh, really want a higher density housing in the city that's efficient, uh, that's in a walkable, bikeable location, which is also important for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in our city. Uh, the people who Thank you. Thank you. Others that want to just briefly address the council in one minute, please come forward. You'll have one minute as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elise Casby, and generally I think this is an extremely elaborate legal, although I don't think the legalities would hold up in a serious court, to avoid a extremely thorough environmental impact report. Um, we need a real, real scientific environmental impact report to 
ex to get into extreme detail about all the effects, the effect on wildlife, the effect on the area, pollutions. It is a sensitive habitat. I am familiar with the area. Having said that, the other thing is, is that I just don't think a Spanish colonial building is appropriate for this area. This is on Ohlone ground. We are taking away beach flats area. I don't think that this is appropriate. To me, it looks very much like LA at, in Santa Monica near the beach. I don't think that's right for Santa Cruz. Unfortunately, I don't think this is the right project. Good evening, Council. My name is Ralph Myberg. Um, in the one minute, I'm just going to compart compartmentalize what I have to say. I think an EIR is actually a good idea in general. Um, the traffic um, studies I do not believe are sufficient. Um, the linear park that is Westcliff and Lighthouse um, will be severely impacted. I walk there, and when cars are backed up all the way to Manor, um, the amount of pollution for pedestrians, um, people with their children, uh, skateboarders, athletes, surfers is intense. I would like to support the roundabout as a solution and ask that the traffic signal never be considered for that, no matter what. Um, even if the roundabout doesn't take effect, uh, the stop signals at least meter traffic going down to the main roundabout at the um, wharf. Um, a traffic signal would create light intrusion throughout the day and night. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other members of the community for one minute wanting to address the council, please come forward. Thank you. My name is Phyllis Galvan, and I'm a Clearview Court resident, and I'm one of the people that live on the fence where there'll be no sun, where we'll be next to the trash that will only be picked up briefly, but I'll be able to smell it after it's sat for a few days. Um, we have fought to, to keep our low-cost housing. I truly have low-cost housing in the broadest sense. We're going to be forced out. The Where I live, we won't be able to go, live through the construction. I won't have any place to go. I'll be one of the people like Bixby Street. I'll be in the car. Um, the traffic is going to be 10 times worse, and I don't think the solutions look good. Then we're in environmental crisis. Every tree, every open space counts. We need those things. We're fighting for those things, and here we're going to blow up the... Thank you very much. Please, for one minute. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Dan Smart, <clears throat> Director Dreamin. Been a local here now for 10 years, and I never would have been if I wasn't first a visitor, and that's why I love this town. We're in the people business. It's our goal to offer our guests the best and most authentic Santa Cruz experience we can. <clears throat> this city thrives off of visitors shopping in our stores, eating in our restaurants, visiting our beaches, and staying in our hotels. <clears throat> The 190 Westcliff project will provide a much needed amenities for our guests and locals, and locals alike. The number one question our guests ask is, do we have a spa or gym? Though I recommend go out on the beach and run or surf, this is one of the amenities that is highly in need for our guests and visitors in this area. <laughs> Lastly, the addition of more food, beverage, and shopping outlets will provide not only more jobs, but access to an authentic Santa Cruz business for locals alike. Please take this moment and opportunity to help Westcliff and Bay Street become one of the favorites for our residents and visitors. Thank you. Next speaker. And if you could please lower your sign no higher than um, your shoulders as to not obstruct the view of the person behind you. Good evening, uh, council members, mayor. Vice Mayor, my name is Jesse Bristow, and I'm here on multiple capacities. I'm actually a local business owner that own, I own a coffee shop about a thousand feet away from the from this site. Uh, I live in downtown Santa Cruz. I work in downtown Santa Cruz. I'm also a project manager for Swanson Builders. Uh, I'd like to speak on behalf and in favor of this project. I think it's a great uh, utilization of underutilized site. 
the fact that we're providing housing instead of a visitor serving use, because that is some of a contentious item down in that area. So it's nice that we're providing actual, you know, ownership opportunity there. And I think the big ticket item is that there's 10 units that are, well, eight that are very, very low and two that are very low income that could be life changing for 10 families potentially of, of affordability. So I'd like to speak in favor of it. I think it creates a great connection from the beach to downtown, close proximity to the bus stops, and I, I think it's a great design. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, um, Council Members. My name is Robert Singleton. I'm a downtown resident and also a member of your Planning Commission. I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the project before you, and I would hope to say that you uh, support it and vote in favor of it. You can hear a lot of stuff from people tonight about traffic, height, shadows, affordability, et cetera. I just want to focus on one element, which is the affordability, um, the deed-restricted low-income units. So as you're surely aware, we are uh, woefully short in our low-income housing um, uh, production goals as set forth under our regional housing needs allocation. So I ask of you, um, without projects like this, how else are we going to get those units? Um, we have no extra public dollars. We have no redevelopment funds. We have no local trust fund for affordable housing. We don't have any additional money coming from the feds. Earned income tax credits only account for a small percentage and fraction of total capital stack for affordable housing. So without projects like these that are going to have deed restricted affordable units for 50% and lower AMI, I don't know how we're going to get those production goals. So this is a unique opportunity before you. Um, what is the cost of not doing anything? Because that's what you're faced with. For the one minute. Uh -huh, come forward. Hi, my name is Tim Gordon. I am a Santa Cruz city resident. Um, my speech is pretty simple. The state, the county, the city, this council have said that you want housing. This provides housing. Should be simple, black and white. Let's approve this project. Thanks. Hi, my name is Jamili. Tim and I own an architecture and construction company in town. We have 12 employees. We provide high paying, highly skilled professional jobs for people to live where they work, work where they live. We have three children. We also rent. We live in a house that's barely above the house that I lived in college. It's kind of disgusting. There are not a lot of options for us here, um, for many people here. And I mention all this because my personal philosophy and vision for this community is that it is a place that can be truly sustainable. To me, that means that, that there are high paying jobs. There are jobs of all, all kinds. There's resources, there's schools, there's public spaces, there's infrastructure, there's grocery stores, and there's housing. And all of those things are near each other. This project provides all of those things for our community. I ask you to join me tonight in supporting a vibrant vision for the future of Santa Cruz. And please say yes to housing. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the crosswalk in front of the Dream Inn Hotel lobby is a major reason why this project should not be approved. Aside, aside from the valets and occasional guests coming from the parking lot, the lobby cro crosswalk is hardly used. And yet, with so few <coughs> pedestrians crossing at the lobby crosswalk, we have traffic gridlock on most summer weekends. The lobby crosswalk is very dangerous, Pedestrians must step off the curb directly into the path of oncoming bikes that are using the two high-speed bike lanes, and then into the oncoming traffic. The proposed project will induce, introduce hundreds of pedestrians crossing a day at the lobby crosswalk, and all year long. Residents of the new condos, tourists by the hundreds, locals will use, and locals will use the lobby crosswalk to reach the 16,000 square feet of amenities, uh, like, and you're welcome to submit your comments if you'd like. A minute? Mm -hmm. That's one minute. Any others for one minute? Please come forward. Good evening, council members. I'm glad to be here. I've lived on Lower Bay for 22 years and a retired Cabrillo teacher. I have watched traffic increase, but this is a nightmare. We're, they're expecting 1,500 more cars with this project. That is three miles of cars. Have you tried to go on a weekend 
with the cars. You wait an hour at that section. This is the West Side Freedom Line. This is the Bay and, and West Cliff is the corridor for the whole West Side, for emergency vehicles, for commuters, for everybody. And it's gonna be impossible. You're going to lose it forever if you allow this through. Good evening. Um, I just simply want to address a few t talking points here. <coughs> I've lived in the neighborhood on Lighthouse Avenue, fortunately, very fortunately, for 33 years. And um, I'm truly concerned about the traffic, and I understand the various viewpoints that have been shared about it. I think it needs continued consideration. Number two, yes, there will be low-income units. That's a good thing, that's an important thing, that's a necessary thing for this community. But what about the other units? Who is really gonna own these units? And who is really gonna actually live in these units? Are these gonna be VRBOs, Airbnbs? Is this really a viable solution for housing for those of us that live in this community? Please consider that. Yes, this will create jobs. What kinds of jobs are going to be created though? Are these jobs with livable wages in this community? I'd like you to consider that. And then overall, more needs to be done. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker. Good evening. Uh, my name is Corey Ray, and I have lived here for 50 years. So what that means is I get to own my house. I get to have secure housing. I hit the generational jackpot. So there's a lot of us here that are like that, and I'm here to tell you that I would like to share that, and I would like our community to have more housing to share. I'd like you to support our values. Our values are less traffic. If 20,000 people drive into Santa Cruz every day for their jobs, maybe a few of them could live here. Maybe they wouldn't have to drive. Climate change, density is the greenest housing option there is. Single family housing is the worst. That's what Santa Cruz is. How about affordable housing? And how about regular housing? The second point I'd make is that listen to your experts. You hire them. You put everybody through all these rules. They do everything. Listen to your experts. Support this project. Good evening, my name is Chris Ferrante and I own a neighboring hotel, um, the Beach Street Inn and Suites, and I support this project fully. Um, I was intimately involved in a project that um, was derailed back in 2005 where the developer pulled out and the project didn't happen and that project was very important because it provided a conference center to our community. Um, and I'm bummed that, that it didn't happen. However, looking at what the developers have done and all the concessions they made to especially Clearview Court and um, considering the situation we're, we're in in regards to our housing stock, I have to say I'm, I'm glad I'm here today supporting this project because I do think it's far more worthy than perhaps um, additional hotel rooms and, um, and that conference center that that we had on the table a, few, a decade ago or so. So please support this project. The housing component is huge. Uh, the amenities to the Dream Inn, the fitness center, the spa and so forth are huge. So support it, thank you. Good evening, my name's Hugh Fowler. I live near where this proposed project is going to be built or not. Um, it seems to me it, the proposal is uh, to build almost 80 very expensive condominiums that will be bought and uh, used by wealthy people on the west side. In order to do this, the uh, project developer is asking us to abandon our uh, height requirement for this area. And he and the developer is uh, suggesting that we should do that because he's going to build eight to 10 or 12 low income units. But I ask you, since 
there's so much concern about traffic, you know, the environment, the height, the parking, that at least consider a full EIR. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and have, um, are you waiting for one minute as well? Two minutes? We'll go ahead and have, for the one minutes, okay, we're gonna have you as the last. You're gonna, waiting for the one minute. well, I'll go ahead and do this. I wanna honor the folks that have been waiting in line. If you wanna just take the one minute, you're welcome to, but we'll have the folks, cause um, I know that there's there's a number of members of the community that are wanting the two minutes. You don't have to take your full two minutes, but the one minutes, we're gonna stop at the uh, gentleman in the jacket. We're gonna have you actually, I'm sorry, gonna have you actually go to the back of the line to be able to have the folks that have been there. Oh, she's been waiting outside? Oh, okay, apologies for that. From the I outside. Stand in line, but I want to talk for a minute. Okay, well, we're going to have you, you're going to be able to do that during the two minute time frame, but we're going to, because I have uh, seen a number of folks come up and I, I'm not necessarily sure and who's been waiting for the one minute. I want to have the folks who've been waiting for their two minutes to have their opportunity, and then you'll go after, after the woman um, who has been waiting from as far as I know. So the folks that are behind her, if you could just go back to the end of the line so we can have um, those who've been waiting patiently for their full two minutes to to have their opportunity to speak as well. So we'll have you go, and then we'll have uh, the two folks who've been waiting there in line, one from the outside. Okay, thank you, you'll have your one minute. My name is Laura Waltz. I have been a resident of Santa, the city of Santa Cruz for almost 20 years. The entire time I have lived here, housing has been a problem, and not only has it not gotten better, it's gotten worse. So understandably, there are impacts anytime a development project happens, but we're looking at either 89 housing units or a parking lot. So please vote in favor of this. Hello everyone, uh, my name's Adam Novak. I work for UCSC. Uh, as far as I can tell, this project checks all the boxes and you can't not approve it. It's not perfect and the ways in which it's not perfect point to ways in which the boxes could be improved. Uh, I hear that it ought to compensate the neighbors for the negative externalities, things like shade. Uh, you should agendize an ordinance to develop a framework in which that could be done. Uh, it also ought to have more affordable housing. Uh, we could get that by raising the affordable housing requirements in Santa Cruz. Uh, we could also probably get that by raising the height limits. I'm sure that the developers of this project would love to add a whole floor of affordable housing. It seems like they're capped out by the height limit. Uh, in conclusion, the only way out of our housing crisis, in my opinion, is up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Colleen Sullivan. Um, I'm a homeowner about a block and a half away from this project. And my primary concern is uh, the increase of traffic. Um, I fully support the traffic circle, but I think we're gonna have impacts from the pedestrian crossing, so I would, I would encourage you to look more deeply at that because it will be like crossing in downtown. You know, if you're driving through there, every, every pedestrian's gonna stop that traffic and push it back onto that traffic circle. And not only that, all of the residents coming down to park in to the, um, facility are gonna be pushed back on that California project. So I would encourage you to look at a traffic circle up by California. So thank you. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close the one minute time frame. We're gonna have you have an opportunity to do, if you just want up to one minute when your turn is to speak, but we've had um, a number of folks who've been waiting for their two minutes. We're gonna allow their time. You don't have to take your full two minutes, but we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and honor the folks that have been waiting in line here and you'll have up to two minutes at this time. Hello, my name is Julie Phillips, and thank you for listening to us tonight. The city planners have put the interests of the Southern California developer over the concerns and interests of the majority of the people and the public. For over two years, we have been involved, a team of us, in this proposed project, including several community meetings, informational meetings hosted by the developers, the red dot, green dot, the whole, you know, write your concerns, ask questions, tell us what you need and like, and they have not responded to a single one of our concerns. Um, so again, the impacts of this massive project at this fragile location so close to the Cliffs and Bay and neighbors are significant. 
and that's a key word that I'm gonna be using over this time, and huge, and yet the city is not requiring a full EIR, an environmental impact report. Tyson Sells himself said in a local radio interview that he anticipated doing an EIR. Let's hold him to that. It is irresponsible for a project of this scale and scope on our fragile coastline and cliffs to not require a full environmental impact report. The environmental checklist that was cited throughout their report goes down for each impact and states no impact. I don't know if you've looked at it, but the CEQA environmental checklist is just a little checklist. It says no impact, check, no impact, check. And we were, we couldn't believe, my blood pressure really went out after reading that. Also, tearing this project off, off of the 2030 general plan, of which this particular project is not included, is again irresponsible and does not represent the basic principles of democracy. The California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, states that any proposed project that might have an adverse environmental impact on the environment is automatically required to have a full EIR. And I hope the attorney and others have looked at that wording. Key to that is to allow the public to give input and every single concern and question must be individually answered in a thorough public review process. That has not occurred. And that's an integral part of full EIR is to get that public input. This project will have significant environmental impacts, including significant and increased traffic congestion and gridlock at this busy lifeline corridor, first responder access, cliff stability due to the major excavation next to the cliffs, which re includes removing 58,000 cubic yards of material. Thank you, and you're welcome to leave your comments if you'd like. Is development really desecration and despoilment and destruction of communities like we're seeing all over, like I've seen in Aptos? And I'm listening to lauding of the wireless technology. I call it toxic technology. And I may be a little older than the old owner here, but I distinctly remember when microwave ovens came out, we were warned, stand back. All wireless devices emit microwave radiation, a known biological hazard. The World Health Organization categorizes this radiation in the 2B carcinogenic category, same as lead, DDT, and chloroform. People report symptoms around these radiation emitting devices to be headaches, fatigue, cardiovascular problems, memory loss, dizziness, and the list goes on, depression, diabetes, there's an increase in diabetes around cell towers and stuff. So I'm thinking this is more radiation inundation. It's not an attractive um, draw for me to go to any hotel that has this. And I also think soon there's gonna be sea level inundation from the rise of the sea here. I urge you to vote against this project for the reasons stated by members of the community here. And I also find it disturbing that we're two hours in favor <coughs> of the project. Next speaker, please. Good evening. Uh, <coughs> my name is Hector Aspilcueta. I have the honor of representing UNITE here, the Hospitality Workers Union. Our national organization represents over 300,000 workers in the hotel, food, service, and gaming industries in the U.S. and in Canada. And uh, our Monterey affiliate, Local 43, which I am the secretary treasurer, represents 400, four, 1,400 workers in the Santa Cruz and the Monterey counties, including most of the employees at the Dream Inn. Our members are what makes this uh, hospitality industry thrive in these areas. Uh, why I am here? I am here today to support the Dream Inn expansion project at 180 West Cliff Drive. I support this project for two main reasons. First, it will likely uh, lead to the creation or more high quality hospitality industry jobs in Santa Cruz. To be added to the good jobs which already exist in the current Dreaming employees. 
Uh, second, it will be add housing to the Santa Cruz market, including some additional affordable housing. Affordable housing is especially important to hospitality industry service workers, like those who work at the Dream Inn. With our members having long commutes from home to go to work each day, a project that offers affordable housing close to where the people work will have a positive impact. Uh, many of our members drive from uh, Watsonville into Santa Cruz to work here at the Dream Inn. As stakeholders in the hospitality industry in the Santa Cruz community, we look forward to continue to engage with you in this important project, and we ask you to approve the project as proposed. On behalf of our 1,400 local members of Local 43, uh, we want to thank you for your time. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Sergio Rangel, President of United Here Local 43 Hospitality Workers Union. So why we are here? So we are here to support this project, right? And uh, it's very simple, right, to, to do this. Why? Affordable housing is one thing that is very important everywhere we go. Good job condition, right? When I say good job condition means when you have a worker working in any area that worker is supposed to get, you know, better wages, insurance for there is and for the families, better job condition, right? And secure the working families for the Santa Cruz. This project brings all of this. And believe me, believe me, I have 20 years coming over here to Santa Cruz. This is a beautiful area right, to come and enjoy and bring business to this place. And this project will do that. And I can tell you one thing, even traffic, not real staff people to come here. <laughs> you should be proud to live here and also to protect this project for giving more opportunities to the working people of the Santa Cruz. This is the time that you guys pass this project for the working family people. Family people from Santa Cruz have to be first. Thank you so much. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Russell Weiss. I'm a 32 year <clears throat> resident from Laguna Street, about four blocks away from the proposed development. <clears throat> um, there are many reasons to be concerned about the proposed 190 Westcliff development. Uh, I sent the council two previous emails about <clears throat> two, two of those issues. The first was um, how an existing um, bad traffic situation will be made significantly worse by this development. <clears throat> and two, how the cumulative impact of development along the access routes to Westcliff and the wharf will cause gridlock, <clears throat> gridlock already exists uh, some of the time, but it will cause uh, considerably more gridlock and prevent emergency <clears throat> vehicles access to those areas. I don't believe these issues were um, adequately explored in the <clears throat> 2030 general plan. So um, I think they, they need to be explored in an environmental impact report. Of course, there are many other valid concerns besides traffic and safety, including the legality of the actual building <coughs> height, which you've heard about, the effect of the massive underground excavation, which is dependent on just one analysis to date, impacts on Clearview Court and the neighborhood, et cetera. <coughs> but you council members have an opportunity tonight to require this project to undergo a full EIR. The project checklist uh, that has been <clears throat> um, done so far, I, I believe is incorrect and inadequate on many impacts. Um, as previously mentioned, often it's just a checklist, no impact. <clears throat> so please uh, require a full EIR.
Mayor Council Members, Gillian Greenside. I read from your staff report of the purpose of this district. It says the purpose of the Motel Residential Performance Overlay District is to establish and control uses to ensure development which protects neighbourhood integrity while supporting appropriate uses. And that seems to have been lost in this picture. We're nibbling around the edges, but actually if you stand back from it, the impact on Clearview Court is just not acceptable on any level, given the demographics of that community. This is too massive for this site and this purpose. And I think that an EIR is a no-brainer here because None of the impacts specific to the site were studied previously. That intersection, the trees, the crosswalk, the streams that will be diverted as you go down two storeys for the park, underground parking garage. That checklist isn't based on a proper analysis. It's based on a quick look at things. I saw quite a few mistakes in it, and I'd like to mint, I see time's running out, in terms of heritage trees, I sent you a photo of that tree that will be gone, that major tree, the first one. Our heritage tree ordinance states that you can only remove a heritage tree if the design of a project cannot be altered to accommodate it. The very first moment that these folks stepped into planning, planning should have said, we have a heritage tree ordinance. Design something that protects those big trees. I'm not talking about the other 50 ones that are going. I'm talking about those iconic trees that I've seen every day for 45 years, and they are finished. Thank you. Hello, I bring you greetings from uh, Word of Life Church of God in Christ on the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, I don't know a whole lot of you, and shame on me for not knowing the people who govern us. I do know Brother Glover here, he has came to our church a number of times, and, uh, and frankly, I got to say you're doing what you said you're going to do, so I have no qualms on you. But one thing I, want, I do want to say, I do um, agree with this project. Um, our church, uh, we run a food pantry out of there. We, uh, we do the Thanksgiving feed in the park. We do a Christmas program. We're holding down the west side. As you can see, they're destroyed churches, so it's very important that the churches are represented. And not only are the are the churches represented, but they have people in there that need housing. Now, I've lived here almost all my life, at least 50, 55 years. I'm 62 years old. I lived here, I came out here from Arkansas when I was really, very young, so I lived here for a long time. i seen Santa Cruz grow. And I'm going to tell you, the flavor of Santa Cruz, it's, it's losing a little bit. But you know what? I've worked 10 years at the slave pit by the river. I'm referring to a K. Sauce Tannery. I put 32 and a half years in at the Metropolitan Transit District. Just retired two years ago, and I still own no house. I'm a working poor, just like a whole bunch of these other folks is. And I hear people say, oh, the rich people are going to get these houses. Maybe I may get one of them, if the Lord say the same. Maybe I may be able to afford one of these houses. I've worked here all my life. I got family here. My church is here, and I still don't own a house. I'm still paying rent. So if you can do something, say yes on this project. Hi. My name is Gretchen. Um, I'm a longtime Santa Cruz resident, and I currently live on Westcliff, about a mile away from the proposed project. One evening last spring, I was home alone, laying on my couch, reading an op-ed in the Sentinel, a housing op-ed. The author was arguing that changing the R15 zoning that applies to the majority of the upper and lower west side was the solution to our housing crisis. It was dry and boring material until the last paragraph when the author asked the reader to close their eyes and imagine the empty bedrooms, if any, in their home, and then imagine the empty bedrooms in their neighbor's home, and then the empty bedrooms on the whole block. The emptiness and sadness I felt was deep. The really realization I had was we are not building homes that suit our population. We know that density is green, it's more energy efficient and encourage walking and biking, but it doesn't look green. It looks chunky and heavy and tall. 
In order to change that perception, there's gotta be an aha moment and a shift from trees are green to high density buildings are green. The truth is paradoxical. And the answer is right under our noses. The housing crisis is a density blindness crisis. Traffic safety su suffers from density blindness too. In dense areas, automobiles traffic slows down. Pedestrians and bikes take over and we are safer. The 190 Westcliff project offers 89 units of high density housing, increases pedestrian and bike safety, offers space for local businesses and services for local residents. So here's our choice. Parking for cars, homes for people, public safety and services. Parking for cars, homes for people, public safety and services. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Mayor Watkins and City Council members. My name is Brenda Griffin and I am the president of the local NAACP. And I wanna let you know tonight that the NAACP supports low income housing. I'm also here to advocate for those who are marginalized, those who feel like they do not belong in Santa Cruz anymore. And that's just shameful. I'm not, t I'm not about to tell you anything that you don't know or anybody in here hasn't heard, but I'm gonna reiterate it because it's important. We need low income housing in Santa Cruz for our working class community members. Our family members and friends are being pushed out of Santa Cruz because it is because of its unaffordability to rent a decent place, let alone purchase a home. People who grow up, grew up here can no longer afford to live here, especially black and brown people. Santa Cruz has a hard time recruiting teachers of color. I asked the question, the uh, first response is, it's unaffordable to live here. We need more people of color teaching our children of color. Perhaps that's true of other city and county agencies, I don't know, but I know that we need more low income housing. Some of you make convincing arguments for supporting uh, affordable housing, low income housing, but your actions do not support your arguments. You have the authority to clear the pathway for our low income earners to become homeowners. Please make it happen. Whatever you have to do, make it happen. Oh, I'm running out of time. So here's what we like to see. We'd like to see these low income units be allotted to Santa Cruz County residents. The units should not be sold as income property. Low income owners hopefully will be offered the most effective financing and pricing available. And we hope that more low income housing will be built. Thank you. Hello, city council members. George Al, I was born here 76 years ago in Santa Cruz, in the Santa Cruz Chinatown, the fourth Santa Cruz Chinatown. Thank you very much for the Chinatown Bridge and allowing the monument. I'd like to say one thing. The people that were losing their homes uh, on Bixby Street, and uh, I hope you help them. And it, it's uh, terrible. Now I think back to our family history. Before my birthday, we couldn't own land. So we were renters. We had housing insecurity, just like these folks. The Chinatowns were wiped out by saying, well, you're out. And, and, and that was all there was to it. The fourth Santa Cruz Chinatown. The first three either were burned down or they were just kicked out, okay? So I hope you make it so that people aren't evicted. I also hope that you make this project work. You are very smart people, you have good hearts. Let's make it work, let's find a way. I like the eight very low and the other two low. It's better than a kick in the pants, it's, it's good. Now the other ones, I might move into the other ones. I might give up my five bedroom house with, um, with the side unit and move into one of these. 
And then, and then everybody can live one or two bedrooms, uh, one or two to a bedroom in, in my house. And that could happen a lot. Maybe Chris won't be able, what's gonna happen, Chris, is we're gonna get old, we won't be able to get up and down the stairs. And then we need something like this. And then we give up our houses and other people move in. Also, I'd like to say that um, a lot of the, the 85 units will be people who can work and live in Santa Cruz. Amen. Okay, thank you. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Kyle. I, I live in some of the units uh, nearby at 200 West Cliff. Um, we're really happy to be there. It's a, it's a really walkable and bikeable community for us. Um, but I'm, I'm primarily here because I care about getting more housing in Santa Cruz. Um, we should not have to be in a bidding war between other families just, sorry, <laughs> just to get a house for our kids. If, if this project was up, we probably would have also bidded on it. But we had to go for the one that we did. <sighs> sorry, it's, it's been hard trying to get a home for the last three years, and I, I'm happy to have one now for my kids. And I just wanna see more homes go up. I'm, I'm tired of people stopping other homes from going up. I want more homes for people. I wanna say yes to people and yeah, yes to housing. Thank you. Hi, Bruce Thomas again, Dufour Street. Um, I represent a whole bunch of neighbors up there. We had a very terrible situation thrust upon us through a planning process that left some gaping holes. We got the delivery trucks double parking after a year asking for help. Things, the, the, not all the homework was done in that planning process. So I like the idea of more housing. I'm very supportive of it. But we got to listen and make sure, I didn't see a loading zone in the plans at all. And what are they, and when someone's talking about the garbage trucks, yes, they'll comply with the laws. They have an exemption to the, noise ordinance because they're considered a public facility. So there's things I think that a little bit more homework needs to be done to make sure this is done right. It's great, we wanna have these housing. I like the design in general, but things like loading zones. You're gonna have, you're gonna have delivery trucks driving up that little hill from the roundabout by Wharf Avenue and someone already, there's people who've been hit by cars at that intersection, cross from Dream Inn across the way. Traffic and safety really needs to be scrutinized. Loading needs to be factored in. It wasn't on Dufour Street and we're still suffering the consequences. It's a safety issue, traffic. It's a public health and safety issue. So I say it's a good sounding project and ERR would be fundamentally assure, help reach assurances on the impacts that this could really have. And yes, let's get more housing in this, in this community and do it in a smart way and complete way. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dustin Benny. Uh, I've been a resident of the West Side near the Dream Inn for 10 years now. Uh, please let me make this very clear that I am strongly opposed to this development for several reasons. Uh, the project is far too massive for the tiny and already overcrowded and congested intersection of Bay and Westcliff. It will undoubtedly increase traffic and slow emergency vehicle response times, not only in terms of vehicle, vehicular traffic, but in terms of pedestrian and bicycle safety have always been a huge concern for the surrounding intersection. Public Works even, has even gone on record saying that traffic in this intersection and surrounding neighborhoods cannot be mitigated even with intersection improvements. So I ask you, why are we considering overdeveloping this already congested intersection? Approving this development will only exacerbate the problems that already plague this major corridor to the West Cliff and the greater West Side. This project has, has received far too many exemptions, exceptions, interpretations of Santa Cruz building codes, zoning requirements, elimination of height and density limitations, development and the elimination of, wait, development and the elimination of street parking made to benefit the developer at the expense of the surrounding neighborhoods and coastal, coastal environment, including not actually requiring a full environmental impact review. Uh, even in the inclusion of commercial space in the development when the site is actually zoned for ancillary hotel and residence only. Did you actually know that the parking plan for this development only includes one guest parking space for four residences? And with street parking already eliminated, the overflow parking will undoubtedly flow into the surrounding neighborhoods. 
please recognize that high density residential parking, or excuse me, residential housing does not mean that there is more housing that can be afforded for working families within our community. In fact, building any, especially 79 more market rate luxury beachfront condos will only exacerbate the overpriced housing problem our town currently faces. Many people argue that Santa Cruz needs more, needs more housing. But in reality, this project only caters to the ultra wealthy that can afford it while providing minimal affordable housing to our community. If approved, this project will certainly drive a wedge into our community and only cater to the exclusive and all-inclusive lifestyle of the Dream Inn. Thank you. Hello, my name is Evan Zeroki. Um, on behalf of Santa Cruz UMB and the vo voice support of the project, uh, we had, uh, I think around over 60 people signed an online to petition and support. Some of the names should be in uh, packet. Uh, before I go further, <clears throat> just wanna state this. This project is general plan compliant. Therefore, the Housing Accountability Act requires you to approve this project unless you make specific findings. Please do not violate state law. Uh, so, all right, let's get real. Every time kind of project like this gets proposed, four stories or higher, people say we need a full ER, even though the city's already done like ERs, all these studies, there's been so many studies that have already happened. And every time people complain about the traffic so much that it seems like actually providing housing for people isn't really a priority. And a lot of times there are specious complaints about the lack of infrastructure and water when really like the city's like seems to be spending more time in invested in like opposing, you know, UCSC growth plans than planning for growth. I mean, I don't like that. And even after we seem to have come to an agreement, sometimes, you know, lawsuits happen after all this. So there's really not a lot of good faith, I feel, in a lot of people that are opposing uh, this project. And we're trying to save a parking lot? Really? Come on. So it's time to start, for the city to start welcoming change in a productive way, <laughs> instead of giving so much weight to people who oppose anything taller than three stories. The city is being held back. It could be so much better if it wasn't wasting so many resources trying to stop growing. Please approve the project. Good evening, council members. My name is George Lewis. I would like to state for the record that 1,066 signatures in opposition to the Dream In, the 190 West Cliff project, have been collected by the Save Santa Cruz West Side in response to their online petition. petition. Uh, in addition, an, an additional 40 signatures were collected individually by a member of our group. These, uh, a printout of the petition and these 1,100 approximately signatures I've handed to, uh, to Bonnie and she's passing around to the council members. I also uh, gave her two photos. I appreciate it if you look at the, uh, the photos first. Um, I'm opposed to the Dream In Project and believe a full EIR is required. I'm opposed for many reasons, but because of the time limit, I'd like to focus on the trees. The developer plans to remove 50 out of 55 trees and 12 out of 17 heritage trees, including two Canary Island pine trees that are approximately 100 feet tall. The environmental checklist, quoting from page 13, states, quote, the trees proposed for removal are not visible from a wide ranging area and are not vis visually prominent or distinctive. I strongly disagree. If you look at those two photos, you can see the two tallest trees are designated for removal. You can clearly see how large and visually prominent the trees are. Looking from the wharf where those photos were taken, these trees provide a beautiful backdrop to the cliffs. They are a valuable scenic resource that have taken decades to grow. Thank you. If I could ask you to please lower your sign so that you're not obstructing the view of the person behind you. Okay. Jim Conway from Clear Court. 
Mayor Watkins and council members, in 2004, the city of Santa Cruz broke its promise to the homeowners of clear your court by stripping away our rent control in perpetuity. We signed agreements under distress to accept a 34 year lease, 34 year lease with a new owner. This was approved by the city in favor of the developer's interests. Now, once again, our community is threatened by a new developer. Our affordable, our affordable community of 68 families is at the risk of a, severely, of a severely reduced quality of life due to the monstrous size of the 190 Westcliff project. You say you're advocates of affordable housing, but to get 10 additional affordable housings, you are allowing 68 households at Clearview Court to be significantly impacted by the shadowing of a 56 foot tall structure, the traffic noise and emissions from a 20 foot wide two lane roadway that's within three feet of our homes, and the unknown effects of the construction vibrations to our homes lo located within 10 feet of the shore and excavating work that will be done. None of these three items have been properly analyzed or studied for the, significant, for the signif significant effect to our community as required by CEQA. CEQA clearly states that when using the term, when using the tiering process that the city has provided in lieu of a full EIR, they must, according to the Public Resource Code Section 21083.3, approval shall be limited to the effects on the environment which are peculiar to the parcel or to the project and which were not addressed as significant effects in the prior environmental impact report. This process has clearly not been done. No place in the environmental checklist of May 20, 2019 or the revised September 29 checklist is a shadowing from this project on the Clearview Court analyzed. The required noise vibration study requested by the Planning Commission to address the effects on Clearview Court is not mentioned anywhere. So because the developer hasn't met the requirements of CEQA, we're requesting a full EIR. Hello, council members. My name is Charlie Vasky. I'm here to say yes to housing. I think of my friend and coworker, Nikki, and her partner and son, who work with me on the far west side. Um, she had a long commute and poor, moldy housing in the mountains, and her family needed something better. For months, I saw them on the weekends at coffee shops and stores as they made stops while apartment hunting. They sacrificed weekends for months on end looking for housing closer to work. They sacrificed over $1,000 in apartment application fees before somebody finally said yes to them, just so she could reclaim some of her life from her commute into Santa Cruz. This is a mild story for this town, but I tell it because this farce is considered a success story. Tonight, you can help 89 families like Nikki's find housing closer to their work that cuts down on their vehicle miles and cuts down on carbon emissions. The housing money that these 89 families spend will go to the construction of new housing rather than putting them in competition with other families for limited housing and driving up rents further. Their money goes to building housing for 10 families who can't afford Santa Cruz's outrageous rents. When you say yes to this project, you are helping real people, our friends and colleagues. If you were to say no, you are saying no to housing real people. You are saying no to those 10 families that can finally get affordable rents in an unaffordable city. It's saying no to following state law. It's saying no to housing an entire generation of people. Saying no means continuing an un environmentally unsustainable city plan, pushing people to longer and longer drives. Saying no means exclusion. You have affordable housing in front of you right now. I urge you to say yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Uh, in our submitted letter, we pointed out to you that this is an unusual, <clears throat> an unusual project because of the very low income units. Most of these projects are always on the high end rather than on the low end. So this is very unusual, and those are the most needed units in order to meet your housing element. As you saw earlier, uh, it's, I mean, it's a huge difference. Um, you may be surprised to know that these 10 units, these 10 affordable units, would add over 1% more affordable housing units to Santa Cruz. Now, 1% may, might sm seem small to you, um, but that's a pretty significant number for just one project. You might also be interested in knowing that this kind of project accounts for 23% of Santa Cruz's affordable housing units. 
So just imagine if all those market rate projects had been turned down by previous city councils, we'd be short 23% more affordable housing units. <coughs> and finally, I am glad the previous speaker uh, talked about this because this is something that's very important. A lot of people get all upside, oh, these are gonna be high income people in these other units. Yes, they are going to be higher income citizens of Santa Cruz. But the way this works is when they buy those units, part of the money that goes for those units is used to pay for the low income units, okay? So those people <coughs> are paying for the low income units. Now, not only are they paying for them, but they're all gonna live in the same building. Now that's what I call community. And that's what we need more of in Santa Cruz. Support this, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Watkins, City Council members. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a 36 year resident of the city. I'm a professional civil engineer. I am uh, spent two uh, terms on the planning commission here and I am a long time housing advocate in this community. I'm uh, currently involved with the COPA housing team and I'm working hard to pr pr provide more housing in our community. We're in a housing crisis. We're still in a housing crisis and I urge you to approve this project because the only way we're gonna get out of a housing crisis is to build housing. This is exactly the type of housing we need. It's a mix of units, different sizes, one, two, and three bedroom units. It provides housing for different levels of affordability, especially, as many people have mentioned, 10 affordable units, eight of which are for the very lowest income levels. The city's committed to building 180 of these in, in the eight years that started four years ago. So far, you've got 12. I think adding eight is really significant. I think this is worth doing and ought to be done. I can't think of a better use for us of a surface parking lot than to provide housing for the citizens of Santa Cruz. Please approve this project. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stu Phillips, city resident. I love Santa Cruz, and that's why I've been a resident of Santa Cruz County for 60 years. There are so many issues with this development, development that need further study that a full EIR should be required. And I wanna to speak to traffic in the crosswalk in front of the Dream Inn lobby. Some people have already mentioned it. Here is a quote from the assistant Public Works Director, Chris Snyder, the city cannot make significant intersection improvements to address the area's worst peak congestion, but could aim to improve average conditions. Keith Higgins, who did the Pinnacle Traffic Report, said similar things. What they are saying, I think, is that many, many gridlocked days cannot be mitigated. This should automatically trigger an EIR and this will have significant impacts in the neighborhoods. There's thousands of homes on the west side. Another quote from page 53 of the CEQA exemption doc, doc says, pedestrian volumes exceed peak hour volumes for a mid-block crosswalk. Now, they're talking about currently, before they account for pedestrians coming to and from the proposed 17,000 square foot of commercial space, cafes, restaurants, markets, spa, plaza, pop-up um, music events, hundreds of people will be using this mid-block crosswalk in front of the Dream Inn lobby. People will be coming across the street, the hotel guests, people will be coming up from the beach, wharf, and boardwalk to this complex and every single person will be crossing this mid-block crosswalk, every single one. Thank you. Before you get started, I wanna make sure there's no other members of the community that are wanting to address the council on this item. The two in the front, 
And then the gentleman here on the left, okay. All right, if you could step forward so I can get a sense of how many more people are wanting to address the council, that would be great. Okay, so okay, so we'll have the three in line here and the two in the front who are seated as our last speakers. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, I've noticed a lot of conflicting goals of some of our city policies in regard to this project. I'm gonna go ahead and pause you. Bonnie, could you please start the time? The goal of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions will never be achieved if our city planning department and staff continue to defend a project like this one that promises at least 1,500 additional <laughs> car trips that will definitely be idling in bumper to bumper traffic for blocks or for miles. As a woman earlier said, three miles. Commercial should not be allowed at this location as it will be the main draw for the cars. Vision Zero is another concept that we desperately need to heed as our statistics for bike and pedestrian injuries are already among the highest in California. We have read the staff report that claims all will miraculously be safe, but we are all well acquainted with the dangers that already exist there, and we are not at all feeling assured that mixing bikes, pedestrians, with the new roundabout and the 1,500 additional or more will help in achieving the zero vision zero goals. Health and all policies was a great concept also, and for the people who will be hit and injured, that's not really good. I don't think it will be reducing automobile dependence, as was pointed out. When you can say that 1,500 cars will be coming I don't see how that's reducing automobile independence and it's making it more dangerous for pedestrians and bicyclists. Thank you. Mayor, council members, Matt Huerta, um, housing program manager with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership and board member for the nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. I wanted to focus just for a cup uh, my time here on the state density bonus law. I think we have a really unique opportunity to really um, look at this project in the new light, this new era that we're approaching here in California, where we have to, we're not ever gonna solve our affordability challenges with subsidy by itself, with the traditional redevelopment agencies going away, all these different tools that we had in our toolbox are we're starting to rebuild those, but it's gonna take a minute. So the fact that we have a strong market rate for-profit company that's actually stepping forward and doing what we, this very special program was designed to do, there's actually very few takers. When you look at the state and you look at even the Bay Area, very few market rate for-profit companies are actually doing and utilizing the state bonus density. So we have an uh, opportunity here to actually achieve some unique income levels that are on par with actually other 100% projects. You don't have to look very far. Look down the street in Live Oak, and it took years and years and years of compiling, compiling subsidy and subsidy and actually using county-owned property to get the Habitat project going there in Live Oak. Just a, an example, this is gonna actually match and if not even achieve greater affordability than that. On the as part of this, this larger uh, development. And I also wanna highlight the fact that um, we did take some time looking at this this past year, and in fact, we've, we've been offering an enhanced uh, uh, density bonus provision, and the County of Santa Cruz is actually in, in involved with that and taking the, the, the time to look, look at that because we're talking about not only a 35% state density bonus, but we're saying you can go and use a 50% density bonus. And in fact, the state likes this concept so much that they passed AB 1763, which was signed by the governor and allows for 80% for 100% projects. Thank you. Okay, please come forward. Good evening and thank you for uh, listening to us here today. I do support um, additional housing, but I don't feel that this is the proper place for it. Uh, climate change is real, the seas are rising, the two-story down below parking garage will seriously impact the delicate habitat of West Cliff Drive. Um, additionally, it's not just a parking lot, it's also a migration path for many birds. Our whole bird population is 25% down less, less now. We need to save this 
beautiful sanctuary that is the gateway to West Cliff Drive. I really request that at least, at the very minimum, a full environmental impact report be done. Thank you. As the sequel attorney stated tonight, for unusual circumstances, an EIR can be done. This is the gateway to West Cliff Drive. This is some of the most iconic scenery in the whole entire town. This is a tourist area. This is an area that brings revenue to our dear city. It is an important area. That means it's an unusual circumstance. That's why we need a full EIR. What's to fear? Nothing, right? We can do it because it's important, as you've heard here tonight. Everyone's here because it's important. We're here so late because it's so important. We don't want people hurt on that turnstall where pedestrians hurry across after they've had fun. Now let's hurry across. But wait, the traffic just backed up because they still want to cross. They want to cross on that on each side. They want to cross. What are we going to do? Well, we're in our car and we have to go, but it's a turnstile, but we have to wait for the pedestrians. Well, wait a minute. That's really dangerous. It's already dangerous there. Our traffic studies need to be done in the summertime when it's peak time because we care about human beings. We care about safety. It's our responsibility as other human beings. We need to care and do the right things. Having a full EIR because it is a special circumstance, no doubt on that, number one. Number two, safety of lives. We don't want to get written up again for people getting hit on bicycles. That's bad for our town, and it spreads. People have told us about it in Southern California, what goes on in Santa Cruz. So we don't want more of that. We want more tourists to come. We want more people to enjoy our area. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I, I know a few of you at least went to the uh, San Francisco Mime Troop show this summer, and it was about uh, Pirate developers, and their their most famous thing that they do is dangle affordable housing. Look at the affordable housing. Look, you know, I'm in favor of affordable housing, but it's not worth having affordable housing to pass a bad project. Um, there's a number of things wrong with this project. The most glaring one is traffic. There's a uh, Traffic, the traffic circles work this time of year. In the summertime, they don't work. The tourists don't know how to manage them. Um, plus, even in this time of year, they're bad for pedestrians. The traffic circle at Pacific and Center backs up Center Street all the way to the fire station, sometimes in the summer. I can't imagine what one on West Cliff would do. It would probably go out past the, the uh, out past the surf museum. It's you know that's not a, a solution. Then the height problem, um, the height problem could be dealt with by getting rid of the bottom floor. Get rid of the commercial aspect of this. The commercial aspect <laughs> is one of the biggest problems with this whole project. Uh, if we, there is no commercial aspect to it, if it's just housing, I think it's a much more palatable project. So do a complete ERA on this. They're, they're using an environmental impact report from over 20 years ago to check their checklist. The, the Beach South of Laurel environmental impact report, that was over 20 years ago. That's not valid anymore. That would be your time to speak. You'll be our last speaker. Yeah. They're all done. You're our last speaker. The 
took me two years living in my car while working full time to save up enough to buy my small home in Clearview. I signed an irrevocable in perpetuity rent control that I could not sell my home above a certain price, so I thought I was safe. The city reneged on a few years later. The whole city council said yes to it, along with hundreds of other contracts to benefit a wealthy developer. The Hispanic family with three kids was the first to leave. They just left their home behind, their chance at having a home gone. Now we're being forced to defend ourselves again from long-reaching permanent impacts from a project that would destroy the livability of our community and put cost and health risk burdens on us. We are a community. We were a community, we were all owner-owned, we babysat for each other, looked after the elderly. When I couldn't even crawl with my pneumonia, my neighbor took me to the doctor. We can't afford to move. We need you to exercise your authority for sound and responsible decision-making that protects the public and our neighborhoods. Consider alternatives and at the very least, request an EIR. Thank you. So that will conclude public comment. I'm gonna go ahead and honor the applicant's request to uh, reserve the remaining time if they have any additional comments they'd like to make at this point. I believe you had two and a half minutes or something of that nature. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Frank Petrilli. I'm a land use lawyer uh, and a partner at the law firm of Aaron Fox. Um, I don't think we have time, certainly not in two and a half minutes to kind of go through an issue by issue uh, rebuttal, if there are questions, we've got a team available. <coughs> Obviously the city has a lot of resources too, and I'm sure that there will be kind of a robust Q&A uh, when the council takes this under deliberation later tonight. Um, one thing I did want to speak to though is, CEQA is complicated. Um, the nomenclature is unfortunate because terms like exempt, terms like streamlining are used and it's not remotely intuitive. So I wanted to take another shot at kind of unpacking uh, exactly what the city did in terms of the environmental <laughs> review because the suggestion is it wasn't exhaustive, it wasn't thorough, and that's not quite uh, accurate. Um, so when the city prepared its general plan, what it looked at was growth projections for the next, call it 20 years. And the environmental review that was done looked at things like infrastructure, water, energy, <laughs> utilities, a whole kind of spectrum of impacts. Um, that EIR was done in 2012. So for projects that deviate from the general plan or requesting kind of a rezoning are different, you know, broadly speaking from what the city's big picture kind of growth projections were, um, a different process would have applied. Our project is consistent with the general plan, it's consistent with the zoning, and so what CEQA dictates basically is uh, for those big picture kind of infrastructure type impacts, right, um, you don't need to replicate that analysis. So. Uh, Again, issues like energy, water supply, infrastructure, kind of citywide macro type stuff, that was tiered uh, away. And instead, and there's no, um, admittedly, the general plan EIR did not look at this parcel. It did not do kind of a project specific, parcel specific analysis for anything citywide. That's not what a general plan EIR, EIR does. So here, what the city did starting about a year and a half ago <coughs> was, um, again, per what the statute requires, uh, start having experts prepare studies on air quality, cultural resources, archeology, span of traffic, which uh, took about a year and a half and a lot of back and forth with public works to figure out whether there were peculiar impacts. And the result was uh, a, a document, it's called a checklist. It's not really a checklist if you read through it, um, that says, you know, we looked at all of this there were a bunch of different studies that were commissioned. The analysis really was exhaustive uh, and thorough. I mean, that's about the same amount of time that it takes to prepare an EIR. <coughs> and the conclusion was that um, really none of the criteria 
Is it worth going through this further, or do you want to you know, revisit kind of in if, Q and A? If, if council members have additional questions, we can go ahead and have you speak to it at that time. Okay. So, but thank you for your. Uh, I wish I had, had been more succinct and concise, but it's hard. So. I, I, okay. I recognize that. Yeah. I want to um, just thank the community for being here. Um, like many issues that come before us, um, we hear perspectives on both sides and in the middle, and it's important for us to hear from you all. I know we're approaching a later hour. Um, bef I, I think we need a maybe a two-minute stretch break and before um, and then we'll return back to council for action and deliberation and I'll just um, sort of um, acknowledge that we received a number of emails from our staff to try to get some of our questions answered in advance so when we return um, to ask the council to ask the questions that are gonna need um, that, that you need to inform your ability to make a decision this evening as I know a number of our community members are wanting to see um, the council's direction in this way so we'll go ahead and take a two-minute break and then we'll return back for uh, questions in action. Right. Okie dokie. We'll go ahead and uh, call our meeting back into session. If I could get your attention, please. If you wouldn't mind taking your seats and uh, either taking your conversations outside or um, uh, keeping them inside, uh, it, please uh, cease your conversation so we can go ahead and continue this uh, discussion. I appreciate that. So we're gonna go ahead and bring us back to um, the, uh, the topic before us. We're at the time where we are gonna have any final questions from council um, addressed and then um, action and, and deliberation. And I believe we left it with council member Chrome for questions, then council member Brown, then vice mayor Cummings, and, um, that's, and then council member Matthews. That's the cue. Okay, council member Chrome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just wanted to just kick it off with um, a question about, um, and I think it's for the city attorney. The California Environmental Quality Act states that any proposed project that might have a significant adverse impact on the environment is automatically required to complete a full EIR. Um, how, how do you read that? Well, I, I think you have to look at it in the context of the analysis that's been provided. Um, a lot of of work and analysis has gone into the process that led to um, the environmental checklist and the and the um, manner in which this analysis has been brought forward. Um, so I don't have really anything to say that is different from uh, what Ms. Teller uh, advised the council earlier in the hearing. So you don't think this project might have a significant uh, adverse impact? Uh, the issue is whether or not it would have a significant impact that is different from an analysis of environmental impacts that was contained in the, in the general plan EIR, whether it's something unique to this project in terms of the specific environmental impacts that were required to analyze that, um, that wasn't addressed and mitigated by the policies contained in the in the general plan. Okay, I have a series of, of, of quick questions, hopefully. Um, the six-foot easement, uh, has it been memorialized? It, it, it moved to 7.6 feet, is that right? And is it in the um, uh, COA? I don't think that question is, should be directed to me. But. No, I, no I, I'm, I'm directing to staff, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, my, um, I might have to go back and look at the exact details of that, but um, my understanding is that there are several of the um, mobile homes that currently encroach onto this property and um, addressing concerns with how close those are to what would be the wall or the, the driveway. Um, the applicants have offered, um, I believe is it, is it a foot and a half? 18 inches, um, a dedication, or it, it, not dedication, I should say, it's a, an easement to for basically uh, for use of that property. So it's not a six foot easement? It, that goes to seven and a half feet, or it's just a foot and a half? Can, can Do you mind clarify, yeah, clarifying? Can I clarify? Thank there's you. Al, there's already an existing recorded easement on the title right. for six feet. So this would be an increase 
of that by 18 inches. So yes, your math is correct. And what, okay. what about the, um, the sound wall? What, doesn't eight feet make sense over six feet? Uh, eight feet is acceptable to us. When we met with the Clearview Court residents, some folks wanted six, some folks wanted eight. Um, and uh, and we're, we're amenable to making it eight feet tall. Thanks. And would it be appropriate to plant trees to sort of soften that uh, view in that area? I can, uh, I can direct um, the question in terms of the specifics of the planting to Joni Janek here, our landscape architect. But there is uh, plans for uh, planting along that wall to, off, uh, to also soften the edge. There's a, 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 and Joni can pull up the, uh, 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 the site plan here if, we, if the remote is, is it working. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Joni Janecki, um, landscape architect on the project. So um, I think, you can't see it up there. Can you see it on the screen down below? Okay, I think we're not hooked up. So I'll just describe, so along the edge is a combination of um, vines. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, we, we see the same thing. Julia, can you switch to yeah, the... Yeah, you know, I... Thank you. I don't know how to switch it, so pardon me. I was just gonna keep going and speaking until it gets on. Um, so, so the the idea along the perimeter planting is to do a combination of, of tall shrubs, trees where possible, where space permits, and also um, vines. So we do a kind of a layered approach and get as much buffer between both properties as we can all the way around. Okay, and I have another question for Mr. Sales about... Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, the uh, short-term rentals. Um, wh wh why wouldn't we want to put that to bed? Why do you want to hold that out as an option? Um, the uh, homeowners association documents will require the residents to abide by the city's short-term um, ordinance and provide for financial penalties for any homeowners that break the rules and regulations. So in addition to the city's enforcement, there would be enforcement by the homeowners association for the short-term rentals. Thank you, and oh, what about um, the process that is followed by, by selecting applicants for the affordable units? Um, what if the pro process doesn't yield a, a, an eligible applicant? Um, will the unit remain vacant? We're going to be highly committed to uh, make sure that those units are sold to low-income uh, working families. Um, we're going to be outreaching to uh, the hotel employees to make sure people know how to sign up, offering credit counseling. Uh, we're going to do everything in our legal power to make sure that these are not only sold to uh, you know, Santa Cruz locals, but we're going to make these as you know a, a, as easily available as possible, and want to give uh, uh, local workers every leg up to purchase these. And I appreciate the um, the cost of the low income, uh, the very low income units. What are the costs of the upper? I mean, this that's the ten units we did. So then we have like sort of seventy nine units of you know what might be considered unaffordable housing. What, what, are the, what, what do those go for? Um, uh, I, today, I really can't say. Um, we can look at what the sales prices have been across the street. Um, there's, uh, they've been for anywhere from about eight to 900,000 for some one and a half, one bedroom, one and a half bedroom townhouses on up to like a million three, million four, million five for some of the larger um, townhouses that are like 2,700 square feet. Um, and um, there's certainly houses more expensive than that on West Cliff Drive, um, but this uh, community is going to have uh, uh, homes that have ocean views, and it's going to have homes that are on the courtyard that are 700 square feet that don't have an ocean view. So there will be a wide variety of price points, um, but I really can't uh, predict what those sales prices may be, uh, you know, several years in the future. And um what about the trees? Um, there's a really, really fine uh, pine tree. Is there any way of working around that? Um, we instructed um, 
our, our our consultant team to look in to see if it was feasible. And there's um, arborist studies uh, um, that have looked at uh, moving them. And there's conditions of approval that uh, specify um, uh, you know, looking into you know what's feasible and not feasible, and I can uh, invite um, Joni Janecki to come up and actually talk about the health of that particular tree um, and the circumstances around that particular tree. But we've worked hard to be able to save the trees that we could. And could you also address like the that feasibility, infeasibility issue of like, it's, if it's feasible to move a tree, which it seems sure. like it's pretty open. Uh, uh, well, you know, it it's, it's one of those things where I'll start with the second question about relocating a tree. Um, over the years and for many years now, trees have been located and some to great success and others within 10, 15 years, they've found that the trees don't survive and so, um, we would like to think that they would. Um, the Pinus cariensis, pardon me, the Canary Island pine, is um, currently and has for a long time now, the large tree at the west edge of the property been um, infestated with a, a red bark beetle. And so some of its health has been compromised. And when you take the time to move a tree, a large mature tree that's been there a long time, you want it to be in very good health. And um, even, even a very healthy tree, such as a Canary Island pine, will have difficulty in transport and relocating and getting established at its new lo location. So the arborist, his initial finding was that moving them would be high, it would, a long-term success of relocating the trees would be not very good. In fact, his his observation over the years has been that very few of the trees survive. If you move a younger tree, it has much better rate of adapting to a new set setting. So that's the first part. The second, the first question you had is about um, preserving the trees along Bay Street. And we were able to modify the the footprint of the buildings so that they staggered and we were able to keep four of the trees. The uh, Canary Island pine furthest west happens to fall right where the edge of the parking foundation is. And looking at the drip line, the required uh, drip line and protection <coughs> zone of the tree canopy, we just weren't able to safely do it. And that's also the tree that's in compromised condition. Thank you. Um, Ryan Bain, I'm just wondering, um, when an applicant comes into the office, as Ms. Greensight uh, suggested, wouldn't you wouldn't you say, hey, you, you have to preserve that tree? So you know, if you're going to build a project, you're going to have to build a project around that that tree. Yes, it's cer it's certainly something that we look at right right from the beginning in terms of what trees. I mean, if, for example, you know, in terms of this site, if there were a large tree right in the center, it's it's likely not something that we're going to be able to save. Um, especially with underground parking and, and what have you. If it's something that's along the edge that where you can um, manipulate the building to go around it, as Joni mentioned, then that's something that we're gonna encourage them to do. Thank you. I, I would like to uh, make a motion to require an environmental impact report that adequately addresses the potential for significant environmental impacts in the following areas. Number one, traffic. Number two, parking. Number three, geologic safety and number four, noise and light and shadow impacts on Clearview Court. I'd like to direct the staff to make initial project analysis public through the incorporation into a draft EIR and then circulating a draft EIR for comment. There's a motion by Councilmember Crone. Is there a second? Second. There's a second by Councilmember Brown. Um, <coughs> that concludes your questions. Okay, Councilmember Brown. And then Vice Mayor Cummings, Matthews, and then Myers. So thank you for uh, the presentations from the developers and the staff. I um, do have a couple of questions that I'd like to just put out there. One, um, and many of my CEQA questions have been um, discussed uh, already, so I won't ask them again. Um, but I did want to ask, and I think this is probably for Lee or Bonnie, uh, question related to the affordability. Can you refresh our memory about the um, 
the requirement, the inclusionary requirement, I, and I understand that we're not talking about um, additional um, affordability on the density bonus units. I think um, that's in just that we've, we've clarified that and, and it's a conversation for another day if I'm reading the tea leaves here correctly. Um, but I did want to know if you could re refresh our memory how many units are required and at what level of affordability to get the 35% density bonus units. Sure. So <clears throat> the city's inclusionary ordinance requires 15% of the base project and that is required at 80% of the area median income as the affordability level. There are multiple ways in which a project applicant can receive the 35% density bonus. That's the maximum density bonus that's allowed per state law and per, and per our local code currently. And um, the way that the developer has proposed is to provide 11% um, at very low income. There are two other options. You could provide 20% um, at low income or 40% uh, at uh, moderate. Um, and that is for ownership only. Um, and, and those are going off the top of my head, but I believe those numbers are accurate if I'm recalling correctly. But I am certain that the applicant is proposing the 11% of the base project at very low income, which is 50% um, of the area median income. Right, so and that, so relative, so I understand our inclusionary ordinance is 15% at 80% of median, but there are other levels of subsidy in order to get X number of density bonus units, and I, I guess it's not entirely clear what is they must do at low, very low income. Sure. So level of for thirty five percent. Right. So so to, for thirty five percent, all they have to do under the state code and our local code is provide the eleven percent at very low. Now, the eleven percent at very low still doesn't make them fully compliant with our inclusionary ordinance. So our inclusionary ordinance requires 15% at 80% at, uh, at of AMI, um, area median income. And, and therefore they provide the 11% at 50% of the area median income. And then to make up the 4% that's left over to get to the 15%, that 4% of the base project is at the 80% AMI. Yes, I, yeah. A lot of percentages I, there. <laughs> so, and thank you for helping to clarify. I studied the density bonus r law and I can't remember all of everything. And um, so Very I appreciate complex. that. But if I, just to, to be clear, the, the, the project is doing the minimum required. The project is doing what is required <coughs> in required. order to get the 35% density bonus and to comply with the city's inclusionary. Yes, it is not going above and beyond that. Um, and we cannot require that they go above and beyond that. I understand that. I, that's a conversation for another day. Yes. Um, uh, but I just wanted to clarify that. Sure. Thank you. Um, so in terms of, I have other questions. I, you know, I guess I'm, I'm still wanting to get a little more clarity on the height limit modifications, the shadow uh, study, the noise study, and the, um, just a quick question about setbacks. Um, I don't wanna belabor these, but I do believe it's important to have this conversation um, now because um, my understanding is that um, if we did proceed with uh, requiring an environmental impact report, um, that we want to have some uh, public record of the potential for significant impacts, which is what we are required to do in order to uh, trigger an EAR. We are, we are supposed to identify the pot potentially significant impacts. Not The burden of proof is not here for us to <coughs> prove there are significant impacts. It is to identify potentially significant impacts. I believe that I'm on pretty solid ground there, but I, so I just want to kind of go through a couple of these. 
One related to the height limit modifications. I, can we get some clarity on the the question about um, the the deck versus cupboards <coughs> and scenery lofts? And, um, sure. Um, before we do that, I think I'd like to invite our CEQA attorney up um, regarding the um, the previous statement that you made about um, whether there may be a significant impact and whether that would trigger an environmental impact report under the exemption and reuse of the general plan EIR provisions that we're using. Um, sure, I, I appreciate that this um, area of CEQA is complicated and it is a different posture that the city is coming to this project in than would be a project of first impression um, completely or one that is um, not consistent in some way with your previous plans and is looking for, say, a zone change. Um, under those circumstances, you would be taking the uh, more precautionary approach that you're outlining about if there's any potential, what we call the fair argument under CEQA. But that's not this circumstance. You have a prior planning EIR and under those circumstances where you have then a subsequent project that is consistent with that prior plan and zone, you're looking at what did that previous EIR conclude and is there anything peculiar to this project or site that kicks it out of um, that review? And it is not the fair <coughs> argument standard in that instance. And that's demonstrated by the language of that statute and the guidelines section itself. It sets up a resumption um, that it has been covered and then you're looking for any substantial evidence that it will in fact have a different effect or a more severe effect than was studied in the EIR. So it's a little bit of a different posture and I appreciate the, the basis for the confusion about that, but it is not a situation in which we're in this fair argument. We've never considered developing this site before. You have looked at it at a macro level in the general plan EIR and that's what this, uh, this streamlining tool speaks to and requires the city to consider that it applies. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and respond to the uh, question involving the height. So, and this goes into pretty good detail in the staff report, but essentially the, um, the height exception that we're suggesting be made use of for this project includes both architectural features and roof equipment. Um, there are a couple things that are extending above the height limit on this project. One is the stairwells for which there's no question it falls under this requested exception. The others uh, are the trellis that provides some shade to the roof decks as well as support to the solar panels that'll be on top of them. So um, they really function as both an architectural feature as well as sort of a roof equipment function. Um, that in conjunction with the Beach and South of Laurel area plan, which not only includes um, the provision for breaking up flat roofs with, with different types of architectural features, but also encourages roof decks um, because of all that put together, um, we felt like this uh, particular exception um, really fit this project. And I would just add, if I could, um, we did take a very close look at this. And um, one of the additional things um, that um, increases above the height is the railings themselves. Um, and there isn't anything um, in the code that speaks to railings. However, it speaks to um, roof equipment and so forth. And uh, that is allowed to exceed as well as stairwells. And the California Building Code actually requires that um, railings be put in place in certain instances when when roof equipment is within proximity to the edges of a roof or um, if uh, you know, access uh, uh, walkways are higher than I think it's 30 inches. And so um, by virtue of the building code, there are requirements to put railings in uh, instances where equipment is in those locations. And so therefore um, it is also necessary for some of these roof decks and it would be anticipated through the zoning code that if you're allowing um, roof equipment that you also in some instances may require through the building code those protective railings. 
So wanted to add that because that was a, a separate element that we hadn't um, addressed in the agenda report, but is something that would be exceeding the 47 feet in height. Thank you. Um, so I had a couple of other questions. Uh, you know, I, there seems to be some dis difference of opinion about the level of how satisfactory the shadow study analysis um, or the shadow study is and whether or not sufficient analysis has been done. Um, and so I, it would be helpful to get a little more clarification about that as well. Um, I'm told that the, um, uh, that uh, the ensemble group has, you know, has done this study and that it's complete, but I'm also hearing from people and we've seen it in our public comment that in fact, it doesn't look at, um, <coughs> it doesn't do a thorough analysis. I'll just leave it there into more detail, but I'd like to get hear a little bit more about that as well to better understand what that, that there, how we could be saying there is no significant impact when what I am seeing <laughs> from people who have taken a look at this pretty closely are saying that it is going to have a pretty significant impact. And um, so for example, People are saying this is this project will permanently block solar access in the mornings along the western border all year. In late fall through winter, will block the sun all day <coughs> on the north and most of the day till just before sunset on the west. So I'm just trying to get some clarity on that. So first off, we do not have a CEQA threshold for um, shade and shadow. There are some large cities that do um, have CEQA thresholds. Um, I have seen that, for example, with shading of public parks. I have not seen that for shading of private properties from a CEQA perspective. That's not to say that it isn't out there in some city. Cities can establish their own CEQA thresholds that is within the, the purview. However, we have traditionally not uh, identified shading as a uh, CEQA impact, and there's nothing in the um, environmental checklist that would identify shade or shadow as a significant impact. Those cities as I mentioned, can um, require their own. So, so that is, uh, that's how I would respond to that. Um, in terms of the specifics I don't, of the sh shade and shadow study that was prepared, I'd just ask if, if there's anything that either of you would like to add. Yeah, I'm, we, I haven't heard any, I haven't had anyone um, have any issues with the accuracy of this. I've, that's, that's the first I've heard of that. Um, but we, I mean, we certainly have, um, architect, architectural consultants that could peer review and look at this, but um, we, like I said, we don't. In, in terms of CEQA, we're not looking at shadow impacts. That's not part of part of the CEQA um, review. Um, in terms of us looking at it from a design review standpoint, um, I think what we want to do is try to diminish the impacts as much as possible. Um, and I think in our looking at the setback requirements along um, both of those, the western and northern property lines, um, I mean, the first floor could be at eight feet. And I'd, I'd have to look back and see what exactly it is. But the setbacks um, that are provided along both of those are uh, almost, almost, in some cases, double of what our zoning code requires. So certainly the buildings have been stepped back quite a bit more than what would be normally allowed. And in that case, we look at it as that is reducing <coughs> shadow impacts because of that extreme setback. And I would just add um, that if it pleases the mayor and council, the uh, consultant who prepared the shade and shadow study is here and available if, if you have any specific questions for him. No, I think I'm good on that. Um, thank you. Uh, and the next question is related to noise. Um, I see that a noise impact analysis was done uh, as per the recommendations of the Planning Commission. And I did not see, um, 
I guess I'm, I still have questions about the, uh, the impact at peak hours and the impact on the road that runs along uh, the driveway that really is going to be, have a lot of traffic, I imagine, um, on the, the side of the project that runs along Clearview. Um, so I'm just, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, why it was, why the noise impact study was done in such a way as to, kind of, I, I know where the points were selected, um, and I just am not clear that that analysis gets us to an understand, a real understanding of the impact for Clearview. Sure. I'll try to explain a little bit. Um, it was based in part on existing noise measurements that were taken. One was at the new um, entrance off of Bay. One was taken on the other side where uh, traffic would be coming on, uh, the valet traffic would be coming up from um, West Cliff and then one at the beginning of the site. So it established a um, baseline of what the existing ambient noise levels are and then um, the analysis went through three different operational noise, um, possible changes in operational noise. So the traffic into the parking structure from Bay is based on various studies that look at traffic volumes and the noise that is generated. And there's just certain thresholds of traffic, numbers of cars, and it's, it's relatively significant the amount of cars that have to um, occur in order for a change in an, a decibel or two in the ambient noise level. So the analysis was based on that with the traffic going into the bay, it's going into the parking garage, it's underground, it's sheltered, um, and it was found that there wasn't going to be any noticeable um, change in the noise levels resulting from that. There was also an analysis of uh, noise effects from the fans in the garage, and those were also screened and sheltered and um, wasn't found to have a significant impact. And then lastly, the noise levels related to the um, uh, mechanical equipment on the roof, which again was sheltered and also was not found to exceed the noise levels of um, the city's um, regulations, which generally do not permit a noise level increase of more than <coughs> five decibels at the property line. Um, and the study also did look at construction vibration from the excavation for the parking lot, and it did not meet the thresholds for annoyance or um, structural damage. So, thank you, um, and I guess, and I did read the study, so I'm familiar with that um, analysis, or the, the what was done, but um, I guess maybe a follow-up question. Can you say something more about how the ST1, 2, and 3, so I, I'm, I'm looking at the um, locations, how those were selected? Well, it was based on the professional judgment of the acoustic um, person who's working on it, but clearly ST1 is where the new entrance is, and that was one of the concerns that was raised at the Planning Commission, and ST2 was on the other uh, road that would be used by vehicles, and again, the, the vehicle traffic was a concern, and um, I think the, the front was just to get an ambient reading of what the noise levels on West Cliff Drive are, are like, and they also um, <coughs> did do a summary also with the existing traffic at those two streets, um, Bay and West Cliff, just to determine the existing ambient noise level. And that one's not one of the one. So. Bay and West Cliff, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I think those are all of the questions that I have for staff. And thank you, developers as well. Vice Mayor coming. Just wondering, somebody from the developer team could maybe come up. I have a question regarding the studies that were done that led to the exemption and just wondered if you could speak to what studies were conducted because with regards to this checklist, my understanding based on um, the reports and everything that's been done is that there were a number of um, studies 
and analyses that were done on this site with regards to traffic, um, as we just heard, noise, um, and a variety of other studies that were done geologic to, to make the determination that this project would be exempt. And so I'm wondering if someone could speak to that. Sure, I would be happy to. Um, yes, there were a number of technical studies that were prepared and some of them peer reviewed, um, including traffic. Um, all listed in here, there's traffic. There were two geotechnical, there was a geologic in terms of the slope stability. Um, well, there are a couple of traffic. There's a traffic peer review by the city's consultants. Um, archaeology that also included, um, there were two archaeology reports. One included some subsurface testing, <coughs> arborist report, stormwater drainage plan, the project photo simulations. There was a traffic demand management plan that was prepared and peer reviewed by the city's um, transportation consultant. And I th think, oh, air quality and energy analysis, as well as the noise analysis that was prepared after the planning commission. And they're all listed in the references in this do CEQA document. Thanks. And by meeting, by having these reports conducted and having these, these technical reports conducted, this is what led to the decision that an exemption was appropriate rather than an EIR. I'm going to let Sabrina explain it a yeah. little, little bit more articulate this time of night than I am. <laughs> <laughs> How articulate at 1130. My best. Um, so I think it's important to note that they these studies, this is the same level of study you would that would form the basis for an EIR. In other words, you start with the technical studies, you say, you know, first of all, we're looking at a project that is consistent with the land use designations, and then we look at in order to determine whether it has any peculiar to the project or parcel, then you do all these technical studies. And the conclusions of those studies would drive the conclusions of significance and consistency with the general plan. So if you had a traffic study then that said, you know, you're going to completely blow up, um, blow up those intersections, you know, well beyond what was predicted in the general plan or beyond the levels of significance that were set or deemed acceptable in the general plan, then that might be an impact that is peculiar to the project or the parcel that might then trigger further analysis in an EIR. But because of the conclusions of all of these um, the conclusions were that either there would be no impact or that the impact is within um, the levels predicted in the general plan EIR or assumed for this kind of development um, of this type. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> Basically, those are what drive you staying in the exemption or not. And so again, as I mentioned before, in order to, um, to trigger a new EIR, you would have to cite to substantial evidence that demonstrates that there will be a new significant impact or one that wasn't uh, addressed at all in the general plan EIR. Does that answer your question? Sorry, a little incoherent at 11.30. No, it's fine. Um, during public comment, and this, um, it, this might be a good question Wait, for okay. you, might be a good question for Tony, but during, the, um, during public comment, Many people from the public were saying, you know, deny this project for a variety of different reasons. And my understanding is that there are, and what I really want to, you know, get the community to understand is what is the legal basis for us to be able to deny a project? Um, because my understanding is that there are a number of assembly bills, um, specifically Assembly Bill 3194, that makes it um, difficult for municipalities to deny projects just based on, um, well, that when they don't have objective standards. So I'm wondering if you could speak to, in this situation, one, what is our ability to deny this project and what would be the consequences for denying a project based on uh, the state law? 
Okay, so um, you do have a, another attorney here that is your expert on all things housing law and density bonus related, and I think those are the provisions that you're interested in hearing about. Not to my knowledge, is there anything under CEQA that would prohibit you from denying the project? But there may very well be housing and density bonus laws that would act on that. I'll invite her up. <coughs> Is that going to be uh, Mr. Condotti? You want me to lead it off, or do you, would you like Barbara to? I, I will. I will defer to Barbara. But essentially, um, you will need to to find that there are um, adverse public adverse public health, health and safety, safety concerns, and they have to be specific and objective and so supported um, by substantial evidence right and supported by substantial evidence and this and the standard is essentially turned on its head with respect to projects that have, um, fall under the um <coughs> the housing accountability act and i have just um sent a message on that but i'll defer to barbara <laughs> until i can find my notes Hi, Mayor and Council I, uh, members. I'm Barbara Kautz. I'm a partner at Gold Farm Lippman, and I do a lot on housing law, which has become bigger and bigger every year, more and more complicated. Um, anyway, the legislature, I think, with uh, the Housing Accountability Act and SB 35, wants to make it harder. There's actually a finding for cities to deny projects, to deny housing projects or reduce their density. And basically, the provision that the city attorney was reading states that if a project conforms with all objective uh, zoning and general plan standards, and you want to either deny the project or reduce the density, you have to make a finding that there is a specific adverse impact on public health and safety, which is defined much more strictly than it is in CEQA that it means a significant, quantifiable, direct, and unavoidable impact based on objective, identified, written public health or safety standards uh, as they existed on the date the application was deemed complete, and you have to make a finding there's no way to mitigate the impact. So essentially what this statute requires is that you either find that a project is not consistent with an objective standard or if the, and uh, everything in the staff report says it is consistent because a density bonus, it, it also has language saying that uh, if they get a density bonus or uh, they're still considered to be consistent. So unless you can find a project to be not consistent with some standard, <coughs> you have to make this very difficult health and safety finding. And frankly, I don't know any community that's been able to make it because Really, if it uh, didn't conform with a health or safety uh, standard, it probably didn't conform with objective standards, right? And then the other issue that, and then they've made it very difficult for you to find that a project's inconsistent. Um, there's another provision that the city attorney was referencing where he talked about it turning uh, evidence on its head. Um, generally, when courts look at a decision that a city's make, made, they give a lot of deference to what the city council did. Uh, if you have any kind of substantial evidence supporting a decision to approve or deny, usually the council gets, the courts will uphold it. Um, but they changed it to say uh, that in this case, a housing project shall be deemed consistent if there's substantial evidence that would allow a reasonable person to conclude the project's consistent so that even if the council feels that the project is not consistent with some standard, um, if somebody else has introduced evidence saying, well, yes, I think I am consistent, and a court finds that that's reasonable, um, it'll find the project consistent and overturn the denial. Um, so, so these laws together are designed to make it very hard to turn down housing projects. And I was just curious if there's any like financial consequences that could go on to the city. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, the city, uh, if the city loses, it's liable for paying the other side's attorney's fees. Um, then 
then if the uh, if a court uh, remands the project, say back to the city, and you still and they find that you still haven't approved the project or your actions have been in bad faith, uh, the count the court can adopt. Uh, let's see, can fine the city ten thousand dollars per unit. Um, I don't think that's happened, but um, there was a case in Berkeley where uh, Berkeley agreed that it had violated the Housing Accountability Act, and then when the project was returned to them, to the council, it turned down a demolition permit so that the project couldn't be built. The court was very angry, so I think the provision, that provision was made to discourage that kind of action by a city. Okay. Um, Thanks. A couple other questions, and this might be for um, staff or for the developers. Is there any way that we would be able to track who's purchasing these condos? Because I think one of the things that folks are concerned about in the community is that these are going to either go <clears throat> towards, especially the, the higher end condos would likely go towards people from outside the community. Um, they might be second family homes. So I'm just wondering if there's any potential way we would be able to track who's actually making these purchases and kind of where their previous residency was. I can address it actually for the affordable unit specifically. And this also goes to a question um, that Councilmember Crone and I think Councilmember Glover also asked um, earlier. And I should say um, Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. Um, for the inclusionary units, we uh, very specifically will be looking at, and it's, it's largely on income verification, um, but we will um, enter into an agreement with, with the developer um, at the time of it, whether it's an, an a developer agreement, um, there's also a participation agreement. We may specifically do an affordable housing agreement, but we will actually deed restrict each unit so that when it's sold, um, we'll get a notice when it's ready to be sold. We do an income verification. We'll often work with the housing authority to verify that based on the size of the unit. Um, and um, for this particular instance, um, since we have 50% of area median income, I don't know the exact breakdown yet of the 50% for the very low units for the one, two, and three bedroom, but we'll come up with a maximum sales price for each of those units. We'll even know which unit they are within the overall project, and then we track that. They, um, we record that against the unit um, when it's sold, and the owner agrees um, to verify the city whenever they want to sell it in the future, which then we then go through a whole income verification again. Um, and then we also put on our website, and Housing Authority does as well, um, when these units are available. Um, for this project at this point in time, if these units were available today, and obviously they're not, they're not built yet, um, but for the very low units, that range starting at one bedroom is, is in the you know, low to mid 200,000s. So those are very low units to be able to have those in the community, and we'll have eight of those you know, from one bedroom up to, up to three bedroom. So there is a process um, that we use for income verification within the community. Um, as far as verifying that they're Santa Cruz residents, we don't have that um, specifically in our agreement. Um, it is based on income verification, but we do, um, it, Typically, because we're posting these on our website, they're through the housing authority, there's typically waiting lists. Um, we'll send out notifications for people who are interested, and they typically are residents. Two more, two more questions. Yeah, okay. um, two more, and then I'll, I'll move on. Um, the first question, oh, I just drew a blank. Um, second question. Second question. One of the things I'm curious about is whether or not there's any potential for increasing affordability within this project or if there's any way, um, because knowing that our community really needs more affordable housing and this is meeting some of the um, needs of our community, I'm wondering if there's a potential <clears throat> for increasing affordability on site or off site within this project. Um, if there was going to be anything, it would have to be voluntary. Um, and we have had some discussions with uh, uh, 
uh, Bonnie, just to understand, you know, what the, what the city's priorities and needs are for um, uh, uh, affordable housing, and we've definitely studied the issue and want to support affordable housing in the city. Um, you know, with that said, um, you know, that the application is, you know, complete as presented, but if there was uh, a, a specific request from the city council, um, we would uh, consider it. Can't remember my other question, so. Do you have a question? I had a related one, uh, and Bonnie, I think it's for you. It may be what some of the others have been getting at is, what what's the maximum we can legally do that the affordable units go to local residents? I think. That's that my something question. on everyone's mind. And I know this is just, I'll just say, I know this was something that came up when we did the house. Over and over again. Right. I mean, well, yeah. the, the only thing I'm aware of that we've done for some of our affordable housing projects is we've had a preference. Um, and so, for example, at the Tannery Arts Center, we had an artist preference. And specifically um, for that project, um, you know, it, you still had all the same income verification um, for affordability. But in addition to that, um, residents needed to proclaim that they were an artist. So they showed a portfolio, there was a panel. Um, so that was the only vetting. Um, there was no determination of whether or not anyone thought that that was um, worthy of calling themselves an artist, but that was the preference that was established. And by and large, it was self-selecting, self but that is a preference um, that um, we were able to have as part of that project. Well, I'm so we have our developer who wants to speak. Um, one issue with preferences is there can be a fair housing issue. Um, if the demographics of the city of Santa Cruz are different from the demographics of the market area, um, there, you know, for instance, there was a very white town in Alabama that had a residency preference and that was found to violate the fair housing sure. law. So a lot would depend on looking at the de demographics of the city compared to the demographics of the area and making sure that there wouldn't be a disparate impact. It was encouraging to hear your interest in wanting to outreach to our local community. So, so part of our preference for doing the on-site very low income is to create residency opportunities for folks that are service employees that may currently be um, living with a friend, they may be living out of their car, they may, in some cases, they've been commuting from Watsonville for 29 years, cleaning hotel rooms or working in a restaurant, washing dishes or waiting tables. And many of these people have been coming to Santa Cruz every day for 29 years, and does that make them any less or any more deserving than someone that already has a Santa Cruz address? And um, I would submit respectfully that um, those folks, those you know, working families who have you know a commitment to Santa Cruz, that uh, are folks that we would like to help, uh, that, that we would like to offer the homes to, you know, in, in according to fair housing standards, in addition to folks that already have a Santa Cruz residence address, and we're going to be. You know, having outreach and publicizing, um, you know, how to buy homes to you know local service workers at the Dream Inn, and I don't, and, and I hope the City Council would, you know, consider folks that are you know working at the uh, Dream Inn to be you know just as deserving, whether that person has a Santa Cruz address today, or you know maybe they're commuting, but they'd like to have a Santa Cruz address. If I could just wrap up this, I thoroughly understand that, and what I meant by my intentions was people who are living or working in Santa Cruz, and um, I would just like to see as this moves forward that we we uh, expressly uh, state our preference for maximizing sale of the affordable units to people who, within allowable law, uh, uh, demonstrate they're living or working in Santa Cruz. 
Yes. So we have Councilmember Myers, Glover, and then I have a comment, and then Councilmember Brown, and then um, Vice Mayor Cummings. Uh, just a quick, I think most of my questions have been asked. Um, I had a similar question about some of the CEQA, but I think that list, I was looking at the list in the uh, initial study, so that, that <coughs> describes all the additional studies. Okay, I just want to make sure that um, I was looking at the list of recent studies. Uh, we just talked about local buyers. Um, there was a question from the public about the loading zones. Is that where, what, what does that look like? Just so I understand a little bit better. Um, so here, if, it, if you can see this mouse pointer. Uh-huh, um, yeah, I saw that service, yeah. So there, the, there's a service dock here. Mm -hmm. and the, the trash areas are actually internal to the building. They're right there next to the loading docks. They're actually pretty far away from the property line and they'd be vented out to the highest roof. So the, those, uh, so, so, and that trash would have to be, you know, wheeled out oh, to, the, to, 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 to the property line for the trash truck. In addition, there's a drop off area for ride shares so that uh, uh, someone picking up their friend or an Uber or Lyft or other services is not gonna be uh, clogging up uh, you know, West Cliff or Bay Street, but there is an opportunity for people that are getting dropped off or picked up, whether it's from a friend or a third party service, to uh, be at that uh, drop off area that's actually covered. So if there's a vehicle, you know, idling, waiting for someone to be picked up, that would be under the covered portion of the, uh, uh, of the building. So we've got a certain, <coughs> that answer your question? Yeah, so it, it, you know, there's a delivery truck that's bringing paper cups to the cafe. They're gonna pull in on the backside there, come around, and they'll use that that service loading dock there that's internal in that correct, area. Correct, correct. There's that service corridor you can see adjacent to it. So they won't be idling. I just wanna make sure they're not gonna be idling right on that backside over, on either side of where the residentials are. Correct, correct. that's a 37 foot deep service dock. Okay. Um, let me just double check here. Um, yeah, I think that's it on my questions. I mean, I think uh, just, yeah, I'll just wait for hopefully a motion at some point. And, and, we, and we have a, <laughs> we do have a motion on the floor. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Councilmember Glover, did you have comments? Thank you. Um, yeah. So just curious to follow up on that question about the loading dock. Um, how big are the anticipated trucks? that are coming in. And just looking at that turn, I, I see there's a curved side, side on the end over there, but are you, how big are the trucks and are you expecting them to make that turn into that? Or are they going to back up into the service dock because most trucks offload from the back? So can you explain that process to me? So um, the, the, the typical uh, truck deliveries are gonna be uh, you know, a, a small truck. This is; these are not the sort of uses that bring a, a semi or a large truck. Most of these, uh, you know, are really more delivery vans or 18-foot trucks. They're nowhere close to the uh, to the dimension of that dock there. And also, this dock is a full driveway wide. So, if, if one, it's 24 or 26 feet <coughs> wide. 24. 24 feet wide, and so a truck itself is, you know, maybe, you know, eight or nine feet wide. So you could actually have two trucks parked there with enough room to, you know, to, to load it from the back, walk around the truck, between the trucks to the service corridor. A truck would not, necess would not necessarily need to back in, and there's uh, adequate turning radius. Uh, so uh, that's, that's been studied. So where's the uh, materials for, say, all of the, <clears throat> all the businesses? So the deliveries that are going to be made for the restaurants and the retail shops and all that kind of stuff, are they all going to be offloaded in that cargo dock? Yes. And you're saying they're all going to be 18-foot trucks? I'm not sure if the, some of them may be a delivery van, some of them might be slightly larger, but these are not semi-type of operations. These are... Uh, the, Is that a guarantee? Is that a guarantee? Yes. 
because that will significantly impact the sound and noise experienced by the people on that uh, level, a joint conjoining fence. And then if the truck is backing into there, then you're going to have, uh, we all know what large trucks sound like when they back up. They have the warning sirens. So is that going to be going on in the, in the morning? Because I know <laughs> usually delivery trucks happen in the early morning to avoid traffic and all that kind of stuff. And then what routes will those larger trucks, which you, I don't know if you can guarantee or not, aren't going to be large trucks, which route are they going to take to get to the facility? Well, uh, I can start off by saying that the uh, that the the noise would first impact the uh, homeowners above and the condo residents just as much or more than any uh, adjacent neighbors as well, and we have a vested interest in. Um, making sure that we have happy buyers, happy homeowners, and significant liability uh, to the extent that that doesn't happen. So we are highly motivated <laughs> to sign leases with provisions to control that. And I would add that these are hotel ancillary facilities, so the majority of the space is hotel spaces. The spa and retail, is, first of all, doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, cups deliveries or, you know, it's not like we're bringing in semis of paper goods. Um, but that, that was her, uh, the council member's example. Uh, I'm looking at some of the example images that are included in the packet. Okay. And there are some rather high end looking restaurants and, you know, all that other kind of stuff. And with the amount of locations that are um, denoted in the layout with how many, you know, the different retail spaces and then the market hall. I mean, if you're going to be selling things, you said you didn't want to have people have to go to Walgreens. So how are you going to be stocking that facility uh, with those goods. And also I'm really worried about equity, which is the reason why I'm asking. Now, if I'm someone that's paid, so how much are the, 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 the for-profit ones again? Um, we don't have a price estimate other than we can compare them to uh, the, the prices of housing in the area huh? uh, and across the street. Those have been for anywhere from about 800 to about a million four. Okay, yeah, because I, I spoke with someone that lives over there, and I believe they're uh, 1.6. Okay. So if I was someone that came in and was able to afford 1.6 million for a condo, uh, which I'm sure probably has additional soundproofing, but I was a next door neighbor that was living in a mobile home park that had no soundproofing, an eight foot sound wall, and was overshadowed by a five foot uh, ex exorbitant <laughs> condominium complex that had to deal with their delivery truck noises. I would be a little disconcerted, which is why I think we're having such a outcry from the low income neighborhood that's neighboring to it, as well as the issues associated with their quality of life. So uh, especially because there was that hesitation of being able to guarantee there aren't going to be big semi trucks there and the, the, the curiosity as to where those trucks are going to travel, the impact of how it's going to uh, deal with Bay and that turn, or if they are going to be going through the roundabout uh, down by the boardwalk, which is a terrible uh, design, in my opinion. Um, I'm a little concerned. Uh, everything else, you know, it sounds like a beautiful project, and I'm sure it will look great and serve a lot of great functions, but I'm worried about the impact of low-income people, especially since, yes, as was mentioned before, we may house 10 low-income people that they can own, but we may be disproportionately impacting and negatively impacting the life of 60-some-odd-plus other low-income people so that 79 rich people can afford, or people that have uh, an income that can suffice to those numbers can have a comfortable living and a fantastic view of the bay based off of some of your, um, your design things there with the glass panes and everything. It looks beautiful. But again, I'm, I'm very concerned, especially with your inability to give me solid answers on some of the delivery and noise complications with that neighboring wall. So, so my hesitation as to whether 18 feet is the appropriate standard. Um, I'm not a truck expert in terms of knowing whether it's an 18-foot truck or a 19.6. Or I know it's not a large semi, and I can guarantee that. But I can't guarantee the length or the you know the, I don't know the exact classifications. I could. Um, uh, I guess Juan, would you be able to speak to what the turning radiuses were analyzed? Um, that's just it's it's not a it's not a, da a piece of data I have at my fingertips, but I can commit to having specific uh, delivery hours of operation and noise standards in the CCNRs, which a draft of which was already submitted. There's already conditions of approval for staff and public works to review and approve the final CCNRs 
which will include noise and delivery schedules and the size of trucks and vehicles for the commercial space. Great, thank you. And then I will just say uh, to end my room of questioning, just a comment is just to remind my colleagues that the motion on the floor is not to whether or not to approve or deny the project, it is whether to move forward with a full EIR to understand the impacts and the potential unintended consequences of the development since there has not been a complete EIR uh, and as well a, a robust uh, analysis of the equity of the space. So I just want to put that out there because we should be careful with this. I support housing. I love that there's 10 affordable housing units. Um, but uh, the question I think that came up is what's the cost of doing nothing was what someone mentioned. But what's the cost of doing this I think is something that we need to be thinking about. And also uh, just being cognizant of other options. Now, I totally agree, though, with a $1.6 million, one point, you know, 800000 to one point four, if we go from your estimations, uh, if we, as a council, put on the ballot some increased real estate transfer taxes, then, sure, let's build some for-profit housing so that we can uh, generate some additional money into the general fund. But until we hear that report back from the Revenue Generation Subcommittee, or we take a strong stance and put that on the ballot, I'm a little hesitant to approve a um, million-plus uh, dollar units. I'll just make a few brief comments as we start to inch towards uh, the late hours and um, ultimately need to come to some sort of decision this evening. I think that we have to remember that Santa Cruz is not only one of the most least affordable places in the nation, it's internationally. And we need to, um, as a council, re figure out a way to balance um, process and to be in action. And for me, I feel that it's imperative that we take action. And so I won't personally be supporting the motion on the floor. I think that we need to start making decisions. We need to be in action. We owe that to the community. This is a project that I um, recognize has um, elements that are unanswered or um, not necessarily ideal for certain folks. I totally understand that. And I think a lot of the mitigations and anticipation for really focusing on um, you know, local uh, emphasis, especially around local folks trying to get uh, into some affordable housing is huge. And um, there is a cost to doing nothing. And there is a cost to being stuck in process, in my opinion. And um, we're at a place now where we need to take action. So I won't be supporting the motion on the floor. And um, as we approach midnight, I hope that we can get to a place where we're making a decision on this. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Um, thank you. So I want to make a few comments now while I have the floor and then just ask one last question um, so I don't keep raising my hand. Uh, and I want to say I really like this project. I mean, I, I don't mean to say that by wanting to complete an EIR that I'm opposed to building here, that I'm opposed to, opposed to density, that I would, I prefer a parking lot over uh, housing. That is in no way the case. I, I like many aspects of the project. I appreciate uh, the ensemble group's uh, willingness and all the work they've done to, to engage the community and to try to respond to um, concerns to the extent that um, was feasible for you and I would, you know, with all due respect, financially feasible. Um, I appreciate the very low income units. We absolutely need them. Um, and again, with all due respect, this is the minimum um, that is required, that this is, this is what we can require. And so um, a real commitment to affordable housing to me is kind of going above and beyond that. And I know we can't require that because we have particular policies in place, but um, that's what I'm really advocating for in our community. We need affordable housing. Um, I appreciate the commitment to addressing pedestrian and bike safety. Um, I absolutely am I'm thrilled about the idea that this may provide um, an increase in the number of union jobs in our community, which we sorely need. Um, that said, I just think it's unfortunate that um, the city did not encourage Ensemble <coughs> Group to do an EIR when this project was first proposed. Um, I think we could have, this could have led to, um, you know, addressing these concerns, you know, getting, really getting through a full analysis, public input, um, 
you know, I believe in this case, and I think there are good reasons to um, tear off the general plan EIR in, in some cases, and I don't know that this is one of them. Um, you know, <coughs> our general plan EIR assumed 54 units in the beach area. <laughs> 54. Um, and it only analyzed potentially significant impacts <coughs> for that many units. And I understand that um, technical studies have been done to, um, you know, satisfy the checklist that's required to um, tear off the general plan EIR. But the purpose of an EIR is to identify significant impacts that are particular to uh, site. And I do think there are some potential particularities here. Um, and tearing off the general plan EIR is not a precedent that I feel we should be setting as the precedent for any um, major projects that come before us. Um, I, I just don't. Um, with res and I'm just going to go back to the, you know, with respect to the affordable housing aspect, um, you know, we have, we have, yes, I, I agree, we need housing. We need to build housing. We need to um, move through and not get delayed in process. I am very much interested in doing that. But what I have seen in the past um, year, past few years, is the approval by the city council um, of projects that provide housing um, but at a very high cost with very little affordability. In fact, we've been um, providing exemptions for a number of years. And so to say, suggest that the market, that market actors are going to somehow provide affordable housing for us <coughs> through the projects that we approve, it, I, it just is hard for me to, to I, I just don't see any evidence of that substantiated. I see a few units here, a few units there. Um, and if anything, again, we have approved projects where the, uh, the rents for even a studio apartment are significantly higher than the average in our community. So they are helping to drive up housing costs in our community. They are not making housing more affordable. And um, so I guess I'm going to, I'll end there with my, my comments, but um, my last uh, reference is, will be a question. Um, is there anything, you know, I understand the uh, Housing Accountability Act, we've, we've talked about this and how it precludes us from, oppose, from um, turning down projects. Um, but as uh, Council Member Glover mentioned, the, per, the motion on the floor is not to oppose, to turn down this project, it's to require an EIR. And so I wanna ask and get clarification, is there anything in um, either the Housing Accountability Act or any other state law that precludes us from requiring an environmental impact report on this project? Councilmember Brown, I'll just refer you to the language again of uh, 21083.3 of the Public Resources Code, where it uh, speaks that the <coughs> where a project is consistent with the zoning in the prior plan for which an EIR was certified, this is the project that you, this is the process you shall follow, unless there is substantial evidence of an impact that is not mitigated by um, one of the uniformly applied development policies or standards. And I, I hear your concern about the amount of impact on the community, but what I haven't heard tonight is a citation to any specific piece of substantial evidence that contradicts the conclusions of the report. Um, and so that's what you would need to cite to in order to get out of this process and into an EIR. Thank you. I'll try and be pretty brief. Um, most of my specific questions were answered in the course of other people's comments. Um, and I am satisfied with the answers, but um, I think fundamentally I get back to the um, pretty, to my mind, straightforward logic. This is a project that meets the zoning and general plan that we have. It's consistent. The 
general plan EIR covers the very broad brush of uh, issues contained in this project. The specific <coughs> issues to this project are dealt with in a whole series of additional technical reports which we've received. Um, the project is covered by the Housing Accountability Act. It is uh, also, um, it benefits from the streamlining provision of having an uh, overarching EIR um, that deals with many of the issues. We've heard about a new legal reality that we're in um, having to do with uh, needing to justify specifically denials um, with, I, as I wrote down, quantifiable objective written standards. And we are, um, the city then is liable for defending that. Um, all of this leads me <coughs> to think that um, this is an appropriate project to approve, I will not be supporting the motion at hand. I would like to uh, support a motion that that <coughs> follows a pretty, um, I would say, new to Santa Cruz reality, um, but one where the applicants have worked hard to listen to the community. I think this can be a really good project for our community, and we should make it uh, responsive to the concerns that have been raised here. I've raised a couple myself, and eventually I'd like to see those covered in a motion. But um, for the reasons I've spelled out, I can't support the motion on the floor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Cummings, then uh, Councilmember Myers, and then Councilmember Crone. I just want to thank um, all the staff, community members, and everyone who's come out tonight. I know that there's been a lot of input from the community. There's been a lot of input from staff. There's been a lot of work on this project. And there are a lot of new realities that are coming forward currently and in the coming years that really are going to change the way um, we're able to approve or deny developments that are coming into the city. Um, I'm very much for trying to increase affordable housing to the maximum extent possible in Santa Cruz because I agree with some mm. of my colleagues that as home prices go up, and as we see more expensive homes being built, that is going to drive the land costs up and costs around for everyone. So it does have the potential to make it less affordable um, for people who live here to buy homes in the future. That being said, um, I do have concerns with the legal challenges that we might be facing because of the fact that there are state laws <laughs> in effect that have very serious implications for us if we deny this project. So, and given the fact that we are already facing litigation for a number of other issues, um, I'm really concerned about opening up the city to more litigation. And as a city council, part of our job is to protect the city from litigation. And so um, I definitely hope that the developers can work with Clearview Court members to continue to address their concerns. I was able to see some of the light studies, and I think that um, they have tried to address some of the light issues. Um, and as we mentioned before, there are conditions to help, to help mitigate these traffic issues. And so given the fact that um, there is a potential for opening us up to more litigation, um, I'm not going to support the motion that's on the floor currently. And um, we'd like to see if we can work on another motion um, moving this project ahead. Um, so I'll just leave that there. <clears throat> Many of my comments were actually just stated between the last two speakers, but I will state that I um, I won't uh, be supporting the motion on the floor at this time, really due to the to the new uh, legal framework that we're operating under now with the state and uh, some of the some of the new legislation that's come through um, has really. Um, sort of set us on a various different course, um, I guess, in our analysis. So I won't be supporting the motion. Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Grover, and then let's take the vote. Thank you. Um, I think there are many questions here, and I think some of our policies need to be clarified, and that's why I, I think we need to take a step back and, 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 and do a full EIR. 
Um, this is the first project that, that's going through Santa Cruz with the, the, the density bonus attached to it. Um, <laughs> I think it behooves the council to act with restraint in achieving the greatest public benefit we, we possibly can. I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily hear that we, we if, how much, we, if we go ahead and do this, um, I think the, the lawyer just said that she's never heard of the fine of $10,000 per unit. I don't know if, um, what, what other examples she might have, if you have any other examples uh, of cities that have asked for a full EIR after this process has been followed, um, what was the outcome? The, the Housing Accountability Act actually doesn't go in, doesn't affect a project until review under the California Environmental Quality Act has been done. So there, there's not a, a, a fine, if you like, for um, requiring an EIR. So we, we, we but, but I would defer to your EIR, uh, your CEQA expert in terms of whether there's justification for doing an EIR, which is a different issue. Which I believe you've answered already. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I just wanna personally thank um, folks for their lengthy and unpaid voluntary efforts um, and did the deep dive into material that they brought. We just got so much stuff um, concerning this, you know, and I wanna thank um, Patricia Forrest and Anita Webb and Ron Pomerantz and uh, Safe Santa Cruz and uh, Jim Conway, Miriam Greenberg, Stu Phillips, Russell Wise and Andy Schifrin. Um, and uh, that one, uh, Cry for help from Kenny Weiss too. I, I hear you um, concerning what it's what it's like uh, at Clearview Court with um, with the prospect of two years of construction ahead of you. Uh, what it's going to be like to live there. So I, I'm, I would just like to see more information out there. And that's why I'm supporting um, you know that we do a full EIR. Last comments, and then we'll go ahead and take that. Though. Thank you. Uh, well, also, just so what came up from this is a question. So um, I appreciate the perspective of our EI, our, our CEQA expert. Have we gotten a second opinion from anyone? Or are we just going with one? Can anyone answer that? See some head shaking. <laughs> Having that uh, outside legal um, consultant that, that is essentially our second opinion. I mean, we've worked internally and then in having um, Remy Moose Manley on board, um, we have consulted with them as that second opinion. Great, thank you. And is that the findings of your office as well? Or the first? Yes, first, I, first, I, first I concur with the, uh, with the analysis provided by Ms. Teller. That there's not enough uh, of a reason or um, evidence through all the different things, even with the issues cited from the co community members and the claim that there will be, I know that, uh, so anyway, uh, even with all the other issue. things and all the other data, yeah. uh, there's no reason to think of that there could be um, enough evidence to go into an EIR. The issue is whether or not there's substantial evidence uh, of impacts that are peculiar to this project that weren't analyzed mm -hmm. in um, those other documents. And, okay. And I'm not aware of um, substantial evidence in, <laughs> in the reports and analysis that's been provided to you. Um, I, I've also heard a lot of, of earnest uh, calls for doing an EIR, but not significant substantial evidence that's been provided this evening that there's some impact that's unique to this project that hasn't already been analyzed. Okay, thank you. Um, so, there was the statement made tonight about part of the th part of the uh, the role of the city council is to protect the city from litigation, and I'm concerned about that philosophy, uh, especially when it comes at the sacrifice of the quality of life for potentially 68 people um, from a development that has come out in uh, for a lot of reasons is to be concerned about this, and for situations that have yet to be mitigated uh, and are still in limbo and are in question. We have other places in the community that have been dealing with issues of planning that were not thought out all the way and 
are still dealing with it a year later after trying to get to the council. So what's the impact that's going to happen with Clearview Court, especially with their removal of rent control and their questionable stability in their housing? They're losing people of color. And it was interesting uh, to hear the manager of the Dream Inn say uh, that he wants his guests to have the, quote, most authentic Santa Cruz experience and that he has been a quote, local for 10 years, but first came as a visitor. Um, I was born and raised here in Santa Cruz. Uh, my family lived here for a, uh, maybe one and, and a half generations before me, maybe. Uh, not even that, because my mom moved up from North Hollywood, uh, where she left when she was 17, so not even a full generation. Uh, my friends all have had to leave unless they have had independently wealthy parents that let them live at their house, uh, not because they're lazy or they don't have jobs, because they can't buy $1.6 million condos. Now, uh, is our job to solely protect the city from litigation, or is it to fight tooth and nail to protect the most vulnerable in our community? Uh, for me, it's that second one. Uh, it's come up in multiple conversations about stuff. And so to, to say that this is the right project for our community, which is another statement that was set up here a little while ago. Uh, how many local people that were born and raised in Santa Cruz are going to be able to afford one of those 79 condos? Uh, how many people work service jobs in Santa Cruz and are going to be fighting tooth and nail and competing over those 10 affordable units? What are we doing proactively? You know, I said, I heard it up here also, it's the time for action. So what are we doing tangibly, intentionally, focusing on the development of affordable housing. How are we raising additional funds to leverage into development of affordable housing? Why have we not already moved on these kinds of things with previous councils? And now all of a sudden, because of our council, we have to approve this project because of poor planning, poor tax measures, uh, and other things that have left the city in a massive deficit with, ter with terrible planning. So I, I don't like uh, that we have been put in this situation from a historic lack of political will to develop affordable housing, where now just to get, I was talking to affordable housing development um, advocates, they're like, it's better than nothing, it's better than nothing. And I get it, it is better than nothing, but how could we have let ourselves get to a point where we have to accept something like this just because it's better than nothing and because we're so worried about litigation? So I'm incredibly disappointed in my colleagues uh, that will be voting against even exploring an EIR to figure out what's going on uh, to understand the potential impacts of the, uh, of the project, even if we were to go through with it and you know all this other kind of stuff. So it's just uh, another disappointing day on the city council for me. If there you go. Okay, um, all those in favor of the motion on the floor. I just wanna make one last comment because we're, the conversation has come around to the potential for litigation, and I'd like to remind my colleagues, and I, not that it, I don't think it's gonna change anyone's mind, but I just wanna say, um, we, in the time I've been on the council, we have faced litigation for three out of four projects we've approved. Um, and I suspect that there is a high degree of likelihood that we'll be facing the same thing on this one um, that we will face a CEQA challenge, which is going to delay this project even longer than if an EIR had just done, been done in the first place. And I think that's a real shame um, as well. And so I just wanted to add that into the record. Okay. okay. Um, Can I I'll, just get a repeat since of the motion? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Do you want to go ahead and repeat your motion? The motion is to require an environmental impact report, or EIR, that adequately addresses the potential for significant environmental impacts in the following areas. Traffic, parking, geologic safety, noise, and light and shadow impacts on Clearview Court. And I'll just say on the side, I can't, you know, when you talk about the adverse effects of health and safety, we, we heard it from people coming up here, like the traffic, that the noise, those, those seem to be, to me, to be health and safety issues that are not adequately addressed right now. Um, and, I, and my uh, last part of that was to direct city staff to make initial project analysis public through incorporation into a draft EIR and then circulate uh, a draft EIR for comment. 
That was the motion. It was made by Councilmember Crone and it was seconded by Councilmember Brown. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. So that fails with Councilmember Crone, Glover, and Brown voting in support. Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Myers voting against. I'll go ahead and entertain a substitute motion at this time. I'll move to accept the staff recommendation. Okay, I'll go ahead and second that motion. Any further discussion, Councilmember Matthews? Um, I would like. Uh, I think we need to uh, specify whether we prefer the roundabout, the mini roundabout, or the light. Is that to be included mm -hmm. in this motion? Okay. Do we want to get an understanding of the things that the staff is needing our specification on right now? It's the roundabout and well, there there were additional conditions and findings that were presented. Right. Uh, the roundabout. Uh, that would be my preference. The mini roundabout. Okay. Um, I, uh, I think the issue of an eight foot sound wall was raised. I would be amenable to that if that's the, the will of the person making the motion. Um, I would like to be explicit about, um, for the affordable units, um, pursuing a preference for um, people for the low income units who live or work in Santa Cruz <coughs> to the extent possible according to fair housing law. And I think that's um, acceptable. I think that's very consistent. I think those will be friendly amendments and I think, I mean, if there's consensus from the council, more or less on those. Well, it, He's the one that accepts them. <laughs> yeah, did you, did you, it sounds like you, I accept it. Yeah, okay. And I would also add to the motion that the staff continue working with Clear Court to minimize the shade with the design of the building. Does that have a second? I, I seconded it, yeah. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> the, I mean, the other thing that came to mind for me is how um, they could potentially work with them on some of the food uh, growing, uh, if there's gonna be growing on at the project and they're <laughs> impacted by having lack of light that they can share some of the food if they're having a roof, tech, roof deck garden. Um, Mr. Condotti. I have a comment about that. It's crazy. Um, I've, I've been spending a lot of time this evening and prior to the meeting, but also during the course of the meeting discussing with the planning director and and looking at the analysis that was done in support of the rooftop deck amenity mm -hmm. that was uh, part of the project and i have a recommendation to the council that you um, add a provision that authorizes the planning director at the request of the applicant to eliminate the rooftop deck um, if further analysis that determines that um, that it would be potentially inconsistent with the height limitation modifications. Okay, that seems reasonable. And and, and I, I guess I would add additional direction to have the, um, the the planning department update our policy around how to handle roof deck circumstances moving forward to learn from this experience essentially. Right. right. Okay. Okay. All right. You done with done. you? Okay, Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Crown. I just want to point out something that uh, was just said up here. Um, <laughs> to paraphrase, maybe the poor people can ask the rich people for food in case the building robs all of their sunlight. Sit with that for a second. And uh, there, there's something inherently wrong with that, uh, morally, ethically wrong with that statement and the fact that that is even a probability that you're gonna be robbing someone's food access to be able to grow their own fruits and vegetables and then have to ask the people to access to their rooftop garden because of it. Um, it's just really problematic and I would encourage this body not to turn their backs on the poor people of Santa Cruz yet again, which has been a very consistent theme with this body. I'll just, um, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, state that that was not what was said, and um, it's essentially in alignment with the relationship between the neighbors and how to um, move forward in a way that's going to be mutually beneficial. So, um, paraphrasing was inaccurate in my opinion. Council McCrone. Uh, just going over the conditions of approval, uh, number four, I'm just wondering, it says, uh, if upon exercise of this permit, this use 
is at any time determined by the Planning Commission to be incompatible. Why wouldn't we put City Council there? You can certainly put that there. That's fine. Um, I think practically what it would relate to would be some of the uses that are covered under the special use permit, some of the commercial uses. So I, I, would, I would, is that acceptable to the maker of the, the motion? Sorry. Substitute City yeah. Council for Planning Commission. Where is this? Um, this is condi uh, conditions, of this conditions of approval number four. It, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that. Point uh, 41. The other thing to keep in mind is if it's kept as is, that decision is appealable up to the council or the council could call it up. Can, Councilmember Matthews? I would, for that reason, suggest leaving it as it is because if it's a simple use permit type thing, you don't want that to get called up. It, it would go to planning and then if it's significant or controversial, it, it comes up to us. But uh, a, a lower level use determination is makes more sense at the planning commission follow that logic i was just going to say i think it's good that if it goes to planning commission so we get input from the planning commission and then it comes to the city council so we can take in both accounts as well or it stops with them or it stops with us okay yeah. um is the um 18 inches is that is that in the uh conditions of approval easement or can we put it in there i think that's a good catch i don't think it actually is so um Put the measure of the motion except that, add that putting the 18 inch uh, easement in there which is already agreed upon is, is my understanding yeah um the other thing is uh what what are the hours of construction my understanding from the a, staff presentation yeah it was seven is that, is that a condition of approval standard yes we're recommending that what, what's like, what the hours of operation uh, pull it up here. seven to Six, seven to six, six p.m. I think Monday through Friday. Oh, seven to I, I thought you talked about the prohibiting hauling of excavated materials. That was something you were changing. That's twenty-two. What was the one you were just referring to? Uh, this would be a new condition. It's the first bullet point here. It's on the screen. Oh. Okay, seven. Also, I was wondering if the maker of the motion would go back to uh, prohibiting the hauling of uh, excavated materials during peak uh, traffic hours on weekdays between the hours of nine, seven and nine, and four and six. You, that had changed, right? You, you're allowing hauling from seven to, to four, you said, or seven to six? We were recommending that be changed to allow it to go from seven to four. Yeah, I, I don't... I don't not sure what, why that changed. Do you want to speak to why that was one of the recommendations? Well, he, he did. He said because it was more expensive to keep haul, you know, you can't haul as much, I guess. You can't. Well, the main reason, that that is one, but the main reason was that it, it extends the time of construction. If you do well, it the, beyond that time frame. Yeah. So the less time they can excavate during the day, it's going to expand the, the construction time. Would you, would you accept that going back to the seven to nine that you can in uh, four to six? So, or seven you, to nine rather. If we don't allow excavation from seven to nine, the duration of the project is going to increase. And so therefore, any negative impacts on any of the surrounding communities, well, so if you're talking about noise and any of these other things, that's going to be extended even longer in terms of the duration of the project. So. No. Yeah. Okay. I just have a Councilmember Myers. I have a clarification on um, condition 36 uh, regarding the traffic impact fee. Um, do we need to get? Do we need to give direction at all about use of this for the roundabout, or is that something you do on the backside as things are getting <coughs> built? So it's 1.46, Chris, on page 1.46 in the conditions of approval specifically calls out the amount, but I'm just, I'm not sure if that condition needs to be. Uh, uh, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. Um, the condition um, was written specifically um, in relation to the traffic impact fee ordinance okay. and the amount that's been calculated so far. Um, that can change uh, between now and the building permit okay. issuance. Do we want to um, ensure that we have clear? Do you have additional yeah. friendly amendments? Yeah, uh, one, one other. I wanted to know if you, if you accept um, the owner shall comply with the inclusionary housing requirements as outlined in section 24.16 of the zoning ordinance 
A participation agreement establishing compliance with inclusionary housing requirements shall be entered into prior to the recreation of the final subdivision map and recorded prior to either sale of the first subdivision lot or final occupancy of the first unit, whichever occurs first. The affordable units must be provided on site. The 10 inclusionary units shall be affordable in perpetuity. The eight density bonus affordable units shall be affordable for at least 55 years. I would say that all affordable should be included in perpetuity rather than that 55 year um, number that you put out. And I just want to defer to the city staff, I mean the city attorney, as to what the current inclusionary requirements are. Because I personally want to make sure that for the existence of this building that all affordable units are affordable in perpetuity. And that last statement perpetuity, leads me to right? believe that some of them might actually no longer be affordable after a certain point in time. Um, it's in perpetuity since they're, uh, you know, overlapped. Um, all of the units will be in perpetuity. Okay, but I'm, I'm saying there's eight density bonus affordable units uh, and then 10 inclusionary units. So 18 altogether. No, oh, no, no. There's 10. Well, I understand, but... Um, You're requesting we, we're, that be a But we, we are entitled to 18. So <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so... Um, so that's what I'm asking for, uh, if you'll accept that as a friendly amendment. I don't, but I'd also like some clarification around... Because we've had this discussion earlier, it's my understanding. I think we've provided you with fairly exhaustive analysis of the... Why that's not possible. ...of the stackability of inclusionary and accessory or um, den density bonus units. I agree. Okay. So now... I, I would make that as a, a, a motion, a, a side amendment, I guess, an amendment to the main motion. So you want to make this a... So that was not accepted as a friendly amendment. So that would be essentially what, a substitute motion? Moving it. No, just an amendment, amendment to the main amendment motion. The okay, so is there a second to that? No? Okay, so it fails for a lack of a second. Do we need to repeat the motion, um, Bonnie? Okay, all right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. That passes with Councilmember Myers, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself voting in support, Crone, Glover, and Brown voting against. Okay, that concludes our meeting, and we'll adjourn the meeting at this time. They're going to accept it or anything.